Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day three. And our first speaker is R. John Williams. R. John Williams is Associate Professor of English and Film and Media Studies at Yale University and a visiting scholar in the Center for Religion and Media at NYU. His academic work so far has focused on international histories of Buddhism, technological innovation, and the perceived difference of racial and cultural otherness. He is the author of The Buddha in the Machine, Art, Technology, and the Meeting of the East, 2014, and a forthcoming volume titled World Presence, Deconstructing Mindfulness. And today, R. John Williams will be giving the talk the new internalism of John Lilly's biocomputer. So let us warmly welcome him. And John, then you can take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, and thank you for all of the presentations I've heard so far. It's been a really interesting conference and I'm very regretful that I couldn't make it there in person. Um, Randy, I know that you'll alert me to the time. I'll be sort of watching the chat if that's helpful or you can feel free to to jump in at any moment. Um, okay, I'll be, I'll, I'm gonna, um, I'll use the chat and I will let you know um, at 30, I'm sorry, at 25 minutes from now that you have another five minutes so that we can leave 10 minutes for questions, but I'm flexible. Okay, okay. great. So I thought uh, I would talk a little bit about um, an interesting chapter in the history of the flotation tank. Um, and that is specifically the transition from its Cold War origins to it becoming a kind of therapeutic practice um, beginning in the late, you know, to mid 1970s. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna take us through a little bit of sort of cultural history here on how the, the idea of a flotation tank was conceived and how it evolved over time. And we'll see um, a little bit of John Lee's role in that. So I'll get right, right to it. Um, Although Lilly pioneered the water immersion method of sensory isolation, he was far from alone in researching the subject in the 1950s and 60s. Dozens of universities, private institutions, hospitals, government and military laboratories, and international organizations also began devoting significant resources to researching what eventually came to be known as SD or sensory deprivation. But instead of discovering a mechanism for accelerated psychoanal psychoanalytic therapy, as Lilly had hypothesized, what they found was almost universally terrifying. In a report in Scientific American on experiments conducted at McGill University, for instance, uh, researchers noted a general regress into various pathologies. Deprived of patterned or perceptual stimulation, Subjects were unable, this is a quotation, unable to think clearly about anything for any length of time. They began to lose their sense of perspective, to become more susceptible to the argument for the existence of supernatural phenomena, and to see images, hallucinations, and experience motion when no such stimuli were present. At a symposium on sensory deprivation held at Harvard Medical School in 1958, Researchers reported on the, uh, quote, marked changes that occurred in subjects, including deterioration in ability to think and reason and perceptual distortions, bizarre hallucinations and delusions, inability to think or concentrate, anxiety, emotional lability, and inappropriate drive intrusions, which if you look in a footnote, was referring to homosexual thoughts. A few subjects even went through uh, psychotic manifestations that lasted several days following their exposure to sensory deprivation. The most common effect, however, was temporal disorientation with subjects wildly misjudging the amount of time they spent in isolation, many of them seeming to lose their entire awareness of time, is the quotation there. Uh, the overwhelming consensus in short, was that sensory isolation was definitely deleterious to one's mental health and physiological well-being. 
Indeed, uh, reading through these reports, it isn't hard to imagine how anxiety inducing some of these experiments must have been. And I think key to it is that many of them were told the subjects uh, who were just paid by the hour students or whatever were told to simply endure these environments for as long as you can. And uh, Lily's water immersion was considered by his fellow SD researchers to be the quote, most severe of all laboratory created sensory deprivation environments. But the photographs taken of these other experiments um, from these other institutions and uh, research centers were no less the stuff of nightmares. Uh, here you can see them in sometimes wildly uh, complicated apparatuses. This was an article from Parade Magazine in which someone uh, spent a record-breaking amount of time in the sensory deprivation flotation tank. They, we, we see illustrations of some of the hallucinatory images that were generated. Um, and I'm just noticing the chat here. Do you want to maybe press play on your presentation so we can see it full screen? Uh, no, <laughs> I like seeing that on the on the left side here where I'm going. Um, so unless unless you object, uh, I'll just continue as it is. Um, it did not take long for popular culture to pick up on the phenomenon. British novelist James Kennaway's The Mindbenders in 1963, for instance, begins with the publisher's note explaining that the plot was, uh, quote, suggested by experiments on the reduction of sensation recently carried out at McGill University in Canada, as well as at other universities in the United States. The novel and its UK film adaptation, uh, which faithfully follows the plot of the book, opens with a military intelligence officer, Major Hall, arriving at Oxford University to investigate the work of several sensory deprivation researchers. One of whom, his name is Professor Sharpie, has recently committed suicide after falling under the influence of communist spies. Somehow, this Professor Sharpie had been persuaded to sell uh, UK secrets to the communists prior to his tragic end. The investigator, Major Hall, suspects that he has, that this Professor Sharpie had been a double agent for years. But Sharper's former colleague, Dr. Longman, played by Dirk uh, Bogard here, uh, believes that it was Sharpie's time in the SD tank that itself that made him so susceptible to the overtures of the communists. Uh, Major Hall, however, is skeptical because Professor Sharpie had spent a mere five hours in the tank at the time nowhere near the time required for the mind-bending enhanced interrogation techniques that Hall had witnessed as an intelligence officer. So in order to convince Major Hall uh, and clear his friend's name, Dr. Longman here offers to go inside the tank himself and allow the major to follow up with his own interrogation. Bravely then, Longman puts on the sinister rubber suit as it's described in the novel uh, and is lowered into the tank. After uh, eight hours, Longman begins to cry out, insane with terror, racked with fear, his cries trouble and bestial, his mind reduced to a wasteland. Major Hall, the investigator, is duly impressed. The one thing he knew about brainwashing was that it took time. And yet here, Longman had been reduced in as many hours at it, as it took months to break down a prisoner in solitary confinement alone. So SD was apparently a kind of fast track to disintegration, a way to tamper with the very physics of the soul. For some reason, however, Hall wants to be really sure of the effects. Uh, and so during the interrogation, he attempts to persuade Longman that he doesn't really love his pregnant wife. And everyone knows that the two are real lovebirds, so this is a real test. And it isn't clear at first whether the gambit works, but then the film cuts to a few months later and we find a messy drunken Longman um, generally being an asshole to his wife and Major Hall scrambling to undo the damage from the sensory deprivation brainwashing. Um, the only thing uh, 
in the end uh, that will save uh, Dr. Longman is the, it's kind of corny, but the fresh trauma of his wife going into labor um, that finally undoes the spell of his sensory isolation. Only the child that is emerging from its own heavenly water immersion finally counters the diabolical bath of the SD tank, as it's described. Um, in another British spy novel of the period, Len Dayton's uh, The Ipcris File from 1962, intelligence agencies in both the UK and the United States are plagued by multiple, multiple leaks of sensitive information. The protagonist, a snarky but middle-class British agent, is invited to the testing site of an American hydrogen bomb project in the Pacific to help weed out potential moles. While there, he learns a lot about the bomb, that its uranium reactions, for instance, are initiated by a super volt micro flash mechanism, which generates the voltage necessary to trip the mechanism and is connected to an isolated chamber of uranium-235 by an electric umbilical cord. So the, the structure of the atomic bomb is sort of its own kind of isolated chamber. Um, suddenly, however, he is captured by unknown agents and rendered unconscious. When he wakes up, he discovers that he is a prisoner of a traitorous uh, British double agent, Jay, who claims to have developed another weapon, one that is, quote, even more terrible than nuclear explosions, but without all the bloodshed. It, too, has an acronym, IPCRIS, which stands for Induction of Psychoneuroses by Conditioned Reflex Under Stress and utilizes an isolation chamber. At the center of Jay's massive Ipcris scheme, in which he claims to have processed nearly 300 people, is a sensory deprivation tank. Quote, you mask the subject's eyes and fit him with a breathing apparatus, then suspend him in a tank of blood heat water. And when he awakes completely disoriented and subject to anxiety and hallucination, you then begin to feed him information. Being gently fed after water immersion evoking, like the language of the bomb's umbilical cord here, the metaphor of a kind of primal birth scene. Uh, luckily, our protagonist escapes before being subjected to the tank, resisting the psychological effects of some preliminary tortures by obsessively marking the time. Um, he continually asks, what's the time, 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 as, as in the film. In the 1965 film adaptation, uh, the protagonist, Michael Caine, um, ends up um, subject to, to wild oscillations between sensory deprivation and sensory overload, maintaining his sanity only by secretly scratching a crude calendar into his cell wall. Um, now, the most famous brainwashing film of the era, which you'll all know, The Manchurian Candidate in 1962, the same year, is notably terse on details of Chinese and Russian uh, brainwashing techniques. When the titular soldier confesses, they developed a technique for descent into the unconscious mind, part light-induced, part drug, and he trails off, and his U.S. Army handler uh, in the film played by Frank Sinatra interrupts, never mind all that, not now. Tell me what else happened. So the film moves on. We don't really know what it exactly the, the techniques were for the brainwashing of the Manchurian candidate. But that now would definitely come some years later in 1968 when the new television series Hawaii Five-0 launched its pilot episode, Cocoon, uh, reprising a number of familiar actors and scenes from the Manchurian candidate. Um, we learned that the we've been suspecting that the Chinese Reds have some kind of brain drain, a doomsday weapon, uh, says the no-nonsense intelligence agent K. Uh, the savvy detective McGarrett tells him that whatever the secret weapon his investigation has revealed, that they must be deploying it from deep in the hull of a Chinese ship, an old rust bucket currently at harbor in Honolulu. Agent K thus devises a plan to generate a false memory bank in Garrett's brain, in the Garrett's brain, for using forced hypnosis, and then to use those false memories as bait to expose double agents and confound the Chinese brainwashers. Um, it isn't long before McGarrett, now a prisoner on the Chinese ship, is standing before 
the brainwasher in chief, Wo Fat, uh, played brilliantly again by uh, Key Day. Uh, this time, however, who would also play the brainwasher in the Manchurian Candidate. Uh, this time, however, there is no shortage of how-to details. Indeed, coming in at just over 20 minutes of airtime, these scenes and Wo Fat's accompanying explanations amounted to uh, what was the most extensive popular introduction to sensory isolation science in American culture during the 1960s. Um, we have uh, a, a lovely long quotation from Wolfat as he explains, the brain is a computer, an incomparable computer. And then in his sort of lilting evil genius tones, from the day you were born, from the moment the obstetrician slaps you on the backside, Perhaps even before your computer is receiving data, sounds, smell, touch, temperature change, pain, pleasure, receiving and sorting data at a fantastic rate. Case in point, an everyday situation, you drive your car, you approach the corner where you live, the computer is fed data. It calculates the light signal. Is it green, red, did it, or is it about to change? The approaching car, how fast does he see me? The child on the corner, is he reliable? Might he run out into the street? Should I break? And on and on, ad infinitum, the computer feeds and calculates. Uh, these everyday computations, Wofat continues, are the warp and woof of our lives. But what would happen uh, if for the first time in your life, all sensory input, all messages to the brain were shut off, completely shut off? We have developed a perfect sensory deprivation chamber, a cocoon, no sight, no sound, drifting, lost, and most terrifying of all, no messages, no messages. It won't be long before the starved computer panics, and what was a human being is now a vegetable, an amiable vegetable. I have it removed from the vat. I ask it questions. It answers. Even a scream dies before it can reach a cross. The dome. Um, <laughs> very, I think, uh, intense language from Wolfat here. Um, and of course, the agent folds as uh, Wolfat knew that he would. Uh, the uh, images here are just truly sort of gripping and terrifying. The, the image of the floating man tethered in the water here, I think, is, is really stunning. Um, all of these scenes offer a kind of rogues gallery of Cold War excesses. And yet by the 1970s, an increasing number of viewers were looking at these accounts of sensory deprivation as profoundly off the mark. Uh, and I think I've located a really interesting moment in popular journalism when Adam Smith relates uh, in a book called The Powers of Mind, the following scene. He says, one night, uh, my wife was watching Hawaii Five-0. The sinister foreign power was picking up our agents and dropping them into a sensory deprivation tank, whereupon they would crack immediately. Only the superhero was able to withstand a couple of hours. I looked up from my reading. They have the wrong bunch of agents, I said. All the kids in Shelby's course have logged more time than that. They fight to get into the tank. You have to sign up three weeks in advance. Now, the Professor Shelby that he is referring to here was a friend of his, a lecturer in psychology who had traveled out to California in the late 1960s and purchased a Samadhi tranquility tank from a company specializing in home isolation chambers and co-founded by John C. Lilly himself. Now, here was something strange, Smith continued. In Shelby's course, the kids were elbowing each other to get into the tank, and yet, in the popular accounts above and in reports of Scientific American, they were associating the experience with pathology and disease. Now, things were even stranger than Smith knew. Indeed, one of the most surprising elements of the sensory deprivation scenes in the Hawaii Five O episode is how faithfully they adhere to John Lilly's scientific reports on sensory deprivation. It isn't just that the tank and the accompanying equipment, including this nightmarish mask, are near perfect replicas of Lily's specifications. The entire Wofat spiel, the whole basis that is for it being a torture in the first place, is culled nearly verbatim from Lily's own description of the neurophysiological revelations 
that are made possible by sensory deprivation. The human brain, Lilly wrote in one of his earliest accounts of, separ uh, of, um, sorry, of sensory deprivation, is an immense biocomputer several times larger than any constructed by man and featuring a very large memory storage. Um, now in language that harkens back to this, uh, to this kind of ancient philosophical distinction between memory that is inside of us and memory that is outside of us, Lily's tank uh, had the ambition to see how our environment, that is what's outside us, interlocks with our computer, that is what's inside us, and changes its functioning. Having posited a kind of pure interiority marked by memory storage systems, Lily reasons that if we can free ourselves from the effects of our uh, on our thinking of storage of material from the external world, if we can free ourselves up from the effects of storage of metaprograms which direct our thinking, programs devised to us and fed to us during our learning years, we may be able to see the outline and the essential variables which are genetically determined. Now notice that Lily is not only positing here an originary primal scene of memory storage, that is a kind of anamnesis or memory prior to whatever is fed to us in childhood. He's also framing this condition as emerging only when one is quote unquote free from the historically and environmentally imposed exteriorizations that come along with being a human being. Um, a similar disconnect, of course, can be seen in the uh, horror film uh, Altered States, which uh, I think we're our, our next presenter is going to speak on. So I won't say too much more about that, except to say that um, Lily was uh, flattered that the filmmakers uh, took sensory isolation so seriously, and yet it completely baffled him that they had turned it into such a horror story. Um, he's, he called it a moving film, but ultimately a distortion of what actually happens inside an SD tank is obviously a distortion because it's sort of regress into this ape. <laughs> but they'd taken something he said transcendent and turned it into something hideous, sensationalized, lurid, and simply inaccurate. Now, obviously, uh, context makes a big difference. Uh, when a group of researchers set out in the early 1980s to investigate the growing popularity of SD tank therapy centers around North America, they concluded that the reason earlier experiments had induced such terrifying experiences was simply that the scientists assumed they would, and subjects responded accordingly. Subjects were typically told, for example, that conditions in the scary looking tank would be stressful, that their senses would be quote unquote deprived, that they should tolerate or endure it for as long as they could. The whole environment, in other words, was set up to generate uh, what one researcher called self-fulfilling prophecies of aversive reactions. And yet by the mid 1970s, uh, the subjects who were now actually customers, there's an interesting rebranding there as well, were convinced that SD sessions uh, updated with a new, um, more welcoming acronym, REST, uh, they called it Restricted Environmental Stimulation Technique, that this produced a generally relaxing and pleasant experience. The design of the tank by this time had streamlined, the weird looking headgear was gone, and hundreds of pounds of Epsom salts were added to the water so that the customers could float on their backs, reducing both the size of the tank and the amount of water needed. There were sleek new designs with tanks sporting mandala logos and spaceship-like doors. Um, and what had been exclusively, this is something I noticed as I was looking through the many um, reports on this, what had been exclusively male subjects in the Cold War reports and news illustrations were now replaced in lifestyle stories and slick advertisements with bikini clad women, eyes closed, floating in perfect relaxation. Um, and most of these you'll notice are from the 1970s and 80s, calling it a womb room, floating uh, while one's cares drift away, relaxing all alone, in an isolation tank, uh, here we learned that one's darkest hour can be quite pleasant. Um, again, we see women generally enjoying themselves, floating away to relaxation, relieving stress, the ultimate 
getting away from it all. Come float with me, let's float, let's float away. And the sound mind offers float therapy. Um, here we have a temperature controlled flotation tank, a business she and her partner Jack Seymour have started to provide a place where people can relax and relieve stress. So the SD tank had gone from being a vehicle of stress experiments to one of stress treatments. And in no small portion, because subjects had been encouraged both implicitly and explicitly by their surrounding environment to assume a different outcome. Now it took a lot to change those uh, contexts and assumptions, however, and it was really John Lilly who almost single-handedly did so. Um, in fact, based on the many news reports that I was reading during this time, I think we can track with clear precision the moment when the SD tank went from being portrayed as an awful, lonely ordeal in which the mind disintegrates to being an ideal place to relax, to engage in formal meditation and focus. And the turning point, as it turns out, was the mainstream republication of two of Lilly's treatises on tank research, the center of the cyclone and the human biocomputer, which we mentioned earlier, um, as well as, of course, a flurry of popular accounts and commercial isolation tank ventures that followed in their wake. So this is basically 1973 to 1974 is I think the sort of cusp where this suddenly, this new way of understanding the tank emerges. Um, it was Lilly's expanded theory of the brain as a biocomputer that paved the way for thinking about the tank and its enormous place in contemporary mindfulness culture as an ideal vehicle for pure culture. Without Lilly, in short, the SD tank might have remained forever a Cold War torture device, inducing all the pathologies that accompany temporal disorientation rather than as is promoted at thousands of flotation centers around the world today, a space where one can be here now, focus on being present, relax into the moment, be at e these are all quotations of course from advertising copy, be at ease in the present moment, experience pure nowness and so on. Uh, but how exactly did the least tank and the philosophy informing it become as one company currently advertises it a time machine to the present. Well, of course, in achieving this transformation, Lilly had more than a little help from the dolphins he studied. Uh, Lilly's work with cetaceans was originally grounded in the notion that the dolphin's large brain offered a means of learning about the human brain by analogy. For that analogy to hold, however, Lilly knew he would have to demonstrate that dolphins were similarly capable of sophisticated forms of communication. Indeed, in nearly all of his dolphin studies, Lily comes across as staggeringly optimistic about how soon he thinks he will crack the code of dolphin communication. Within the next decade or two, he predicts in man and dolphin, the human species will establish communication with another species, non-human, alien, possibly extraterrestrial, more probably marine, but definitely highly intelligent, perhaps even intellectual. As we discover later, in the same book, one of the reasons Lilly was so confident that human beings were going to establish communication with dolphins was that he suspected, in a few cases at least, that he already had. The story he tells is that one evening just after 6 p.m., as he probed, recorded, and monitored the electrodes in one of the dolphins in his marine lab, her name was Lily Lizzie, he suddenly heard her mimicking his language. Thunderstruck, he replayed the tape at a lower, at a slower speed for his colleagues, who also thought they heard her babbling something like, it's six o'clock. Uh, and it was about six o'clock too at the time, so that was shocking. But Lily heard something more. It sounded to me like, this is a trick. So six o'clock, this is a trick. I don't know, something close there. Lily was suddenly feverishly confident that Lizzie's message was no mere random noise. For Lizzie to have been capable of repeating something as complex as it's six o'clock was one thing. For her to have indicated that some kind of trickery was afoot was something more altogether, much more, that is, than mere parroted mimicry. Uh, he says, we began to have feelings which uh, I believe are best described by the word weirdness. Uh, he recalled this a few years later. The feeling was that we were up against the edge of a vast uncharted region 
we felt we were in the presence of something or someone who was on the other side of a transparent barrier, which up to this point we hadn't even seen. And every time he replayed the tape, Lily says that that uncanny feeling returned. The dolphin, in other words, was attempting to communicate. Replication, however, is a tough nut to crack. How, for instance, could Lily demonstrate that the dolphin's trills, squeaks, and clicks were purposeful attempts to mimic his utterances rather than simply sounding in coincidental proximity? And in what sense would a purposeful mimicry differ from any other form of repetition? Could Lizzie, in order to clarify, repeat her repetition, if that's what it was? Um, unfortunately, Lizzie died not long after her final quote-unquote words due to an injury she suffered in transit. Now, parrots, it goes without saying, or I guess it goes with saying, uh, are already much better than dolphins at replicating human speech. Consequently, in order to account for these shortcomings in dolphin vocalization, Lily found himself attempting to establish an evolutionary hierarchy in types of vocal repetition. The parrot pronounces well, he concedes, but it will not lock in his vocal output with that of the human. The dolphin, by contrast, locks in beautifully, accurately, rhythmically. The dolphin's mimicking squeaks, he insisted, are more humanoid and indicate an attempt to mimic. Now, Lily never bothered to clarify, however, uh, what he meant by lock in, nor was it obvious why the dolphin's repetitions indicated an attempt at mimicry, while those of the parrot were simply the biomechanical artifacts of evolutionary adaptation. Indeed, the transcripts, as he calls them, uh, of dolphin language training that Lily included in the mind of the dolphin uh, really persuaded no one. They didn't even appear in the second edition of the book. Um, hey, John, whatever these just, apparent. Hey, yeah, go um, ahead. sorry. Um, little, little time warning. Oh, okay, good. Well, I'm almost done here. Cool. Um, so our, he says our frustration uh, is not being able to in to turn to you, turn you into the listener rather than into the reader. The problem, once again, is one of uh, exteriorization and presence. To date, he says, there is no way we know of to print something so that you can hear it. If only one could be there. The communication was happening. In other words, it just wasn't so easy to communicate the communication. And that's uh, due a great deal, I think, to the fact that Lily was committed to a kind of internalist uh, metaphysics of the mind, uh, which is, I think, obviously indicated by the flotation tank. So I'll stop there, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have um, or expand on any parts of this. All right, cool. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah. All right, so we have some time for questions. Well, I have one, but I'll wait. <laughs> and on Zoom, of course, certainly, um, I want to remind those of you at home to, um, you know, feel free to to voice your questions as well. You can do the little raise hand function, or you can type it, or jump in, or whatever. Yeah, Martin. Hey, man! Thanks for this uh, wonderful uh, pre presentation and. Uh... A lot of uh, humor. Um, I, I wonder why 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 Lily was was um, um, focusing at the um, the animals uh, speaking um, English or a, a human language. Um, if you're the superior species, why why don't you try to speak their language? Why didn't he try to communicate in their language as a, as a first choice? Mm. Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. Um, and I think later attempts, that's with what he was doing with, for example, with the Apple II computer. He was one of the first to try to um, digitally anal analyze dolphin communications, the squeaks and the information. Um, so he did, I think he did att attempt that in some way. Um, but I think that uh, there were so many different theories about what the dolphin communication could be. Like some people thought it might have been a the generation of a kind of sonogram image into another dolphin's mind, right? That it isn't actually the 
the sound that's being produced, but it's a kind of like uh, shape of vocalized uh, waves that's being sort of replicating an image in the mind of the other dolphin. So there were all these different theories and, um, you know, I think he did eventually try to go that route, but it was as as equally as unsuccessful <laughs> in terms of generating the kind of uh, language that we you know the sort of communication that we would associate with language anyway. Thank you. Here's Irena. Yes, thank you. Very interesting what you have told us. And um, I have a question about temporal disorientation. If you could expand on it. Mm -hmm. It's the problem of losing um, the sense of my present being here, or is it a question to lose your past memories or uh, as retention or as protention that is advancing mm -hmm. of what may happen? Uh, what kind of disorientation takes place? If you could um, uh, precise this uh, temporal disorientation. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a good question, right? Um, because Part of what was so salient in these reports on the Cold War research regarding the sensory deprivation tank was this idea of temporal disorientation, disintegration, the sense that uh, the coherence of an internal time consciousness, the sort of phenomenological coherence of time was, was disintegrating. People were losing track of time, as it were. Um, and yet, when the flotation tank ma makes that transition into a sort of instrument of therapeutic meditation, then that temporal disorientation becomes framed as a conduit to nowness, to the present moment, to existing fully in the moment, as is, you know, I think conditioned by a lot of mindfulness um, discourse. Uh, I think it's fascinating in a, in a way because the the question really is, is about uh, the very process of internal time consciousness of how we process it and what that means and the degree to which you know as heidegger would argue that our being in the world in the kind of in physical environments of the world condition the types of temporality we we experience phenomenologically um so yeah i think it's uh, i think something obviously happens to the sense of time that one has when one tries to uh limit the amount of sensory input one's experiencing um, and I think a lot of it just depends on how you want to frame that uh, temporal uh, scrambling, <laughs> as it were. I wonder if there's a follow up in this about the difference between like, I don't know, the noetic cosmos and the aesthetic cosmos, you know, or the empirical inner time consciousness of our inner clock ticking, counting the number of breaths versus the number of heartbeats. You know, in contrast to what Husserl intends with the imminence of inner time consciousness, um, I, I kind of maybe want to defer to Irena to, to formulate this question precisely. I have my categories and, and notions here, but, um, you know, um, and, and John, I know you have some familiarity, right, with, with, um, with these things. You just mentioned Heidegger, so. Um, yeah. Well, so, I mean, we could yeah. we could do, do, do the the interesting thing about the um, about Husserl in this context is, of course, he's he's essentially replicating the the Augustinian notion of this sort of trifold uh, ma manifold of of time, where you each moment of the now you're essentially trailing retentional experience and uh, protentional anticip anticipations of the future, and so on. Um, the interesting thing about Husserl is that he, in order to illustrate that, he several times refers to Augustine, but most of his examples in that book, um, the one that Heidegger um, publishes and edits in 1928, uh, most of his, his examples come from music, from melody, like do, re, mi, fa, so, and then you hear the next note coming. Uh, but he never does what St. Augustine does, which is refer to language in the same way that sentences sort of perform this same sort of retentional uh, experience of what's just come before and the retentional anticip anticipation of uh, the vocabulary to come. Um, and I think part of that's because Husserl has always made this distinction between indication and expression. And expression is associated with that internal voice that's the sort of special sense of self 
And he connects that to language in an interesting way, in a problematic way, actually, when you sort of like put it up against what he does with melodies and time. Uh, and so I think that that's, that's where Husserl kind of gets himself into a little bit of a, of a bind. It would be wrong to not take this opportunity to point out that not only Jacques Derrida takes off at that distinction between indication and expression, but you know George Spencer Brown, certainly with the calculus of indications, is concerned with indication, and yep. you know, and 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 furthermore, like there's a kind of analogy that my professor Peter Manchester points out in his works that um, between. Um, Aristotelian twofold nowness and time, mm -hmm. and ver verse which is more like like Husserl, and then Heidegger is more like the threefold of um, of Augustine, and and yeah, the, these are kind of like two parallel traditions mm -hmm. regarding a twofold versus a threefold um, notion of time, yeah, like and, and probably a corresponding space and space time sort of concept as well. I mean, these are just like. This is like where I where I dwell. Right? Yeah, no, <laughs> I like things. that. I mean, this is back back to, to our liberal pool conference. This is me arguing that Spencer Brown is is not that far from Derrida, in in that sensibility. But uh, you know, I think what what Derrida might say about the tank is you. It doesn't matter like how much you try to remove yourself from a kind of sensory experience or environment. This, as long as there is a. Uh, a thought that thought exists in a kind of temporality and it requires it sort of assumes in advance uh time in order to have the the sorts of thought things we associate with consciousness and time and and we should consider the distinction between or or if there's a, a nice distinction between indication and intentionality because the whole imminence mm -hmm. you know is regard regarding tension intentionality after brentano and husserl I, I imagine that, that um, indication is perhaps maybe even a, a little bit deeper, different, unless unless like at Brentano, there's something that ties it really closely together. I don't know. Intentionality is really interesting with this with the SD tank, right? Because you know, if the the premise of intentionality is that every every thought is a thought of something, you know, every every uh, thing that you think has a kind of intended con sort of conscious thing. Um, then, you know, the, the SD tank is trying to, to sort of disrupt intentionality in its way to say that there's, there's some kind of thought that can happen without an object, uh, that sort of directs it, that intends it. Um, so, you know, the, it, I don't, I don't think any, any sort of true phenomenologist would say that you actually do get around intentionality with an SD tank, but it's interesting that that's the attempt, I think. I just have a question because, well, we thought about, we have spoken about the threefold um, time uh, consciousness, but there is always the living present, which is underlying everything. And I wonder if the notion of the living present, of the passing of time, like the flowing mm -hmm. of time, is lost. And I wonder if there is some connection, because in Husserl, there is, it's not clear, clearly stated uh, between uh, time consciousness and also spatial consciousness that's you 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 only you not only lose your here your now but you're here too so um mm. i wonder if there are some uh, experience made in in that respect if you are losing not only your temporal orientation but also your spatial orientation hmm. yeah i don't I, I think that's a great comment i think that's a question that's worth thinking some more about yeah Yes, and uh, about intentionality, maybe you lose um, the intentional connection with uh, transcendent objects as they are uh, given to you, but you never lose, I think, that's why I would really ask you about this, if you lose your bodily intentionality, because you still are able to locate your body, but you are not still able to or locate your feelings, your bodily feelings to your body. Um, but mm -hmm. I think that the word is cut is the um, intentionality that addresses external objects maybe what do you think mm -hmm. about it yeah that's an interesting question um right so the famous passage in heidegger's history of the concept of time where he says he addresses this question of intentionality and says 
what if you hallucinated that there is a an automobile driving above all of our heads here in the classroom or something? Surely that would be an instance in which uh, you are not uh, actually thinking that thing or that thing is not there, right? But he says, you know, even even hallucination has intentionality. Even that's this still means you're thinking of something. The fact that that doesn't exist in the world is not as interesting for a true phenomenologist because what matters is that you're you're thinking of something. So even um, I think sort of losing track of objects in the world or losing a, the sort of deeply connected sense of relationality that you might experience in a flotation tank. Um, None of those are violations of intentionality. I think a, a, a true phenomenologist would argue that that intentionality is still very much there, even if the ambition is to disconnect somehow. It's it never it never actually will or can. Although I must keep a true um, inner time consciousness of the conference okay. <laughs> um, temporality. I, I I I once again like the way I started my other little intervention here was. Um, it would be wrong if I didn't something about intentionality and indication. Well, I'm yeah. wondering, <laughs> given this little discussion here, um, because this is the seed, this is the beginning of of some interesting uh, phenomenological, you know, uh, research that I think that can happen, some development. Um, in, in addition to um, having uh, disconnected from, let's call them ordinary um, forms of intentionality. Um, maybe forms of intentional expression um, or sensation or something. Um, you know, I wonder if the indicational framework or the phenomenological disclosure space. Could, could, um, you know, could could also indicate the possibility of a, um, a an analogous spatial type of thing because you know the idea of the first distinction is that it's perhaps in. Um, not, that the unmarked state, rather, is dimensionless, and that's something that we don't experience. Um, in fact, we don't have empirical examples of like absolute zero, and you know these things are mm -hmm. different from true um, spacelessness, timelessness. You know, but nonetheless, we have in our inner experience of immediate, direct, and ever present, or always already experience of things like eternity and infinity you know, not experience, right? <laughs> not expression, not, <laughs> not intentionality, <me> anyway. yeah. <laughs> right? But but that's the point of this notion of indication. So mm -hmm. so when when we have extraordinary experience in the tank, say on a psychedelic, when we're visited by a DMT UFO and, and pulled out of flatland into a higher dimension of some sort, right? You know, sure. how might that have a different expression or a different... Um, recording a different marketness, some different message about inner time consciousness, about intentionality. Mm. I mean, th these are open-ended questions, I suppose, but I, I, it would be wrong if I didn't voice them in this context because, yeah. you know, I, I know you didn't give a phenomenology talk here, but <laughs> I mean, no, but I'm happy important. this is where this went. Yeah, no, I, I think so. Everyone, you know, if you read much in the psychedelic literature or the history of psychedelics, you know, one thing you'll uncover is that they are de-temporalizing agents, right? The time is scrambled in the experience. Um, but to me, I think the most, most powerful thing that does is just completely um, undoes Heidegger's whole notion of <laughs> that death is the sort of like defining locus of any potential conscious experience because clearly if you're on a psychedelic high and time is doing all kinds of strange things with you you're not there is no sense that that death is the defining quality of that of that sensory phenomenological experience like i think there are things that that um that kind of detemporalization can can teach us that maybe you know old-fashioned phenomenologies wouldn't have um, wouldn't have understood fully, um, but you know on the other hand, that it's still uh, you know it's, it's it's in a way it's still an intentionality I would say right like there's still a kind of like something there, as well, so far as you're experiencing it yeah. Then let us consider this 
um, the institution of a phenomenological organization dedicated to the investigation of this particular topic. And let us also, since this is being broadcast widely, let us also um, call for seed money from the the intelligence agencies that fund such things, because yeah. <laughs> um, we, we could really use it um, for this purpose. In fact, it might be humanity's last and only hope. <laughs> It's a great idea, Randy. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Well, let, let us thank John one more time. Thank you, guys. That was really fun. And 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 thank you, John. I, I really think that part of the intention of this conference is, no joke, just what I said about <laughs> we need yeah. some seed money, governments, <laughs> world governments, come on. Um, sure. You, and you know, and again, interest. I apologize. I'm not there with you. I would have loved to, to have these conversations over a couple drinks, you know, long yeah. into the, the evening. But next yeah. time I'll be there. Cool. OK, so I'm wondering if perhaps um, we can attenuate our workshop and make it like, you know, 25 minutes or so. You know, because I mean, basically this this workshop, um, you know, I'm. I'm open to um, whatever you might have programmed out, whatever you might have planned. Um, and I would like you to just just kind of take it and I'll just sort of say a couple words to start in order to make a little a little contribution and 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 sort of frame um, the thing. But I mean, I've been doing that all the time. So I just want to <laughs> remind us we're, you know, we're we're trying to um, focus on on the the use that that Lily made of laws of form, or perhaps some of the fundamental notions that Lily was inspired by and, and used in the tank, you know, and, you know, and though, though we might not exactly be workshopping just that, you know, um, we, we could explore related themes, topics, you know, um, et cetera. I don't know. What do you think, Jerry? Well, uh, Randy, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, you had some ideas, you said, about uh, uh, modernizing Lily's void method. Yeah. Remember? Yes, yes. I, I, I don't really know how you intended to do that. Sure. Um, I, I thought possibly... You wanted uh, to uh, get the group to brainstorm about how to do that. If that's still your aim, yes, uh, we can go ahead and uh, do that. Pose a few questions uh, for the audience. Uh, you want uh, uh, first question? Uh, the people who have uh, had experience in the tank. Um, the notion that. Uh, uh, the tank can serve uh, experiences in the tank can serve purposes. The uh, early purposes were uh, the possibility of, uh, of ego breakdown, of, of mental breakdown. Uh, the shift over the years has been to um, increasing ego strength, allowing the experiences in the, in the tank to uh, uh, not uh, uh, deteriorate people's minds, but expand people's minds. Of course, there's a a, a logical ambiguity there that uh, is uh, both playful and fateful. Uh, a, a deterioration expand and expansion are uh, are, are opposites that uh, may. Um, what's the phrase? One of the presenters put it. Uh, um, uh, have an intimate had to have an intimacy with e with each other uh the uh the uh, opportunity in the tank of having an experience that's uh, radically different from the way we normally handle our sensoria uh, uh can raise anxiety or can raise excitement and uh the uh the fight flight uh, reactions are uh, neurophysiologically very same, very, very, very similar. One is approaching and one is uh, avoiding. 
Um, so I could offer this question to the people who have been in the tank. Uh, what did you do in the tank that you felt had a, um, a favorable result for you? Margarita. As I was listening to you and reflected on something I had mentioned earlier in a, in a more private conversation, I, I really thought it's not so much what did I do in the tank or with, what did the tank do to me, but also what happened before I entered the tank. And so I came to this conference like really thinking about what John Lilly showed is that we don't really know anything yet about consciousness. I mean, that we really need to think much more carefully about it. And by consciousness for me stands for the imagination. And so when I heard about this question, is it strengthening or weakening the ego? I thought that's way too reductive. There's so many other things that can happen in that tank. And it really depends on how people enter the tank and how they prepare to enter the tank. And then the sky is the limit, the infinite sphere. Um, so, so again, uh, that uh, brings in the, uh, the issue of temporality. It is what happens before. And then how uh, does one deal with that in the present? And what will be the consequences in the future? Uh, that, um, uh, that's very consistent with the kinds of things that Lily said. Uh, when he talked about uh, the, in the simulations of God, uh, 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 an attempt toward developing a science of belief, uh, he he did he did realize. Uh, I don't think he completely uh, integrated it, uh, but he did re did realize that expectations are very significant for the kind of experience that one has in the tank. Um, the uh, one of the major thrusts of the human potential movement and the encounter groups and the individual th therapy was how important expectations are. Uh, what we believe to be true, what we expect to be true, uh, biases our perceptions, uh, biases our actions, which uh, either uh, filter what kind of information comes in and or uh, governs our actions that generate the kind of information that comes in. So when you talk about the uh, thing you're talking about, so does that result in uh, uh, an intention in the tank to allow what happened before coming in the tank to have an effect? Or does it Yeah, of, of course, just about every question in, is going to be um, an open-ended productive aporia, you know, so so it's cool. But here's another question. Oh, I thought you had a question, sorry. <laughs> Ooh, I offered a question, I'm asking for answers. Yeah, okay, come on, people. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to, as well, just think about the float tank. I mean, we we do go to the the float tank for our our groundwork here. You know, our physical frame of of our questions. You know, but we're also we're not floating right now. Maybe some of us did float recently, and we had intentions and you know expectations and and projections and 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 maybe you know things worked out or different and, and uh, or didn't and and you know that's that's interesting um but i also wonder like if there's a lesson in all that you know that we should bring out of the tank into our everyday lives and into our contemplation of society and lou well one one thing is to uh, think of the tank in the context of other situations of the simple forms of letting go 
So one can think of it in terms uh, in, in relating it to sitting in meditation or taking on the thought of waiting for the next thought or any number or or just allowing the body to relax. All of these things are parts of a, of a collection of possibilities of which the tank is a very specific one. So I think it helps to put it into those contexts. That idea can be used. Um, uh, we're always in a float tank. Leon. Thank you, Rennie. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Leon. For me, the one of the things that came out for me out of the experience I had floating yesterday was the need to bring the experience out of the mind into the body. It was a very embodied experience. And Randy's theme for this conference, which he articulated or goal uh, just now, was to bring this out into the world and look at positive, practical outcomes. That translated for me inside the tank as the need to vocalize which I did, I was interested in seeing how the vibrations of my voice would be reflected in and off the water, off the inside of the tank, and be fed back to me in a recursive loop. I think it's very important to, yes, still and calm the mind, clarify the thinking, but unless we take that into voice, unless we take that into action, then why are we doing it? Yeah. Jerry, you want to respond to that? And anyone else? Certainly. Why are we doing it? Yes. <laughs> um, of course, one problem is that uh, as we uh, expand the scope of our contextualization, uh, we tend to, to lose focus and lose control. Um, I, I, I do like, as a, uh, as a figure, the uh, left brain, right brain model. Um, it's, imp it's imprecise and... Uh, likely scientifically untrue. Uh, as, as a figure, it's uh, useful to distinguish different kinds of approaches. The, uh, the, the left brain figure is uh, logical and precise and controlled and uh, consistent with the, uh, the notion of, uh, of continence. Uh, the right brain model, however, uh, is more Oh, um, consistent with the notion of soft boundaries, of permeable boundaries, of uh, uh, boundaries that are that are inconsistent. Um, uh, certain kinds of mi of minds, certain kinds of personalities, are uh, uh, carry from early experience uh, residues of dependency and of threat. Uh, loss of borders, loss of identity, uh, loss of consciousness, loss of control, loss of life. Whereas uh, other kinds of, of, of mind patterns are more comfortable with uh, openness and softness and permeability and uh, merging actual or only figurative uh, this this is the notion of of boundary conditions, and uh, the t the tank is a uh, is a figure for um, for dealing with boundaries. On the one hand, it's a very strong boundary. Uh, you're uh, you're enclosed. Uh, you're very very thoroughly thoroughly protected. Uh, the outside isn't going to touch you, and yet. Uh, as Lily's stories, especially his experiences 
when he took drugs in the in the tank is that when uh, you're in that uh, fully enclosed space with that uh, reduction of of sense that uh, there is a uh, a counter reaction uh, an opening uh, he had the fantasies the perhaps hallucinations that he had gone into other spaces and that he was open to visits by beings from outer space. So you get the, uh, the opposites there merging. Jerry, you said perhaps, perhaps hallucinations. Why'd you yes, say right. What does that mean? Well, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to tell the difference between an experience and hallucination, except that hal hallucination is multisensory. I think the brain uh, is doing the same thing when we produce our experience of the real world as it does when we produce uh, hallucinations. Um, I, I, I don't want to uh, baldly judge uh, Lily's experience as simply produced by his own uh, predilections. Uh, I want to leave open the perhaps possibility that uh, information was coming from elsewhere. Um, I, I, I scientifically, naturalistically, have no way of hypothesizing how that might be the case, but uh, that's the story that people often tell. And they say, no, I'm not having a hallucination. I am having a, a transcendental vision, and it's the real reality. Uh, to me, it looks like different ways of talking about the same thing. I'm very much of a language philosopher, actually. Yeah, there is. That's, there's why, I that's why I said perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I hope though that it's not the way that um, people often, you know, reduce phenomena to the natural um, explanation, but have often in the past. I'm hoping, you know, that we could at least be more open um, going into the future. I think we all share this belief, even even like the most, you know, staunch, uh, you know, materialist empiricist attitudes within us agree you know um maybe we are skeptical that it is the astral realm that the imagination is proper to but it is an interesting framework to consider that you know when we have imagination even at the periphery of perception in ordinary waking state consciousness that in fact that which supports in fact all the sense cosmos is you know the the connection that that we have to everything you know in the deeply transcendental etc sense i don't know that's what we're thinking about when we bring together disciplines like mathematics phenomenology second order cybernetics and so on you know i think that a lot of the framework that lily had 50 years ago for this kind of stuff and intended to have. See, I, see, I think the the name PERC, right, the Phenomenology Experimental Research Center, had that intention. Um, you know, to think of this as, I don't know, intentional research, and in, in you know, as as a phenomenological, um, uh, you know, method. But it wasn't necessarily Husserl. I mean, I don't know if if like they were reading Husserl in California at the time. Um, I know that there was some Husserlian phenomenology happening. Uh, we, there's some history about that, you know? But yeah, I, I wonder if, if Claire can comment on the 50 years ago California phenomenology situation. I, I wrote my senior honors thesis in 1970 on um, Husserl and at the University of California Riverside. And I can tell you, I was just saying that at breakfast, I think that, um, I didn't, well, Riverside wasn't my first choice, but it was probably the only place, one of the only places in America that I could have written on Husserl. There, there was Dreyfus at uh, UCB at Berkeley, and uh, I guess Mohanty was around and Sokolowski was around. The, my teacher would have, who was Bern Magnus, who was a Heidegger scholar and Nietzsche scholar, 
uh, I think he would have recommended that I go to the new school for social research at that time if I wanted to continue on with the doctorate, but I didn't want to continue because I didn't see any way of seeing uh, being a Husserli an American Husserlian. That sounds familiar to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm the, you know, what is the horse's mouth, you can say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Yeah, because I, I was hoping you, you would maybe jump in there <laughs> a little bit. I mean, there is there is, of course, you know, um, plenty of of interesting research about um, Husserlian phenomenology in North America. I think I'm quoting the title right of a, a recent publication, um, um, Michela Michela, um, right? Oh, and of course, yeah, Temenetska. Oh, yeah, at Stanford, right? Yeah. She wanted to get a job. Uh, this is through the IIP, by the way, the information. Uh, she wanted to get a job at Stanford, but she wasn't accepted. Probably had something to do with her knowledge of English, I would say. But uh, but she was doing her role, and she she um, published uh, Pope John Paul II before he was John Paul II. She published his first book which was, I think, his doctoral dissertation of 1958 on the acting person, which was phenomenologically uh, oriented. But anyway. but anyway, she was one of the people. Yeah, and she worked yeah. with yeah. Pepper, um, you know, the world hypothesis there. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so, so certainly the phenomenological context, I feel, is is important and and something that has developed since 50 years ago and in some ways maybe is more ready to take in the intentions of that kind of phenomenological work that was happening um, in new modalities. So, I mean, you know, I didn't have exact designs. I mean, I, I have my own ideas, um, you know, with like Fink with um, the phenomenology of phenomenology, the second order phenomenology, there's many parallels. The transcendental onlooker is a lot like our Spencer Brownian, you know, inspired um, cybernetic idea of the observer. So, I mean, there, there's so many parallels and, and I think we've actually been doing a great job at this conference in weaving all these things together. Um, well, so, yeah. I, I, have a, I have a suspicion that, uh, the the river that flowed through uh, through Husserl um, came from Brentano, and nice. that uh, the flowing from Brentano, some of it passed Husserl, and so some of those ideas of the question of the of the phenomena uh, as counter to uh, the the mechanistic left brain scientific positivism of Anglo American Anglo American philosophy is a, a broader stream than merely Husserlian phenomenology. Um, yeah. Stein, I mean, was one of Husserl students. Rudolf uh, Steiner was a Brentano student as well. Yeah. Yes. But, but even, but, even Dermot Moran pointed out that, um, that Steiner reports that Brentano at the very mention of Neoplatonism would like fly into a fit of rage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, Husserl was a, a mathematician. He was a doctor of mathemat mathematics when he began taking Brentano's classes. And a lot of people took Brentano's classes because Brentano was a really exceptional person and a good teacher but they didn't necessarily turn out like Brentano. One person that was his student was Masaryk, the founder of the Czech Republic. And uh, Husserl was tempted by the psychology from an empirical standpoint. But once he got to Halle, and I think a lot because he was a mathematician and also probably the impact of Cantor, uh, he became... Uh, well, anti-positivist, anti anti-empiricist, anti-psychologist, and um, and de developed a, a, a Platonic and a, a Neoplatonic um, a meta metaphysics. But I mean, he had a, a dialogue with, with, which I almost included if I had the time in my paper, 
with Brentano in the, uh, at the, after the turn of the century, I think in 1908, where he tried to convince Brentano, uh, but uh, you know, he said, I'm not, a, I'm not a mystic, I'm not a far gone guy or anything of all the things you hate, but, um, it, it, but it, Brentano was anti, uh, completely anti-metaphysical and everything. He was a Catholic priest, but he did live the, leave the priesthood and marry and um but i also have some articles on that <laughs> all of that and then don't forget that an important influence in the in the california movement uh was uh gestalt therapy um i i don't know the, really the, the history the or, origins of of that but it uh it seemed a very um non-positivist influence at that time yeah, and, and certainly the the um, anthroposophists were very interested in all that the notions of the counter space and projective geometry, non Euclidean geometry, very much connected to those early Gestalt theorists. And here's another question from Uncle Tim. Yeah, you, uh, Randy, you mentioned the observer, you know, and I was just kind of going back to the question of the of the use of the tank and. I was I was thinking, you know, the, the tank could be uh, a space for reclaiming what would otherwise be observed in the normal waking state. Then you can reclaim energy for other purposes because uh, because of the muted um, uh, sensory deprivation. As things are muted, and then if you in, intentionally or unintentionally are able to to repurpose those energies for uh you know like a higher purpose maybe this really is an energy reclamation tank in a sense then straight from the therapist <laughs> psychophysical uh, energy and that you know that's is the stress of approach of an avoidance in the in the in the waking world and in the space, you know, once you once you kind of attenuate yourself to it, it could be, uh, yeah, an internal purpose, internal wisdom, an internal physiological experience that would be nourishing to the body, psyche, and soma. Yeah, that's yeah. that's evocative. Yes, um, if if an important method of the tank is the reduction of uh, input from the moving body i i think one of the uh one of the effective practices of entering the tank is the same as the practice of meditation uh don't move uh if you don't move you're reducing a whole lot of proprioceptive and kinesthetic in, in, input uh and uh, i suppose that uh, releases the um the brain uh, in its processing to uh, do other processing. Uh, one of the uh, the figures describing what happens in those cases is that the, the brain uh, hallucinates uh, because it's freed up from uh, integrating all of the input from the external world that, uh, that normally occurs. Uh, the figure of shifting shifting energies I think is uh, analogically useful for thinking about that kind of that kind of thing. So when a person goes into the tank, they're uh, uh, not using much of their capacity for something that they're normally normally using, integrating the external environment and maintaining the kind of self identity that is uh, constructed in order to. Uh, operate in the external environment, allowing and, the imagination to uh, uh, to use perhaps other, uh, almost as Lily puts it, uh, information uh, that's been hanging around in the person's mind. Um, he, uh, I think that's the kind of thing that he talks about as programming, self-programming and programming by the metaprogrammer. Yeah, and and you know, I, I highlight again the word perhaps that you used earlier, because um, you just mentioned hallucination, again, and you know sometimes 
we think of John Lilly and his, um, you know, drug induced experiences in the float tank. Um, at other times, in, in other contexts, it's a spiritual experience that is orthodox. And um, in Edith Stein's essay, uh, Martin Heidegger's Existential Philosophy, there's this really cool quote. Um, she quotes Conrad Martius, her friend Hedvig Conrad Martius, and in particular, Conrad Martius's review of being and time in, in Deutsche Zeitschrift, um, 1933. And um, I was hoping to um, to uh, to quote this because it's it's a perfect like uh, way of framing this notion of the door again. So, but I I I um I would do want to um, let Tim respond or or how you know ask another question as well, and then and then I'd like to to read that too. So I'll I'll come back to this point, you know, in a moment after this discussion. I was just going to say the the the. We, that doorway, maybe, Randy, is, you know, the term might be interoception as opposed to our exteroception. And that's the, that's really the, the opportunity of the tank, you know, for, uh, to, to go through what doorway to some potentials, to some underlying piece. I mean, it could be to, under some underlying sense of stillness, but it could also be some underlying creative, you know, uh, new, new uh, generative idea or something. Yeah, and certainly when we need to open up to um, you know these high level like cosmic um, questions, and 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 so to contribute to the the world as a whole, which in previous generations we haven't been able to do that. We haven't had the opportunity of a global platform. I mean, this is something new that we've been playing with and um, enjoying in you know a um, a sort of trivial manner, a mundane sort of way. But of course we're 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 toying with it, you know, and we're also in, employing it um, for serious work at these levels. Um, but but yeah, now's the opportunity to, to activate this this global platform that we have as a really like fairly democratic um, situation, like the internet, you know, and, and the idea of like the whole earth catalog back in the day. Um, you know, we see that being realized with social media and, um, but, but anyway, I don't mean to even <laughs> just get all into that because um, on that platform, let us, let us look at this um, real quick here. I, I wonder if this, you know, I don't want to consider this like the doorway that brings us to lunch, but um, but maybe to to launch us into a final moment of our workshop discussion as well. So let me just um, read the quote from Conrad Martius here. This is Edith Stein's report of Conrad Martius. I have the Conrad Martius next to it as well, but I'll read Edith Stein's report. Hedvig Conrad Martius says of Heidegger's approach that it is, quote, like when a door that has been unopened and almost no longer openable for long periods of time is blown open with tremendous force, wise caution and per persistent tenacity, and then immediately slammed again, locked and barricaded so strongly that reopening seems impossible, end quote. With his conception of the human ego elaborated with inimitable philosophical sharpness and energy. He has the key to a doctrine of being that chasing away all subjectifying, relativizing, and idealizing ghosts could lead right into the middle of and back into a true cosmological and God-born world. He uses, quote, being first and foremost in its full and complete rights, end quote, even if only in one place on the self, right? Dasein, uh, readers aside. <laughs> he determines the being of the ego in, in that it understands being. He determines the being of the ego in that it understands being, right? This is, this is again, I emphasize Dasein. If, if I'm not entirely mistaken, I'm hoping to get the attention of the Heideggerian listeners. <laughs> this clears the way to undeterred Undeterred by the critical question of how the knowing eye can get beyond itself, this clears the way to exhaust the this understanding of being, which belongs to human being itself, and thus not only one's own being, but also the being of the world and all that to grasp the divine being, this is a weird translation, that establishes creational being. Almost done. <laughs> 
Instead, the ego is thrown back on itself, period. Heidegger justifies his starting out from the analysis of Dasein with the fact that one can only ask about the meaning of being to whose meaning an understanding of being belongs. And because Dasein has an understanding not only of its own being, but also of other beings, that is why one must begin with the analysis of Dasein. So it's a, it's a long quote, and it, of course, brings up like the most advanced, you know, kind of phenomenological discussion. But the imagery of, you know, Heidegger opening the question of being, we admit this, Conrad Martius admits this was a good move. He did that. Yes, yes, very good. But then what did he do? <laughs> he, like, like the jerk we're starting to see him as with the black notebooks coming out and stuff. And, and with Dermot Moran's um, lovely um, explanations of how, you know, um, Martin Heidegger might be the, the uh, de nomo editor of the Inner Time Consciousness um, uh, lectures. In fact, it was Edith Stein's work and, and Heidegger kind of stole that when, when it was um, his post. You know, Conrad Martius had a lot of that Dasein's Lara and, and all the like being in the world and all that, that Heideggerian stuff. So, I mean, it's just, it's just interesting to consider like different kinds of phenomenology and, and, and in, in particular, Conrad Martius's critique of Heidegger. But th this is just, you know, one little thing that we can say about these, these big questions that everybody appreciates, that everyone understands, even beyond phenomenology, just about the question of being, why are we here? What can the, the isolation of the phenomenological epoch and the physical isolation tank and, you know, yogic traditions, Christian mystical traditions, meditative practices, what, sh what can we gain from this, you know, as a world society and, I don't know, as like, as like a, a, a global or a contributor to a global government, you know, to a, to a discussion, to a, a big global discussion. That is the continuation of, of science and philosophy. It's an, it's an open question. <laughs> but I hope that we open that door, you know? That door within the door or whatever. But maybe the door within the door is just another way of saying the door. No, I mean the door, the real door, the ultimate door, the door, you know? Because that's the door that we want to open. How about um, this? How is, about Randy? Uh, 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 this is a very short comment. Uh, it goes back to what you were saying about things opening up in the presence of non movement in the tank. It's of interest to compare this with the moving from center that occurs in moving meditations, which also creates opening but perhaps not an opening in a, an opening with quite a different quality so that I think the, the comparison is worth making. That's all I wanted to say. I'm going to give it to you, Jerry, because I know that you and Lou, maybe you can remind us by the way of, of your, your context. It's interesting, you know, um, Okay, sure. Very briefly. Well, Lou, Lou and I have have been playing laws of form together for over a half a century. Uh, Lou, Lou and I were were part of the uh, the Chicago Laws of Form group uh, that I started when I came back from uh, from from Esalen, uh, carrying with me uh, Tai Chi Chuan and laws of and laws of form. Uh, I might say my my two meditation practices are are Tai Chi, which is a moving one, and uh, a Vipassana meditation, which is a unmoving an unmoving one. And uh, you're talking about the door; it gives me a kind of a Zenish thought. Uh, the the door we're really interested in is the doorless door, uh, the um, the motionless movement, uh, the the move the moving the moving stillness. Uh, these are the uh, again the opposites that are, aren't opposites. Right, that, that's what I meant when I spoke about moving from center. Yes. Yes, I I I know. Uh, Lou and I have been doing this a long time. We've been paying a lot of attention to laws of form for a long time. So when we when when we when we think, uh, our, our thoughts tend to be very close, even we even though our 
uh, uh, we are so different from each other. Yeah, that's the point. Uh, that's the point about the world. Uh, can we be close even though we are, are so different? It, it was kind of the point of my iguana experience. Uh, the point is that, you know, when you meet another being, another being, an other being, um, I, I have this notion of the development of the self, the uh, emergence uh, into consciousness, uh, in, into uh, illusionary selfhood of the neonate as an awareness of the other. I think this may be somewhat Heideggerian, that the self is the other. And the distinction is made, but what is what gets distinguished is the unmarked state, which you ca cannot speak of. It is the unspeakable. But of course, we want to tell stories. Uh, Leon is a storyteller. We want to tell stories, so we want to speak the unspeakable. And we do constantly, over and over again. But when we speak the unspeakable, it's gone. It's no longer the unspeakable. As soon as you make a mark in the unmarked state, it's no longer unmarked. It's the marked state. So you can't say anything without destroying the nothing out of which everything flows. Uh, if I want to speak the truth and I hear myself, I move more and more towards speaking a satisfying untruth. Uh, Harold Bloom, in his book on uh, uh, Kabbalah and criticism, says that uh, all, all translation is a lie, that all interpretation is a lie, that all reading, all hermeneutics can only lie. And the only way to tell the, the truth is to lie. And you can kind of get that intuition at the very beginning of laws of form. It starts out, what's the first word? The first word in laws of form <coughs> is not I. The first word is we. We take as given. So the first thing that appears <clears throat> in the emergence of laws of form out of nothing is we. And the second thing that emerges is the dynamic between taking and being given. <clears throat> Does the world give us itself or do we take from the world well we make that distinction but before we make that distinction there is no distinction so in i can't say reality in pre-reality taking and giving are the same self and other are the same <clears throat> In the silence, there is no noise, but in the silence, there is all sound. And as we're humans in a human frame with this complicated nervous system that is linked to the world in ways that we learn about and that we ignore, ignore the thought is gone. I don't know what I wanted to say. <laughs> Maybe you know what I wanted to say. Husserl say calls it. that the dunkel, um, uh, the dark something, the dunkel etvas. Jim Hart gets all into it. Uh, I'm sorry, you weren't done. <laughs> but let, let, no, no. But, uh, okay. I, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, I'm not. Yes, I am. Yes, yes I'm, I'm not. not. No, I am. We we are we are not over time. Uh, for lunch let us let us parmenidean pivot um through the doorless door <laughs> shall we so let's thank jerry okay and and let us um depart for lunch and i think we can just be on schedule right we'll we're like we'll just have a nice lunch and and come back and be on time all right
Parl Hayden Smith is Associate Professor of Media at the University of East London. He is also founder of the Museum of Consciousness at Oxford University and co founder of the Cyberdelics Society. Hi. Recording in progress. Hey. Hey. All right. His research concentrates on the relationship between technology and the human condition. Raising over 10 million pounds in research funding, Carl has worked on numerous large-scale Leonardo lifelong learning and Erasmus Plus and FP7 and Horizon 2020 projects and the X Prize. He has given over 300 invited public lectures, conference presentations, and keynotes in 40 countries and published more than 50 academic papers. His research interests also include contextology, that is context engineering, embodied cognition, <clears throat> spatial literacy, umwelt hacking, <clears throat> let me pronounce that again, umwelt hacking, hacking, and sensory augmentation. And today, Carl's title is DMTX as a form of transhuman technology. So let's warmly welcome Carl. Okay, thank you so much. And what a pleasure to be here. Let me just share my screen. So hopefully you can see my screen okay. So I'm speaking to you from uh, Icaria in Greece, an amazing island that is in the blue zone. And uh, we are, yeah, surrounded by 117 year olds, et cetera. And the place is run by cats, but they allow humans to be here as well. Um, but yeah, Icaria is something special. It has the cave of Dionysus here and uh, some of the most powerful hot springs in the world, which may contribute to the longevity. So my talk today, DMT extended as a form of transhuman technology. So this is me trying to explain what I do to, for work. Um, I do a lot of interesting academic work when it comes to cognitive science, but I also do a lot of fascinating psychedelic research, um, both with uh, entheogens and with novel dissociatives. So a little video to start us off. Who knows where songs come from? You just have to sit there and I always feel like, you know, Michael Jackson said one time, you have to let God in the room. I think that's exactly true. You have to sit there and relinquish all control. I think people think when you write and you create, you're the person in control and you're making all this happen as if you're, you know, some kind of magician or something. But it's not really that. You sit there and you become an antenna and you just let things happen through you. And the more you let it happen, the more you relinquish control, the, I think the more beautiful it is. It becomes something that has almost nothing to do with you. And the songs, if people like the songs, they get played on the radio, I fill up doors, they and get played in bars around the world or whatever, they, they're not yours anymore. So yeah, I think it's really important uh, when I'm sort of premising this talk is this idea that we're channels and not just uh, minds, we're also embodied. I think the, the, the big uh, hyperbole around machine learning focuses way too much on intelligence and not on the subjective experience, not on experience itself. And I think this is where we have an advantage over our creations, over the, the, the sentience that we may develop. So there's many different types of entities or umwelts. This idea of an umwelt means that your sensorial system is very different to your dogs or your pets or your other, all the other species in the world. So we, we have five different kingdoms or maybe six um, according to who you speak to, animal, plant, fungi, protist, and monera. And also it's important to keep in mind, so all of those kingdoms are very different uh, umwelts, very different ways of experiencing the same world. But we need to keep, keep in mind that, you know, we, we are very human-centric, and I'm going to talk about the differences between the different types of humanism. Um, but we're also very much bacteria. 
it's, a, it's almost a 50 50 split so we're very much living in a nested ecology then you've got all these other types of entities you've got the dmt entities you've got uh, tulpas um or egregores um so this idea around you know a thought form um you know imaginary friends you may have had but tulpas the, excuse the spelling on these but tulpa is a, is a tibetan thought form an egregore you could argue is a multiple thought form and, and a, a religion would be an egregore my question is does the do, you know if i say christ consciousness what impact does that have on your physiology uh, what does it bring to mind um because it's it's got it's very heavily laden whether it has sentience or not is another matter um and then we've got all of the the the, the talk around ai sentience so there's many many different types of sentience I'm really interested in in what is the human sentience here. Um, we know that our our conscious mind operates in a very limited bandwidth, whereas our unconscious or subconscious mind doesn't have the same limits. So, what is it that we can can do to unravel or, or access that subconscious? And I'm really interested in the in the different technologies, whether it's a psychedelic or a breath work or a meditation to to get access to to what's normally hidden from our conscious minds so before we talk about transhumanism i think we all know what transhumanism is i will talk about it but hyperhumanism is is my focus and i think this is a great quote here from um, one of my colleagues cadell last we need to think about a new form of human becoming which is a deeper interpretation on the potentialities of the future than transhumanism where we just imagine AI is taking over from human becoming. So we are not machines, um, so let's not aspire to become them. Another quick video. Hey everybody, I have a wonderful life hack I think you're gonna love, okay? Stop fucking life hacking, okay? You're not a goddamn algorithm, you're not a goddamn robot. We need to hold on to our humanity. Stop appropriating robot culture, okay? Robots have told me they're offended, stop it. Hopefully you're hearing the audio on these little clips. So humans are not evolutionarily equipped to deal with the level of complexity that the rapid rise in disruptive technology is creating. Design or be designed is the new mantra, which is ontological design. How do we use powerful tools like machine learning and AI to help us become more human? This is the basis of hyperhumanism. Hyper here means we may not even be human yet. I think that the humanists uh, un unfortunately put us at the top of the food chain, you know, at a time now where we realize we are um, causing a sixth mass extinction where, you know, if you look at the another kingdom like the mycelium, the mycelium have survived five mass extinctions whilst we're causing the sixth. So we must therefore seek to include the perspectives of these other kingdoms to really define what it means to be human. And what's interesting about the current technologies um, if you look at earthspecies.org um, and various others, we're able to now decode the languages of these other kingdoms and these other species. And maybe we can start to ask them what it what, what they think of the humans. How can AI contribute to a holistic understanding of what it means to be human within all of life? And I think one of the most interesting parts of AI at the moment is this idea around decoding other languages. So AI, we know, is a codified representation of human prejudice. Therefore, in order to really train the AI to maximize towards the appreciation, understanding and betterment of life, we need to feed the algorithm with the most appropriate version of humanity. That version of humanity, unfortunately, may not yet exist and is certainly not found within humanism, post-humanism or transhumanism. So let's look at where humans are in terms of the world clock. We can see that we've, we're barely here. Um, we've been here for a very few minutes in terms of this 24 hour clock. And I'm really interested in the the other, you know, the, the history of where we how we've got here, um, but also what what else is here with us. We know that the metaverse means that a lot of us are spending a lot of time creating virtual selves. This is another form of entity, another another sentence you could argue. Um, whilst we're atrophying the, the real self, we're we're doing the ready player one thing and uh, feeding the feeding the, the egregore of the metaverse. So what is hyperhumanism? Hyperhumanism is this kind of 
you know our our, our chemistry lab the the way we can access and manipulate our own chemistry without the need for really using technology at all um, and there's thousands of different hyperhuman techniques which i'm cataloging i'll touch on some of those but hyperhumanism basically examines how technology can help us to transform the human condition where where technology just becomes a scaffold for you to build a skill yourself so just like when you had a bicycle and you you used to um you have you know these um and these the, the, you know um the, the supporters on your bike the the scaffolds that enabled you to cycle you you removed them for a through a few months the these uh these augments um transhumanism however requires us to become dependent on technology which subverts our ability to develop the skills for ourselves that's the key criticism um and i'm gonna i'm gonna be focusing on on dmt extended shortly but Keep in mind that transhumanism is this idea that we we are um, you know giving over our abilities to get there ourselves. In contrast, hyperhumanism uses technology as a catalyst for developing our own innate human abilities. So this is kind of a, a split between the the, the four. That there's also metahumanism. So humanism puts us at the top of the food chain. Posthumanism thinks that the human condition, uh, the human project's already over. Transhumanism thinks it's inevitable that we will become cyborgs and and merge with the machines. Um, metahumanism is an interesting one because it's they they understand that we must talk to the other species in order to understand what we are. Um, but unfortunately, the metahumanists think that we should cease human reproduction, which I think is a bit of a mistake that may well happen by by default anyway, uh, due to microplastics, etc. So hyperhumanism is my focus. And I think that we really need um, an alternative to transhumanism. And I think that this is a this is the idea that we, you know, we have uh, not five senses, but 50, uh, 50 plus maybe. So how many of those senses are you aware of even? or utilizing and how can we start to be aware of them and start to action some of these in, internal technologies that we have atrophied because of technologies. If you want to know more about hyperhumanism, check out this book that's just been published, Abyssal Arrows. Um, my chapter in there is overbecoming hyperhumanism as a bridge towards interbeing. So as I mentioned, me and my friend Eddie Castaneda, we've started to map out these technologies and techniques of hyperhumanism. But to give you an idea of some of them, uh, psychogeography, I don't know whether you're, you know, you're, you're practicing or aware of psychogeography, this idea that one side of the street is uh, preferable to the other side of the street and you can't really understand why. Uh, all sorts of stuff to do with dream incubation, dream yoga, uh, practicing any kind of techniques in a, in a, a lucid state where you have to apply not just the content, but the context itself. So applying gravity, if you're doing Tai Chi in a dream state, you have to be a world builder. So building the world rather than just building whatever you're doing individually. Peripheral vision exercises, uh, Qi machines, Shakti mats, all of these are, are what I consider hyperhumanist technologies. So as I mentioned, the humanist person at the top of the food chain, this is much more like it, though. This is this idea that we're in a nested ecology and we're 100 percent dependent on the, on, on these uh, other species, etc. So we're, in terms of our technologies, we're, there's a real trend, a move away from information communication uh, to experience communication. We no longer want to no longer want to watch films. We want to be inside them. And McLuhan, I was onto this, you know, long time ago, talking about hot and cold media. So cold media being things like radio and and books. So reading a book, you're a co-creator. You're, you, you know, you're filling in that world. You're building that world with your own imagination. Whereas a hot media would be the metaverse, this idea of a, a completely simulated um, CGI reality where none of that's built by you. You're just literally uh, feeding, uh, you're consuming much more of a consumer rather than a co-creator. So a little bit of a perception primer. We only experience 1% of the auditory spectrum and 1% of the visual spectrum. So how do we really um, break out of that? How do, we, how do we access more of that in terms of the subconscious, as I mentioned earlier on? How do we 
become more aware of what of what we can what we can do with our with our systems our perception determines what aspects of reality we see our brain focuses on survival and makes us see what it wants us to see our brain often therefore ignores whatever we may be interested in that represents no threat there are many hidden aspects of reality and i believe that's that's where things like dmt uh, can give us some some uh, leg up we're also in an attention war this idea that your attention is being subverted constantly and your attention is your consciousness so be aware of how often you are distracted i've done a whole ted talk a ted, a tedx talk at oxford university around this idea of us uh, uh, you know how how we're locked in in various uh, levels so refer to that if you want to have a an insight into how we're locked into our perception locked into our image media because we're looking th everything through through uh, linear perspective rather than curvilinear perspective our social media our phones are locking us in um, and also then we're locked in if we're not moving around very much we don't have any optic flow which is just simply this idea of things moving through you know seeing things in your peripheral vision as you move through the world if you don't move around very much you, you really atrophy your ability to re remember and to think and to create Nietzsche also uh, was onto this. What does man actually know about himself? Is he indeed ever able to perceive himself completely as if laid out in a uh, in a white display case? Does nature not conceal most things from him, even concerning his own being, in order to confine and lock him within a proud, deceptive consciousness? Nature threw away the key. And uh, uh, this is exacerbated um, by our technologies. If we think about the the latest uh, from, um, you know, the way we hold our phones, the phone is the new mirror. And uh, unfortunately, that means that a lot of people think they're, they're, they need a nose job because they're seeing themselves through these, these very strange prisms. So just look at the dot, black dot. I don't know whether that works on your side, but this is a completely black and white image, which now is fading to let me just run it once more. So it's very easy to trick the brain. We're already living in a virtual reality. And if you were to look at these uh, these images for 30 minutes, the McCulloch effect would, would take hold and uh, you would, um, yeah, your visual uh, cortex would be affected for three months. So don't look at them. So consciousness is programmable, as Jamie Will here is talking about hedonic engineering. But what's the point of that? What, what can we do if we understand that our consciousness is programmable? And to what extent is it programmable? Jamie Will here is uh, using a stack of respiration, um, embodiment, music, sex, um, to achieve a 5-MeO-DMT state. Also, we, we hear a lot about this term neuroplasticity, but again, what if, we, if we're going to take DMT extended or if we're going to take 5-MeO-DMT, it could lead to an abundance of neuroplasticity, but what do we do with that? So let's move on to the meat of the, the talk. Again, there's a much longer version of what I'm going to talk about now online. It's, it's, it's by, hosted by New Nautics. It's an almost three hour conversation moderated by Rick Strassman, Andrew Gallimore and uh, Graham Hancock with four of us from the Imperial study. Um, there was only nine of us that took part in the DMT extended state at Imperial College London. I was very lucky to be the first person to, to do all five doses of the of the experiment. It was a three month uh, experiment two years ago now. And uh yeah, it was extraordinary. But I've actually done six years as a participant uh, at Imperial. And um, thanks to the team there, they really look after you. And um, Chris Timmerman and Lisa uh, Luan have been um, leading the study there. So back in 2016, the first phase was um, intravenous DMT with an EEG cap. And I almost got thrown out of the study there because I was doing too much in terms of breath work. And I did explain to the team that you know, you navigate the DMT realm with your breath. So you do need better equipment. Uh, fortunately, they got that better equipment and that now they have an EEG cap that, ho that holds 256 points and costs, I believe, around 250,000 pounds. So very high density EEG. But in the middle phase, 
I was in an fMRI scanner, so I had a, a brain scan whilst being injected with DMT. And um, this was the result. So me, this was me before the injection, and this was me directly afterwards. So quite an astonishing array of entities I met um, during that experience. And the amount of entities that turned up on mass, very concerned for me because I'm in a scanner. Normally they're the ones that are scanning you. Um, but yeah, quite an amazing experience. And again, there's talks online where you can dive into that uh, breaking convention. I've given a whole talk on this specific part of the experience. Um, what's interesting is um, also during the DMT study that they, they create specific music for the um, for the experience. So they, they would play you DMT, use this music for the DMT trip. Uh, Mas uh, Pascal Savvy had created this music. And even though none of you maybe have heard this music, I, because I'm hearing it, I'm actually starting to, to, to get the effects of DMT. So it's this idea of imprinting, which I then use as a 5-MeO DMT facilitator for the last 12, 13 years. I would use a singing bowl to, to enable um, this imprinting. So as people are coming back from a 5-MeO experience, very intense experiences, if you uh, um, uh, play some music or, or do some singing bowls, then whenever they hear a singing bowl uh, in normal reality, they may well have a reactivation or certainly get some part of that state space back. This actually is called reminiscence therapy and is used in uh, for dementia patients, where we know that if dementia patients are given access to, to music from their, their past, especially music that meant a lot to them, they can start to, to remember. Another one to, to try a novel dissociative called DIPT only affects your auditory system. So fascinatingly with DMT, there seems to be some sort of language that's persistent. I see a hieroglyphic language that's holographic made of light. And I put out to the community, you know, are you also seeing this language, this light language? And um, a lot of people certainly were, and they were giving me these examples back. The best example is from Alison Gray here on the on the bottom right. Unfortunately, this is still too flat, still still two D. <clears throat> but um, yeah, one of one of my hopes for DMT Extended was the ability to draw the language in real time to be able to bring it back. But unfortunately, their protocols were quite strict and did not allow me to to do any drawing. But yeah, this light language is something to behold, uh, super interesting, and uh, love to explore it more. So this idea of DMT extended, which is the most recent um, part of the, the, the trial, most recent part of the, the uh, DMT trial, um, involved this ability to, just like when you're being anesthetized, to drip feed DMT into the body. And, uh, you know, there is a small amount of tolerance that's built up, but very marginal. So you can kind of be kept inside this this remarkable um, state, potentially indefinitely. And that's where it becomes a transhumanist technology because I believe we are here to have a human experience and knowing a lot of people that are already living in virtual reality, um, how do we make sure that um, people don't abuse this technology and kind of use the, uh, you know, use the third dimension as a way of launching into the fifth. Um, so living in hyperspace, and Andrew Gallimore is um, really taking this to heart and uh, is really exploring how we can have, um, you know, a bit of suspended animation going on where you are drip fed the, the DMT, your waste management is taken care of, your drip fed food, uh, IV infusion of nutrients, et cetera. So, you know, this is for me a, a step too far. I think we're here for a thousand months to have human experience. And uh, yeah, how do we make sure that that is, the case and, and people don't atrophy the, the the body or atrophy the planet if you look at ready player one um you know the planet just becomes a wasteland because everyone's in virtual reality i, I foresee a similar reality here and also the, another another danger is people being able to record dreams i think it was strange days that film where um people were recording their dreams and they they stopped really living they just lived to dream so they would wake up they would review their dream and then go back to sleep and dream again. So there's many, many of these transhumanist opportunities, I believe. And if we were able to sort of live inside DMT world, 
imagine falling asleep because you'd still need to sleep. So imagine dreaming on DMT and what sort of inception that would result in and whether we would end up having DMT swimming lessons and DMT haircuts. Um, Andrew Gallimore, again, has come up with some really interesting research around how we may no longer even need uh, DMT um, with this idea of magnetoreceptors, so literally switching on and off, off receptors whilst asleep. And, um, you know, I, I did a bit of research to see if there's anyone using float tanks whilst uh, in a DMT space. I think that that's not really happened yet, but certainly could happen at some point, especially if we weren't using uh, DMT, but with, with the, these magnetoreceptors. So these are some of the drawings that I made during um, the, the third dose of the experience. And, and it's really, you know, this, this, this phenomenology of a mesh-like structure being created. You're like in a playpen where you're being observed by these entities. And whether those entities are in a parallel reality, whether it's just your imagination, I don't really mind. I think that it's if it is just the imagination, wow, then your imagination is incredible. Um, but yeah, I see this, this sort of language this was the fourth dose. I haven't got a huge amount of time to go into all of these, but again, refer to the uh, the, the longer video that I mentioned earlier. So DMT is a as a window where you're sort of seeing this other reality, um, and then D later on in the trip, DMT as a, X as a mirror, um, sort of revealing your you know it's quite moral. It, it sort of shows you what you're doing well in life and what you're doing badly, and also really encourages you, just like the uh, the mystery schools of ancient Greece to really get on with it and uh, not to languish because you're here for such a short period of time and your your ob ability to do your mission is, 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 is limited. The fifth dose was extraordinary. I was given a key inside the DMT space by the entities and I had to physically grab it in space. And uh, it resulted in um, what, something I've always asked um, because I've, I've done a, a number of 5-MEO experiences um, and if you've done 5-MeO DMT, you'll experience a very different reality to a DMT experience. 5-MeO DMT seems to result in you becoming light itself um, with a complete collapse of the subject-object relationship, no longer having a body at all, but just your body. Your body is made of light. You become light itself, and you're in this non-dual experience. And I've always asked, in kind of maybe a bit of a greedy way, what is beyond this um, this uh, non-duality what's producing this non-duality so that was my intention and has been my intention for a number of years and this key uh, seemed to give me this this experience so at the bottom of my bed at imperial um remember i'm being sort of injected in one arm with dmt and and um, bloods are being taken uh, from the other arm and at the bottom of my bed i'm suddenly seeing a disc a white disc that's sort of rotating it looks like a black hole, but it's a white hole, and and it's the and I know it's the it's this five meo unity space, and I'm sort of shuffling down the bed trying to get inside this hole, um, um, probably much to the dismay of the uh, the researchers in the room, and obviously I'm not going to get there, but uh, still in, intent on getting in this hole, and then all of a sudden this hole cracks apart. It's almost as if there's a takeover inside the DMT realm. And I'm like, oh, God, what's going to happen here? This doesn't feel good. And then suddenly, you know, is it going to go back to a, a duality? But actually what I saw behind the crack was an extraordinary plurality of unities, as if to say there's not just one non-duality. Uh, there's there's all sorts of different types of uh, unity that are being, uh, you know, experienced beyond this realm. So, that, that, you know, we have existence, life, death, etc. But there are many, many different other forms of being that we are just not aware of. So some of the techniques involved, um, I, tra I treated it as a, as a three month uh, meditation. Um, they, you know, you're not allowed to take any other drugs during that three month period. They drug test you before giving you drugs. Um, Chris and Lisa were doing these micro phenomenological interviews, which are really powerful, a really powerful technique for for maintaining and and revisiting that uh, that 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 journey. So they don't ask you to remember your trip; they ask you to re-experience it. Um, and then there's this price of admission where you really need to give yourself over to the entities to to be explored, and and likewise you get to explore them. There's this uh, give and take. Um, there was a three-week um, break between each dose, 
But even so, that wasn't really long enough. Uh, the entities were, were showing signs of annoyance that I was coming back so readily. But they would still work on me. They would still do perform this sort of psychic surgery, and you could you could sense that they were they were healing you or, or working on you um, whilst there. And then we know that in America now, there's there's this big push for DMT extended as a as a new form of technology. So imagine electricity. This is a new form of electricity where you can plug inside, you can plug in and out of the of the you know the, the state without really. Um, you know, too much uh, worry in terms of tolerance, and they're really going to town on uh, all the all the things that that can be included in such journeys. And interestingly, they can they can look at the uh, the dose, and and you can tailor because your 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 you know your your dose is being curated or can be curated. So you could increase the dose at certain points in the journey and decrease it at others. Um, and you could potentially look at different problem solving or different creative problems um, to be solved at different levels. And as I mentioned, it seems to be we're having different relations with light at different at different points. So in this reality, we're experiencing light from the sun. Uh, when you take changa or ayahuasca or DMT, and then DMT, you're you're experiencing light bodies, light, light emitting from objects. And when you take uh, 5-MeO-DMT, Bufo Alvarius, Yopo, you, you seem to become light itself. So we're having different relations with light in these different realms. And it's interesting because I've just spent some time with the Koji tribe from Colombia over at a conference in, in Paris called um, Power. And they um, keep their shamans, so their chosen children, in the dark, in the caves, for nine or 18 years post birth. So they don't see the world for nine or 18 years. Um, and they're taught about the world and, and their endogenous levels of DMT are through the roof. So isn't that fascinating that DMT seems, seem, DMT seems to be all about light, but when you're actually uh, trying to incubate DMT endogenously, it's all about the dark. So to conclude, I think that, um, a lot of my work is about this uh, being with otherness, holding hybridity and multiplicity. And I think it's very important we don't go down this transhumanist route of uh, generating augmented escapism, endless aug augmented escapism. I think we need to build consciousness literacy and we can increase plurality and increase tolerance when we have uh, this, this, this understanding of multiplicity. And I think it's really important to to build in the overview effect in, in everything we do so we can see our backstage, we can understand our, you know, the dark side of what we're doing and we can and maybe not judge it, but but meta program it. And uh, building frameworks for generating altered traits, I think that we're all chasing our tails trying to have these altered states, but how do we really integrate those experiences. Uh, and create altered traits, lasting change that's not just good for you as an individual, but good for your society, for your tribe. And I think that it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's integration's hard, just like bringing something back from a dream. And finally, it's our birthright to explore our consciousness. We are now entering a new frontier by being able to develop peripheral and parallel forms of consciousness, giving us a chance to stretch out and expand our human experience. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, this is my last quote. I wish I could sh show you when you are lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. Thank you. Beautiful. If you have thank any you questions, so much, yeah. Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we have lots of questions and comments. Great. I feel the energy in the room. I see the hands wanting to rise. I know we all have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Um, in your conclusion, you mentioned that um, in order to kind of subvert these coming transhumanist expectations, there needs to be a bit like a, a construction of conscious literacy, right? Or yeah. Liter literacy of consciousness. Do you have any suggestions or ideas about how that could be approached from a practical level, like for the general public, not people who may not necessarily have the opportunity to experience DMT or to experience an altered state? 
Yes, uh, thank you so much for that question. So I actually have just come back from Sweden. Uh, I don't know whether you know, in Sweden, they have gone down a very sort of strict route when it comes to uh, the ingestion of any medicines that will change consciousness. The only drug they're allowed in Sweden is alcohol, even though they've got a history of alcoholism in their culture. And you can be imprisoned for cannabis. Um, so I think that um, I was at an amazing lecture by a professor of uh, um, psychology at Stockholm University at Borderland Festival, which took place in uh, Borderland Bern, rather, which took place in Sweden. And uh, and he was like, well, we need to counter um, this draconian new drug law. So actually, they've they've started to uh, imprison people just for having the intention of uh, of, of taking a drug, um, which is thought crime right so it's uh it's going completely the wrong route and his his argument was that everyone needs to be uh take you know taken to camps to take psychedelics and i was like no really that's not the right route either i think that there are many different techniques for reaching um altered states and and it is your conscious it is you know it is your consciousness to explore and i think that's where people go go wrong um thinking that they that they must conform i think that we we you know we can reach these these incredible states um, through breath work. I mean that would that would be my first port of call. When I first went to Imperial, I was doing an LSD study, and uh, and the control was to do holotropic breath work, um, which was actually far more powerful than than LSD. Um, but please drop me an email because I'm going to um, document a lot of these techniques and a lot of them do not require any uh, any um, ingestion of medicines. They're, they're hyperhuman techniques that we can do ourselves without any, uh, yeah, without any necess necessity for, for a lot of training or um, yeah, a, a lot of knowledge, even just uh, base, basic techniques that we can all do. Thank you. There's another question on the Zoom. Uh, Fred, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Carl. What a fascinating talk. Um, I love the idea that the human hasn't been born yet, and I think we might cling to that and develop that idea in the future. And as we consider that, we have to ask ourselves in the humanity as we understand it so far, who's actually done something that was worthwhile or what have we got better at? I wonder if you would place your hyperhumanism in context of such um, long drawn out skills as theurgy, particularly, which seems to be the manipulation of circumstances to get people into a, um, a situation in which they are better oriented with respect to the gods. A goal taken over in part by um, ceremonial magic, for example, and also without a name on it in the development of industrial uh, rave technologies, you know, DJs, festivals. Um, have you considered it in, in light of that as part of a broader spectrum of elevatory techniques for lack of a better word <laughs> i can't hear you carl yeah you're muted sorry thread so yeah thanks so much what was the term that you used the, the first time you the theurgy. theurgy 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 yes i've done a i've done actually a much longer version of this talk which goes into all the different modalities of hyperhumanism specifically a lot on sound um i run something called the museum of consciousness at, from oxford university which is all around sound and altered states and uh yeah and and functional functional sound so how do we use sound to become more human how do we use sound to understand that we may we may reach a point where we can get prescriptions of sound instead of prescriptions of pharmaceuticals and build sound hospitals. So that's really where we're going with that project. And I think that, yeah, if you if you look at all the different senses and all the senses that we're not aware of, um, so for instance, the, the North Sense is um, one of the uh, products from Cyborg Nest uh, that, that you could argue our transhumanist uh, company, their, their, their trope is we don't wanna wear technology, we want to become technology. But interestingly, they developed a, a simple device that you, you sort of in, not implanted, but just um, body pierce that vibrates every time you face north. And 300 people bought that device. And uh, and it was super interesting seeing what happened to those 300 people. So my job was to evaluate what happened to those people over the course of a year. And what was fascinating was that they started to imprint their memories, not just 
with the usual um, sort of parameters, but with, also with direction. So knowing where they were in space. And if you talk to the indigenous, you know, the Aborigines, they don't say, hello, how are you? They say, where are you coming from and where are you going? So understanding where you are in space is, again, another super interesting parameter for this whole hyperhumanist uh, approach. But yeah, Fred, I'd love to continue the discussion. I think, I think I think the development of the idea of embodiment within cognitive science is precisely where we, we overlap there. Thank you, Carl. Very great. Thanks, Fred. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for this interesting talk. Um, I just had a bit of a thought. I haven't fully developed it yet, but uh, concerning what you said about our different senses and and also that we evolve together with all these other different species, and I would include like uh, our, our organic environment, or even maybe you know um, like the stones and everything, this the sky, every element basically that surrounds us. So I see a little bit of a tension between, and I wonder what you think about that between taking um, <clears throat> chemical substances and being in a space like a confined space and having these people around you that observe you and that kind of like have all these hacks with your body, right? Because you were also talking about embodiment just now. And then, so how does this relate to going into different spaces? So when you are under drugs, you're in this space and then this space is not the space that we evolved with. So not the space that we are connected with, with our bodies. Um, but is it like, um, a prolonged effect like do you see that perhaps when you take like these substances that then when you go back into the world you also create a different relationship with your environment once you are in the world and then that perhaps kind of like triggers all these connections that are dormant or you know that's become so yeah i would like your thoughts on that I'm just trying to grapple with your, is there a question specifically? Because it's a fascinating comment. And uh, obviously the context is king, right? So absolutely, it's certainly not pleasant to, to, to take psychedelics, especially of the order of the, the type of psychedelics that we're given in this trial. Um, and they really only choose the sort of the hard-headed uh, people that aren't going to have a, a, a problem in, in terms of people that have had many different uh, breakthrough experiences. Interestingly, with the DMT extended, uh, they ask you how anxious you are every couple of minutes, which is not, not again, not an ideal thing to be asking people um, when they're when they're going through these experiences. But um, yeah, I, I considered it a, a you know a three month meditation. As I mentioned, it, it's it's certainly not ideal. I think that context, and not just the physical context, but also the body context. You know, how healthy are you? What you know? What's what have you eaten? Um, you know, have you, you know, you know, where, where are you at with your chi, you know, what are your chi levels like? Um, and I think, yeah, do, doing, that's why it's super fascinating in this conference, you know, if we were to take such a medicine inside a flotation tank, and uh, when you when you have no sensory augmentation, no, no sensory input, um, I don't know whether anyone's done that. That's a bit of a, a shout out there to see if that could, that could happen. But, you know, I know that people are looking at flotation, for instance, and one of my colleagues, David Luke, um, is looking at flotation in, in two different locations to see if there can be telepathy. I mean, one thing I would say, and maybe um, is this, you know, once once the four of us in terms of the, the participants were able to talk openly about what happened to them, the amount of uh, different um um abilities that we suddenly seem to have so i i had a a, a, a whole um piece of precognition um that happened to me um during during my dmt extended state where i i knew what was going to happen six months hence um but there was also telepathy there was also um you know the, the, all these different sort of psi um uh, abilities that, that for me are very hyperhuman but yet um, the DMT extended state enabled them. So that's why I'm sort of grappling with this idea of whether the DMT extended state could lead. I mean, obviously, everything could lead to a transhumanist uh, approach. It depends how you use it. But for me, I um, the most powerful thing for me was, yeah, even though I was very much confined to my bed and I, um, you know, and, and, it, and it's not pleasant having people 
um, observe you and, and all of that. But, you know, I was literally one of the, the first people in the uh, first um, to, to try this experience. And it's and it and it's something that um, for me that what's fascinating is that they're not doing this research for PTSD or depression. They're doing it for uh, to explore consciousness. So what is consciousness? And that's something that's uh, very novel. Okay, I have a question, comment, or whatever. I, a question, really. Uh, I'm wondering, you talk about this mystery school, you know, and of course there's a lot of like interesting, um, real academic scholarly material contextualizing this kind of stuff. And of course it does come from these more ancient traditions, right? But I'm wondering like, you know, we have we have school, right? We have universities, we have, I don't know, think tanks, institutions, we have um, independent you know, capitalist driven, um, you know, research institutes and development centers. And wh where can, when can we finally get that mystery school, the DMT mystery school, for example, right? Um, when you're, when you're communing directly with God and the archangels or with the different species of extraterrestrials or whatever the heck these things are, right? But in the context of where, you know, the ancient traditions and philosophy, it's always about um, being and nothingness and the beyond of being and and the, these categories that um, you know we might we might flatten at times and and treat as categories and and ideas right but we can also know that they are intelligences right that they are intelligent and that we can commune with them for we are intelligent we have bodies and souls and spirits and uh, etc you know so so the mystery school concept this should become embodied, you know, it shouldn't just be co-opted by internet bro culture who are all into DMT mystery schools. Like that's, that's cool. Like they, you know, we welcome them here at thinking the float tank, but you know, we want also to bring the mystery school into um, the, the everyday sense of, of school, right? We, we want to reawaken philosophy as the queen of the sciences or whatever, right? So what, what are your thoughts about that, about the mystery school? You know, like, can we take a little of that, that mystery out of it, you know, so to speak? Yeah, thanks for that. I, th I think if we, I mean, my, I'm, in, I'm in Greece at the moment. I will go to Alephsis. Alephsis is the, uh, the, the culture capital of 2023. So it's uh, lots going on uh, at Alephsis. It is Alephsis, not Eleusis, um, as, as, according to my girlfriend, who's uh, an expert in these things. Um, but yeah, I think the mystery schools of ancient Greece and other cultures, they were for the few, unfortunately, they were, they were, it wasn't about um, necessarily how much money you had, it was all around how emotionally uh, developed you are, your emotional intelligence. And I think that that's, that was my answer to the, to the guy in Sweden. It's like, how do you, how do you do that? How do you democratize this while also making sure that these things don't cause mass freakouts. So I think that the the point about the psychedelic renaissance is that, you know, we, we are seeing now the cap capitalization, uh, commercialization of all of this stuff and and the indigenous, if you saw the protests at the recent MAPS conference in Denver, there was a big uh, backlash with 15,000 people all there sort of, you know, representing the bro culture or the, or the capitalist culture and uh, you know, the uh, as the indigenous say, these plants have spirits. They they are spirit, and I think that we need to to respect that. And I think that yeah, if we are going to make the bring the mystery school into into the into the school, I think we need to understand what what the focus of this talk is. Is that there's many ways of getting to to there's many ways up the mountain. The view's the same at the top. Here's another question comment. This is on. Uh, hi, Carl. Thanks a lot. Um, I've got a quick question. It might be a bit personal, but do you have any experience with uh, HPPD, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder? And are you worried about the rising instance of such uh, prolonged visual disturbances that people are experiencing amidst what you call the new psychedelic renaissance? Yeah, thanks for that. No, I've been very lucky to avoid that so far. I think that that's quite a common uh, result of um, LSD, too much LSD. I think LSD does affect the visual system in a negative way. I think that there's, there's more research come, going into that. Um, 
Less so, I think, with DMT. DMT is very short acting. I mean, obviously, when you're doing DMT extended, that's a different scenario. But yeah, LSD, um, n bombs, which I would always advise against using um, because it's toxic, neurotoxic. Um, yeah, I think that with all things, it's uh, it's a case of everything has a risk, um, even breath work. So I think that it's it's about education. I think that these things, the, the the dark side of psychedelics, should be talked about much more. Unfortunately, the way it's going at the moment, it's all like. You know, the, these are the panaceas, the magic bullets, and they're not, of course they're not. Uh, and I think that, you know, a lot of people will never take a psychedelic because they're too scared of losing control and um, all, all because of the law, the, the law situation being very different in different parts of the world. This is why I created the Cyberdelic Society. And cyberdelics aren't new, they're around since the 60s, but using electronic uh, technologies to create altered states or using, as with the Museum of Consciousness, sound to create altered states. I think the non-drug um, altered state is is going to become the the norm, and I think it is our birthright to use our, to explore our consciousness. And uh, you know, I'm very interested in all the different techniques that are being explored. Um, so yeah, um, that would that would that would be my answer. Oh, thanks for that. I do have a second question, if you don't mind. Uh, just because you were talking about also a drug that affects the auditory system. Yeah. Called DIPT, I think. I yes, think right. that would in particular be something interesting to explore in the sensory deprivation tank. Mm. Um, do you have any experience with that substance by any chance? Um, I have not had an opportunity. It's unfortunately quite a rare one on DIPT. Um, I've always wanted to take it at a festival just to see how it would affect uh but yeah, DIPT in a float tank. Let's create the let's get the research study so we can get access to these uh, these novel novel medicines. Let's. <laughs> We're in the embassy. Actually, this is the former U.S. embassy in the Hague. This would be an appropriate place in which to do DMT in the float tank and bring the wisdom from the mystery school to the streets. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, any more any more questions? I, I feel like this is a this is a real opportunity um, as well. Andres, you know, the, the bringing up the, these themes is really important. I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm also curious about the like John Lilly. You know, Lilly wasn't doing DMT. I I I imagine I don't know maybe you know it, I, generally like acid and ketamine right well, well anyway let, let, let's think about that and and um here's here's another uh, comment question okay nobody look at me because i'm very shy right now <laughs> but i have done 5-meo dmt i've smoked the toad venom several times but nothing like the first time it was quite the experience but um i could tell you a lot about it but it would take forever but um there's one part that's interesting is that I met my ancestor. I'm 30% Mayan and it looked like a Mayan guy, real skinny with white eyes. So I assumed I just saw him and I didn't know the reason why I met him and his eyes were all white. So I thought maybe he was on DMT. But um, so what's interesting is, I mean, I'm skipping everything else, but uh, what's interesting is I met him again because Three months later, I was staying um, near Ash Meadows, Nevada, in America, and I went to visit the Devil's Hole. It's a, a landmark that's protected by cameras and a chain link fence by the military. But um, I had this strong urge to meditate there, and it was so strong, but I wasn't able to get back there after leaving there. And so I begged and begged, and I couldn't, and then... Uh, that night I Googled meditating at the devil's hole and I found out Charles Manson meditated there for three days. And I was like, Oh, that scared me a little. So then I thought, okay, maybe I won't go meditate at the devil's hole. But so at night, when I went to sleep that night, I was having normal family dreams and then something suddenly just, I don't know if it was me or somebody else or related to the, Bufo Alvarius, but something came and just swiped my consciousness right out of my body, 
flying over the desert and around the mountains, through the mountains. And I saw the devil's hole and it just whooshed me right into the water at the bottom. And then it whooshed me just like when I did the toad venom, it whooshed me from dimension to dimension. This one whooshed me from cavern to cavern, deep caverns, full of, some full of water, some had a little water. Um, and then finally I stopped at this cavern, just like kind of when I stopped going through dimensions and met my ancestor, I stopped at the cavern and there was my ancestor, skinny as could be, curled up in a ball on the floor, white eyes, and I figured out he was blind, I think. So I looked to my right and there were two muscular, heavy Mayan men that were dressed identical, barely any clothes, but they were identical. I believe they were holding him captive. And so I, my consciousness had you know, imaginary arms and I swooped up my ancestor and had him stand up and I looked to my left and there was light shining down into the cave in the cavern and um, at the beam of light, there was plants coming out of the rock wall and water dripping. And so I just wanted to bring him there and I started to assist him to go there. And he continued on his own walking into the light and he vanished. And then I woke up that morning and felt like a big weight was just lifted off of my shoulders. And I believe a lot of good things have happened to me from doing this Bufo Alvarius. And I believe that it's, it is the outer world. It's helping me so much, not just that inner world that I visited, but, and I know what you mean about the light at the end, but the deaths were terrible at the beginning, but they were very interesting because I feel like each one has a meaning. Now I'm jumping around, but each one of those deaths do have a meaning. And the one that caught me the most was when I melted as if I were becoming liquid mercury and I melted into the earth because I did it under a tree. But I should probably stop. It's been a long time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here you go. Wow. Th thanks for sharing so much. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, extraordinary medicine. In fact, it's the next thing that Imperial are going to study. And I think that um, the Beckley Foundation um, have created a, like a nasal spray uh, of 5-MeO. So this is being studied in multiple clinics now. And for me, it's something that um, has incredible amounts of neuroplasticity uh, that results from it it just feels like a brand new reset when you take it it, it seems extremely um good for you and i think that if you if we can overcome uh the the sort of ontological shock of uh of, of becoming the light becoming the the godhead whatever you want to call it i think that these things could you know could be used as um yeah um, ways to even treat things like long covid that would be my hunch because long covid seems to be a lot of brain fog so uh yeah once a month uh, 5 meo as a, as a treatment could be an interesting study to do very cool um i i just have one more um thing that, you know for this conference i used at least initially um until we had our own float tank to have a really cool black and red um picture you know as the conference picture I was using that image that um, I was inspired by your video where you were describing your experience, um, you know, on the, the DMT X and um, having penetrated that um, DMT state so deeply, you, um, it, it sounded a lot like, you know, Plato's uh, myth of air at the end of the Republic, you know, um, it sounded like, like, like some kind of experience where you, you go through the underworld and, and, and in that story, right. Um, the hero, he, um, he sees the, the center point of his journey where all the, the different planets are connected to the earth through a, a, a beam of like rainbow light or white light, you know, and, um, and, and, and all the harmony of, of the planetary spheres and their, and their musical proportions are all like, like Pythagorean, you know, organized right there. And you can see the, the core axis, you know, of it all connecting that ultimate, um, point source of the light or not point source of the light, right. To, um, to the, the world of the, of the various bardos or whatever, right. The different spheres. So it just, it creates this, this imagery 
And I wonder, is that at all related to that key? I mean, is is the shape of the key significant, the, the look of it? Um, or do you think it's it's beyond that? It's not like an icon so much as as like an information um like a like a like a you know it has a program on it like a like a usb drive or <laughs> you know what do you what are your thoughts about that kind of thing so yeah just the um i think the image you're talking about is the the one from the book of knowledge the programming station of all is that the right. one you're referring to yeah, yeah. so I, that that i experienced as a as a, as a non-drug experience and just to fill in the the audience so oh, yeah. Yeah, this was a this is an experience I had um, without any substance at all. So it was a it was 1999. It was a New Year's Eve. That was that was the only sort of special thing around the context. And a lot of people were scared about Y2 bug. So all the machines, all the all the computers going wrong because of the uh, the, the time going into 2000. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a Friday afternoon. It was two o'clock. I hadn't ingested any medicines for at least a month. And uh, I suddenly walked into this room, went out of body, sort of straight, a sensation of going straight upwards and becoming a, a ginormous beam of light um, without any warning. I'm standing up and suddenly I'm uh, in this kind of massive energy beam and I'm uh, in a rotation movement. And uh, this disembodied voice uh, is saying, you're not Carl, you're having the experience of being Carl. And your soul is inhabiting eight other bodies. And suddenly I could see eight other spokes of light in this wheel of light. And, and, and the voice also then said, look up because you're, you're not just in a wheel of light, you're in a larger body of light. And before I could look up, my friend starts to call my, call my name from downstairs. And then it's like being poured back into my body. Um, and as I'm being poured back in, I'm being told two more things. There is no death and tell everybody. And then I came round and it was extraordinary because uh, because it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. I was 27, sat in return and all of that, but it was a real gift. Um, and then 10 years later, I, I was reading this book, uh, Programming Station, uh, sorry, the, the Book of Knowledge, uh, The Keys of Enoch, um, quite an extraordinary book. And in that book, there was this, this diagram, which... Uh, you're referring to which is the entitled the programming station of awe so whether this was a real place that i that i went to um but uh, you know it, it encouraged me to to explore dmt because I, I thought that might be that might be the explanation that it was an endogenous uh sort of hit of dmt that i was experiencing but my dmt journeys have been nothing like that experience and it's still a mystery and it's still one of the most profound uh gifts i've been given and again, I think that's why going back to the sort of the basis of the talk, it's not all about the medicines. I think it's all about what you're needing at specific times and 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 just being receptive um, to it and not be, you know, I, a lot of my friends are, are very materialist. And I think that, that excludes your ability to really have these experiences and, and be shifted in your in your in your path and to to really uh, keep your mind open for for all eventualities because i think that as i mentioned before it's a real um jackpot win to be in this human experience being able to manifest reality and a lot of us are just sitting there ex sort of netflix to death and not really exploring all the possible ranges of this incredible uh, machinery we have which is the human experience yeah uh, and one more question here. Um, my question is kind of um, um, inspired also by yeah the previous story we just heard um, of of an experience, and also you mentioning your um, sober experience, and also just this whole idea of what happens when you come back to the world, and apparently you are still uh, affected by it, or you are changed in some way that you can. Uh, um, have these experiences also afterwards so within this research that you participated in what are these parameters at what at what point do the researchers say here um here it ends with uh, uh, the input we get from the data because you report having still experiences way after you uh, are um, under the influence of DMT, right? And, and how far is this um, 
this aftermath integrated within the research? How can we um, incorporate this coming back to reality or this coming back to the world and nature and then what this uh, the, um, the changes that happen afterwards? Is this also part of aftercare, for example? Yeah, great question. I think the, the big problem with a lot of the psychedelic studies is the amount of money it costs to run them. It's not as if you can apply for grants from uh, the Horizon program for, for this kind of research. So it's a lot of it's done uh, with benefactors, uh, with patron, uh, patrons, um, you know, with specific individuals putting in a million pounds or whatever it is. So uh, I think that the integration support is, is something that suffers. And I know um, people that have worked inside the, the clinical setting that have become exasperated by the lack of um, integration uh, pr practice and this aftercare support. And they're just, I mean, to be fair to the, to the people running these studies, there just isn't the money uh, to, to, to create these integration channels. And um, one, one, one um, Rosalind Watts has created called ASA, which is very specifically looking at how, how these things can be integrated. And of course, you're right. I mean, reactivations, especially with 5-MeO-DMT, are common. And that's uh, always considered, especially by people like Rick Strassman, a big disadvantage to the medicine. I, I personally um, think that it's an advantage. I think that reactivations, it seems to me that these, and this is again to the core of my point, these substances are not homes. These things are not places where you should live their doorways and once the doorways opened it seems to open something in the brain in the body that then is activated and um then it's a new ability it's it's this trait this altered trait and i think that it's it's about the like coming back to the mystery school it's about how how well you can in, incorporate that with your emotional intelligence how well developed you are as a as a, as a being in order to be ready for such onslaughts of ontological design um that's why the, these these things uh you know need to be sort of ranked in terms of difficulty to integrate um i would say that 5meo is 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 up there because you you know you sort of have this experience of going to the light and then floating back down into your human experience it's almost as if you experience the cosmic joke in real time and and you get to be god and human at the same time and a lot of people struggle with that because it's so such a broad range in between. Um, but others uh, like myself, I thrive knowing uh, that and it, and it kills my fear of death. It doesn't mean I'm reckless. It means the opposite. It means I'm, I, I consider this realm much more sacred. As I said, I think that the human experience is, 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 is the envy of the cosmos, primarily because we get to manifest stuff. So most of the time you're in the void, I think, in the death state you are in the void and, and you don't get to manifest in the same way we get to manifest. So I think it's a very short window of time uh, to, to have these experiences and to get as much out of life as possible is, is my mantra. Yeah, thank you for that. Because personally, also um, for this ideal, for this project, ideal project, basically, hyperhumanism, I would say that uh, an emphasis on coming back from this uh, trip um, it would be really nice to explore more on this integrative process of how do we then go further? How do we then um, implement or apply whatever lessons we, we learn during this short trip and then to the trip of life, <laughs> apply it then, I guess. Yeah, thanks so much for this. I think it's so so important to focus on. And, you know, like I said, we shouldn't all just be chasing our these altered states and 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 in some sort of like bro culture, just trying to get as far and as as deep and as you know. It's all about what what is the practical application of this stuff. You know, are you, you know, are you really, um, you know, it's, it's same with me with it, it, sort of talking about hyperhumanism. And am I a hyperhumanist? Am I practicing what I preach? I think that that's that's the key thing, and 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 this is where you see integrity, and this is where the proof is in the pudding, and for me, it's all around, yeah, not just uh, not just theorizing all the time, but really embodying and living your research, and I think that's where I differ from a lot of my colleagues. I really 
I am the the lab that I do these experiments in, and and therefore I have some sort of authority. If you look at some of the the sort of the world leading DMT experts or ibogaine experts, they haven't done the medicine. How can you be an expert without without having done the the the, the work as such? Thank you. Let us thank Carl. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure. I, I really hate to to cut short, um, you know, discussion Q and A. Um, we're we're like running forty minutes behind. Um, but is on is Andres there, Andres? So, since we still have you, Carl. So Andres, Andres is not around. Do you want me to try and call him? I know it's early in California. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, here I'll I'll try. Here, here's another question for you, Carl. Yeah, sure. Hey Carl, I was uh, interested in your account of seeing wheels of light. I wonder whether you've done any research or any other research has been done connecting those kinds of visions with the tradition of Merkaba mysticism associated with Ezekiel's vision as uh, recounted in the Old Testament. Thank you for the question. I think that would be a, that would be an email chat because I'm not familiar with uh, with the, uh, the, the these terms and and uh, yeah, I mean, this was um, like I said, it was it was a real it was a real gift primarily because it was probably the most powerful of all experiences I've had, and uh, and still no explanation. So if you can help me try and uh, connect it with things that you know about, I would be very grateful for for an email chat. And and more to the point, um, it would be cool to to integrate um this stuff, especially the the deepest mystery school stuff with the laws of form context, you know. Um, I mean, so so like I was saying a moment ago, right? Like John Lilly was doing acid and 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 ketamine. We just saw a video where he he called himself a, a ketophile. <laughs> he loved his ketamine in the tank. Um, you know, but but DMT, it it um it, it's more like a rocket ship. I mean, so so Lily referred to the Spencer Brown operator, the marked state operator, as as something like a, a rocket ship, a vehicle that he rode, you know, from universe to universe or something like this. And as well, he had this um the Robert Edwards top quantities thing. I, I put a little bit on the website about it, but you know, it comes from the dyadic cyclone and it's very mysterious because the appendix to this dissertation is gone now. But you know, whatever um, vehicle, you know, Lily was using, we're, we're really curious about that here because, you know, coming from a place of, of having some familiarity with different um, techniques, you know, um, uh, practices um, and, and, and contextualization, uh, context, different contexts, right. For like um, appreciating how, you know, you need emotional maturity. You need like your yamas and your knee yamas straight before you can like have samadhi and, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So anyway, it's just it's just interesting to to bring in the the laws of form context in particular, especially because there's so much um now where that's well integrated in certain aspects of um you know philosophy of science and technology. And so anyway, we're we're like a big um integration uh think tank here with, with, with that topic in particular. But um, you know, bringing bringing it into the the DMT mystery school context. I think is, is very important stuff. There's, there's another question here. I'm going to try um, Andres by uh, telephone number now. I'm, so here's another question from Timothy Lyons. Hey, thanks for the great talk. Um, I, I haven't really put the question together too well, but you know, making making our lives longer so that we have greater capacity to, to have experience, you know, uh, longevity and even what we consume, you know, like your preparation for these experiments, it seems it seems like that could be like a key, you know, that we're the more efficient we make our consumption, almost like the Ouroboros, you know, the self eating. There's a in, in alchemy, there's a crown on the Ouroboros. I think that crown might represent awareness, awareness of how we're consuming ourselves and consuming our consciousness or an, an unconsciousness. So there, there is, um, Carl Jung uh, 
speculated that there was a metabolic toxin that caused madness to he called it dementia precox back in the early 1900s or something but there's so much metabolic disease and disorder now inflammatory uh, insulin resistance and all these health problems you know maybe these maybe some of these experiments can be directed towards kind of refining ideas of longevity and inflammation and autoimmunity you know both uh, psychologically and biologically and then we you know we have more space for this kind of alchemical vessel our body to to refine these incredible experiences kind of like the one you were talking about in the beam of light i think a little bit about the you, you mentioned uh, lucid dreaming dream yoga sleep yoga where you you ride past the the, the REM state of dreams into the deep sleep and the, the super parasympathetic uh, state of being where there's a lot of, you know, the most cell generation comes from the deepest sleep. But if you can maintain your awareness into the cycle of the deepest sleep, you're kind of, you're kind of nourishing the, the, that psychic awareness and, and you, you take back that experience into your consciousness so it's kind of a cycle of day and night something like that i don't know if this is making any sense but uh, longevity you know and and health and uh, maybe fighting disease even you know both physical and mental seems that's kind of where you're at yeah thanks for that i mean it's a fascinating question and uh, i think that the you know, as I mentioned, the DMT focus is consciousness. It's very much around, um, yeah, like we know that um, that these things create neuroplasticity. Um, whether they create longevity is a, is a, is a huge question. And um, I really love this idea of, of, you know, as you mentioned, this idea of awareness of how we are consuming our own consciousness What's fascinating about the DMT extended state is that you seem to remain intact in terms of your personality and, and that enables us to bring a lot more information back. We also know from doing this pilot, which is, um, you know, it, it is the first, it was the sort of the first real, there was the Germans that have done it like in the early nineties, but they didn't really report too much back from it. Um, so this is really the first time that we've able to, to prove that it's, we, the, the, it's, the, there's no real massive um the heart rate increases initially but then it stabilizes um and uh, yeah i'll be very interested to know about inflammation i don't know if you know about the dox series from shulgin um the doi um so there's dom there's dop doi out of that series um is one of the most anti-inflammatory substances on the planet um, so uh, we know with the psychedelics, they also have an anti-inflammatory index, just like our foods have an anti-inflammatory index. We know that certain substances are extremely uh, good in terms of, um, you know, removing inflammation. For me, I'm always, you know, whenever I'm partaking in any kind of medicine, I will also take the antidote with the medicine. And that antidote is 20 different anti-inflammatories. So I think, you know, in and in terms of the longevity question for me it's uh yeah how do we live an optimal life how do we thrive in the in the in the lifespan that we have and i think that lifespans are increasing i don't think we, we I, the transhumanist idea is to live forever um even ray kurzweil's now changed his mind about that i mean i did a back-to-back -back keynote with ray um, in Australia, and and he had a carrier bag of supplements. He was taking three hundred supplements a day, and I was like, "Where do you find the space to eat food uh, with those three hundred pills?" And uh, um, you know, I think that there are natural limits. I think that we we have to respect nature, and until we have fusion, um, you know, readily available, I think that we have to to understand that it's kind of rude to outlive your welcome in terms of planetary resources. Um, so that would be my take on that. But yeah, I think that we can, um, there are medicines that we can use, unlike, unlike the transhumanist idea of, of sort of living forever, we can change the way we perceive time and uh, slow time down to, to because obviously time is a construct. If we can slow time down ad infinitum, then that would give us this extra lifespan.
Thanks so much. Yeah, it seems like it's the, it's the paradox of being a pioneer, and and we're kind of kind of consuming ourselves, and and our experiments, you know, within our the alchemical vessel of our body or whatever it is, and we can't really predict where it's going, but we can we can kind of pull from some of the, the you know, the progression is different from the pharmaceutical industry that is given a lot of pills and they check them out for a year or so and then they send them on and we don't we you know then we find out later they give you dementia or something and and but this this sounds more intuitively promising and and uh well th thank you so much for the comments it's it's hopeful thank you and if if we may impose upon you to still be here for a moment while we're trying to contact andres um we have another question is is that okay you you, you yeah keep him keep keep him okay. coming I'm, I'm cool, cool, cool. I'm really grateful for Andres. Uh, I mean, I would love to see his talk, but if he, if he's not around, then I'm very happy to fill in. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, something just came to mind when you talked about your personality staying intact in an extended DMT state. My question, well, what I remembered was something from Heaven and Hell of Aldous Huxley's, where he fantasized about uh, retaining your quote unquote uh, rational ability for decision making in a psychedelic state um upon you know longer exposure to the dmt state do you feel like you retain uh any such you know ability for human again in quotation marks rational decision making and how much do you actually recall of these trips is it like the emotional impression left of a dream or is there detailed memory of them might be yeah thank you for the question i mean it, it seems to be i mean i think What's fascinating about DMT, um, especially the crystal DMT, is that it's so short. It is like this being shot out of a cannon, and and therefore you are literally very you're struggling to to maintain it. When you extend the duration, you seem to also extend your ability to to maintain the the journey. It also helps, of course, that we have these micro phenological interviews directly afterwards. What seems to be less of a priority is the visual. Uh, representation so being able to draw out what i'm experiencing in real time i'd love i'd love the opportunity to do that and uh and um yeah I, I think the it's not just being able to maintain um the memory it's also having precognition of the future that's astonishing and uh and and that came to pass you know it was validated because i then witnessed this six i mean it's a whole long story but I then witnessed something that then I was foretold in the DMT extended state uh, six months later. So I think that it's not just about maintaining your current state, but being uh, your, your awareness spreading um, through time. And, and for me, that's 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 an extraordinary. And it wasn't just me. There was other people. I highly encourage you to watch the, 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 the longer uh, panel discussion with Rick Strassman and Andrew Gallimore and uh, Hancock, because in there we're, we're in real time realizing oh my god we're all we're all having these abilities and uh and therefore you know we would you know we all we all we all said the same thing that we were able to maintain our, our personality one of the participants was even able to um you know claims able to you know carry on his normal normal sort of um uh, you know, it's a bit a bit of hyperbole because we all linked up to these uh you know to these machines but you know the ability you know if, if it does come to pass where people are spending longer and i believe there's been a more recent study that's happened where people were were sub submersed for maybe eight times longer it'd be very interesting to talk to those people i think we're trying to reach the the participants of that other study i think it happened in switzerland so yeah these things are, are, are becoming technologies and i think that um we uh, will see much more proof uh, much more um, anecdotal evidence and as Chris Timmerman says it's uh, it's very much around the 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 subjective experience this is something that's kind of been um, dismissed as uh, as important they, they focus on the you know the the brain activity as the primary activity but I think it co in combination with all of those uh, elements it's 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 so much about um, not just what happens to the person at the time, but also what then happens to them in the months to come. Thank you.
Okay, well, maybe it is time um, for us to take a break and then and then um, you know if if Andres comes on later, that would be good too. So we'll 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 work with that. But let us thank again, Carl. Leon Conrad is an independent academic, writer, playwright, poet, educationalist, storyteller, and polymath. He enjoys figuring out answers to questions we don't yet have answers to. He was invited to be post poet in residence at the first Edinburgh Food Festival in 2006. His books include Story and Structure, A Complete Guide, 2022. History Riddles, Odyssey, Dynamic Learning System, 2013. And Aesop the Storyteller, a book of versified fables, 2008. His plays, Aesop the Storyteller and Under the Arabian Moon were premiered at the Camden Fringe in July 2006 and at the London Bridge Theatre in 2009, respectively. Over a three-year period from 2013 to 2016, he provided a regular monthly column for the Russian in-flight magazine Flightline for Anglophone Russian travelers on the vagaries of the English language. Leon is acknowledged expert in the field of historic needlework. He was the first person in about 400 years to rediscover how the complex Elizabethan embroidery stitch known as the plated braid stitch was worked. A fully illustrated guide to working the stitch was published in the Historic Needlework Guild's magazine, Fine Lines, in July 2003. He has an MA degree in the history of design and material culture of the Renaissance, VNA RCA 2008, and a graduate degree in music, LTCL honors. An academ his academic articles, draft papers, and MA thesis on English 16th and 17th century woven and embroidered textile book bindings appear on our website at this link. Leon has contributed to radio and TV programs and published papers in specialist journals. He has written on voice-centered communication skills and coaching techniques for publications such as Training Journal. Can I just say that Leon was a student of Spencer Brown very closely. He worked with Spencer Brown. And Leon is a brilliant rhetorician. Or Retor, which do you, I never really figured. Okay, very good. And you will, you are about to see what Leon is all about. His talk is titled, The Story Structure of Reality and Eternal Form According to Laws of Form. Leon Conrad. Thank you. Thank you, Randy, for having me here. A big thank you to Akeem and the team at Western Hag for creating such a wonderful, warm, loving, intellectual space for this conference and the exhibition. Thank you to Nikolai for building the float tank and for creating such a wonderful, warm space around it. I would like to dedicate this talk to Francis Jeffries who wasn't able to be included in the conference, but is very much a part of John Lilly's experimentation with dolphins and with float tanks. And we hope to include a contribution from him in the proceedings of this conference. And thank you, Randy, particularly for going to such trouble to put this together as the 50th anniversary conference of the 1973 Esalen conference at which George Spencer Brown was at. Oh, yeah, which uh, he was at. Let me tell you a story. When I came to the decision to attend this conference, I knew it was going to be a decision I had to make in the spirit of the Esalen Conference of 1973. 
So I went online and to my family's modern sensibilities, surprised them and shocked them by saying I was going to couch surf. It seemed the right thing to do to get into the spirit of the times. I ended up staying with a wonderful guy called Rob, who is the owner of a restaurant with a wonderful name, which in, embodies the essence of his vegan cookery, and which I've asked you know, to pronounce for me. I recommend it. Farhana Glory. <laughs> Thank you. It is a play on words. It evokes the idea of faded glory and vegan glory. There is a reason I'm bringing Rob into the presentation, and I will come back to him later on. For now, let's go back to that 1973 conference, at which on the fourth day, Spencer Brown is ready to leave, but John Lilly stops him in his tracks and says, One more question. The Bible is eternity that you discuss it. What book are number one to only to play this game? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, he says. He says. Um, I have one last question. Okay. Um, in footnote number one of Only Two Can Play This Game, you identify five levels of eternity. Could you diagram them? And Spencer Brown goes on to diagram them. In a long description, in words, he outlines the five levels of eternity. Now, if you go to Only to Can Play the Game, which he published under the pseudonym of James Keyes, you'll find various ways in words of describing this. He refers to five levels. He refers to going through seven levels. He talks about ordinal, orders and um, numbers, looking at cardinal and ordinal ways of numbering things. It gets very confusing. But do read the primary source material. I'm not going to go through it here. What I do want to do is take you through the five levels in pictures and in story. I'm going to draw on Jack Engstrom's paper, Parsing to the Source, which is a brilliant outline of Spencer Brown's uh, visualization juxtaposing it against Arthur M. Young's work, showing how they work in parallel, and putting it against the backdrop of Dionysius the Areopagite, or the Pseudo-Areopagite's work, which Spencer Brown directly draws on. In Jack Engstrom's paper, you have a circle. And that encloses being. Wrong. Let me start again. You start off with being, the blank space. Seeing, being. Seeing, being. Seeing, being. In Spencer Brown's summary, you have five beings. Being, seeing, being, seeing, being, seeing, being, seeing, being. And coming out half blind the other side. Jack stops there. But in the text, he says you have to imagine two more circles. Seeing, being. And then what I'm going to leave unwritten is the unwritten cross. And if you count from the center level ought, as Spencer Brown describes it, not naught, but ought, you have one, two, three, four, five levels of being. and four levels of seeing. 
This is how Spencer Brown saw it. If you take away the outer circle, you have the essence of the Trinity, which Spencer Brown makes very explicit. And that links to the Pythagorean sense of four being the first number. Because how can you have the concept of a unit without a beginning, middle, and end? You cannot have a one without there being three distinct things that form a unity before you can even start counting. So that's the idea behind the visual. How does this work in story? Well, as Randy mentioned, I have written a big book about story and particularly looking at story structure. It's an application of Spencer Brown's methodology, the calculus of indication as outlined in all laws of form to the way in which story works. I'm interested in story because it's a manifestation of consciousness. It appears naturally. Stories have been told before, way before the written word. There are ways in which we organize information to make it memorable. They enable us to tie emotion to reason, reason to emotion, and pass information down memorably from generation to generation. Why not study how they work? I won't go into a big analysis of how I've applied the calculus, that's outlined in the book. But I, my definition of story is very wide. I include riddles, I include jokes, I include koans, I include poem structures. I include essays, I include mathematical proofs. And I came across a text which baffled me. It's a Chinese text. It comes from the um, Jingsheng. Let me hold the microphone down on the chair for a minute so I can find it. In ancient times, when heaven and earth did not yet exist, there was only image without form, dark, obscure, formless, soundless, unfathomable, profound. No one knows its gate. Two spirits merged into life to regulate heaven and organize earth, vast. No one knows how far they reach boundless. No one knows where they will stop and rest. From this, they divide into yin-yang, separate into eight poles, hard and soft, complete each other, and the 10,000 beings then take form. Coarse chi, making insects, subtle chi, making humans. Therefore, the vital spirits belong to heaven and the bony frame belongs to earth. The vital spirits re-enter the gate and the bony frame reverts to its root. How can I, in quotes, how can I continue to exist? What story structure does that follow? I was lucky enough to attend a lecture in London by a sinologist, Sandra Hill, who argued during the lecture that the Chinese five element system in the Wu Jing arrangement, which I'll show on the board in a minute, is fundamental to traditional Chinese thinking. Now she hadn't applied that to Chinese literature but if her theory was true, it must apply. And that's what I set out to investigate. In the system, 
you have yin yang in balance at the center. I'm only going to draw this once, and in future, if I redraw it, I will use the sign of recursion. So that's Earth. You have wood to the east. You have fire to the south. They put south at the top of the diagram. You have metal to the west, and you have water to the north at the bottom of the diagram. In this arrangement, Earth is the balancing center. And there's a flow that emerges from the center and goes round and round the cycle. It follows the seasons. So you get spring, Summer, autumn or fall, and winter. And there are some associated um, themes which are actually referred to in the text in the abbreviated form. And you can go through it with me. In the beginning, there was a formless void. And then two spirits merged into life, just as a new plant emerges from the seed as a shoot in the spring. From this, they divide into yin-yang, just as a plant divides into a part which grows above the earth and a part which grows below the earth in summer. They separate into eight poles, just as in autumn, fruit separates from the tree. Hard and soft complete each other, and the 10,000 beings then take form. The completion is something that happens in winter, where the seed returns to the ground, water finds its level, and form is allowed to start to take place regenerating, we're back at the center in order for a new cycle to flow. So you have these themes going through and around this thing, and you can trace these themes, these patterns, throughout many traditional Chinese texts and stories. It's not just um, limited to, uh, to China, you can find it in Japan, in the Far East, and what I found is this natural flowing thing governs the flow of story. Let me come back to Rob. I knew Rob was a chef, so I brought him one of my favorite recipes. It's some Moroccan salad, which involves oranges, olives, with a dressing of lemon juice and olive oil. And I was at his place prepping this talk, and suddenly I remembered a rhyme. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey? When I grow rich, say the bells of Shoreditch. When will that be, say the bells of Stepney? I do not know, says the great bell of Bow. And you know what? The rhyme fits the Chinese circular structure perfectly. You have oranges and lemons, that's the theme that introduces the rhyme. That's where the whole story emerges. You have the problem. There's an internal division, a need 
for the debt to be repaid. And we don't know when it is. When will you pay me? When I grow rich. There's a separation between the present state of poverty and the envisaged future state of richness. When will that be? So there's a parallelism between when and when here. When will that be also contains the idea of longing, of return, under the center, we're in the cloud of unknowing. The origin and the return, the point of origin, the point of return. That's just one example of how a very simple traditional rhyme, which has been sung by children, adults, folklore, enthusiasts for tens if not hundreds of years emerges naturally following this very very primal structure which also governs spencer brown's levels of eternity how so between these elements, cardinal points, principles, seasons, you have gates. If you remember, on the first day, we had to talk about Nishida and Nishida's gates. They allow movement forward, backward, but they're just gates. And the gates allow passage between the elements, but the energy that takes us from one element to another is fueled by earth at the center so we have being seeing as an emergent act being seeing as a divided experience Seeing as a separation seeing as a return to the source, which allows, in Spencer Brown's work, time to start flowing. It allows number to appear. Emergence, division, separation, return to the origin. It's amazing to me that this arrangement with these symbolisms can be found at work underneath not just traditional texts but all stories and i've argued how that is possible in the book but it also adds something adds a level of understanding to the dynamism behind spencer brown's way of seeing eternity give birth to time through five levels of eternity how are we doing for time I would rather have stop there and take questions because the next thing from this is how story structure can expand from some very basic elements and how there's a particular structure called the call and response structure that actually maps to this, which I found by mapping what happens in stories shows that there is an intuited connection between abstract and concrete, between metaphysical and physical. And we see it in stories like um, Beowulf, where the supernatural beings come out in response to an excessive act in the natural world 
at the beginning of um, Beowulf, Hrothgar builds this great big mead hall. And it's so extravagant, it's so big, it almost stretches up so high it can touch heaven. That is an excessively good act, which in story brings forth a demonic force. And that demonic force doesn't appear straight away. It emerges because there's a sense of doubt. What's this strange noise? What are these horrible songs about God and paradise disturbing my peace? Grendel wonders. And he comes out of his marsh and he covers the mead hall with a fog that puts everyone inside it to sleep. And he looks around. Ah, these are the people who are to blame. And he comes away and there's carnage. It follows a process of, um, well, you could say it follows the dubito ergo cogito ergo sum pattern. You could say it follows a sense of veni, vidi, viki. I came because I heard a rumor. I saw with my own eyes and I acted and as a result conquered. And things change. They're never the same as they were before. But usually in this story structure, there's a change which is in itself something that leads to a state of a new state of excess. And that follows this thing. I won't go more into it, but it is described in the book. Over to you, Randy. Can you use that mic. All right, we have time for questions. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a question about the emergence of the structure itself. Mm -hmm. um, because if I listen to this um, Chinese poem or myth um, in which this earth um, that you've symbolized emerges, uh, you, you said that it came out of a, a formless void. And then somehow in this formless void, there's still two entities. So yeah, I think I, I hear this problem quite often um, um, in, um, in my philosophical studies that uh, there's this uh, sort of um, superstructure, but somehow because the origin of the structure is not um, adequately explained or thought through, it still is something that's external from us to some extent. Um, well, there is no us. And Spencer Brown is quite clear um, on that. We have to use words to describe something which essentially cannot be described in, in words. There is, it comes about, there is no about, because about mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet. There's no other way of doing it without using language that negates itself. And that's the paradox, that's the beauty of it. Right. Um, maybe, um... What I would then say instead of us is a concrete, because you were talking about this dynamic between the uh, metaphysical and the abstract and the concrete. Um, maybe I could um, ask the same question, but then with that instead of us. So um, how could we uh, understand or experience um, the emergence of this uh, superstructure in relation to our concrete experience? That's a very, very, very good question. Let me give you an example from story, and then I'll give you an example from real life. In story, think of when the fairy godmother appears to Cinderella. She's at her lowest ebb. She's wanted to go to the ball. She's prepared the dress, and her stepmother and stepsisters have torn it to pieces. She's down in the ashes, in tears. That's it. Her life's dream has been shattered and that is when this supernatural being the fairy godmother comes in and grants the wish the wish is granted for a limited time she can go and see the prince but then it comes to an end and you know the rest of the story real life There was a similar 
anecdote told today. I can't remember what it is, but it remind me, reminded me of the story of a colleague of mine who went on a mountain climbing uh, expedition, fell down into a ravine, and the fall was such that it could have killed him. But something took over. Something that was an embodied higher intelligence. And he listened to that instruction to soften himself, not to resist, but just to fall softly. And that saved his life. It's those moments in real life where something takes over that is beyond rationality, beyond our normal, logical, problem-solving way of things, that I think we need to be more attentive to. They're there in story, in symbolic form. They're there in our experience. How can we be attentive to them? The flotation tank might be one way of doing it. The experimental medicines or drugs are another. Breath work is another. There are voice work is another. There are many ways of doing it. I think all these are gateways that lead to a greater, easier connection to the center. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all the hands went up at the same time. I think maybe you were first. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um... I was wondering how you did your selection for your start in your book, and uh, do you also analyze the pattern in uh, some sort of like a way of uh, identifying archetypal patterns? Like for instance, the archetype of the the hero's journey. I know that it has uh, like specific um, stages that you find in all like a lot of common stories. So. I was curious about this, these two. Uh, okay, so two questions. One, how did I come to select the stories I used as examples? Two, how does it relate to the hero's journey? Yes? Archetypal, Archetypal patterns. patterns. In, in 20 seconds. Answer to question one, I chose stories that spoke to me, that I had a connection with. Answer number two, uh, I deal with archetypal patterns of ebb and flow of energy. And that is where Spencer Brown's calculus of indication has an advantage over every other system that has been used to track story to date. It just allows you to mark the shapes of the patterns of energetic flow that underpin the thematic content. It's really powerful, and I've applied it to explain why we have poetic forms like sonnets, landes, haikus, limericks, and that is new work. It explains the reason they exist. Okay, let, let's do, um, uh, I think we can do them all if you guys want to put all your hands up, but we, we have to do it all in the space of about two minutes. Okay, that means that... You know, raise your hands again, all those people. Okay, yeah, um, 15 seconds question, 15 seconds response, but it'll be a game. Okay, let's try. Um, the thing I always struggled with when I was trying to put together like story structures and uh, laws of form, the mark of distinction, is that I feel like the mark of distinction tries to go above or beyond sequence. And I feel like with story, I don't, even the structures that you're laying out now, they sound very sequential to me. Could you say something about the relation between sequence and marks, mark of distinction? I use the mark of distinction to identify a character at the starting point of a story. I distinguish between story structure, which is the sequence of key events bare bones events that happens in chronological order in a single character's storyline from beginning to end of the story. But that is what happens in the story. It's not necessarily how you need to tell the story. That's plot patterning. You can have flashbacks, you can have suspense, you can have surprise. As long as you have the elements there, you can tell it 
in many, many ways. Um, yeah, I'm interested. Mine's kind of a yes or no question. Uh, whether you ever unconsciously followed any of these archetypal story structures before learning of their existence while looking over old notes of yours or old stories of your own? Uh, I recognize structures like the quest structure in every problem I've ever solved. Lose my keys, it's a problem. I go on a journey to try to find them. Um, either my memory or my powers of observation are my friends and helpers. They help me solve the problem of not having my keys. Therefore, I can leave the house, lock the door and go on my journey. Hi, also a yes or no question. Um, going back to the very first, um, I wanted to ask if, because the cycle does have a definitive beginning in this void with the two figures, does it also have a definitive end, even though it's infinite cyclically? Because all stories, right, follow the cycle that you're describing, but all stories eventually end with the end. Yes, but I don't think all stories end with the end. For me, coming from an oral tradition bias, stories typically end, and they lived happily ever after. Oh, yeah. So I use the sign of recursion to indicate the opening and the closing of a story, which frame the beginning and the end. Okay, cool. Thank you. I think there was maybe another hand, right? If there isn't, I'd like to add just one thing here, Randy, which is the traditional digraphs. You've got rising yang for spring, You've got flourishing yang for summer. You've got rising yin for autumn. And you've got flourishing yin for winter. Now, if you respect the Chinese lower upper patterning and you substitute the mark for the single line and the mark over mark for the double line, you will find that there is a pa um, yeah there is a patterning that indicates equivalence at the top and bottom. They're both unmarked states, but this is a double unmarked. This is a single unmarked, and this has a mark underneath a mark over mark. This has a mark over mark underneath a mark. These reduce to marked states. These reduce to unmarked states. So you have this flip-flop, and George Spencer Brown refers quite rightly to flippity. This is a version of flippity. And this is how it works. There is a qualitative difference between the two marks and the two mark over marks in this schema. You can map the dynamic flow of the story structure using these symbols dynamically. I've chosen to use some other graphically more intuitive symbols for this structure, which you can find in the book. Okay. <laughs> Lou. You may also be able to map this using a fourfold marking operator like the one that Art and I work with. Where, yes, and you where, do it for fourfold the, logic. Uh, where the, mar the new operator, when you do it twice, becomes the mark. And then you have a fourfold, and it corresponds to the imaginary value. Yes, thank you for bringing that in. That is a very valid point. Imaginary logic also comes under this. And then uh, the, the gentleman with the pocket calculator. Could could you comment on <clears throat> on the I Ching and the and the hexagrams and this and the kind of circularity here? And how you know how it goes from possibly I guess it goes from four to six or the trigrams that build the, the, the hexagram. Yeah, well there are eight trigrams that fit around and <clears throat> the other four fit in the yeah. Um, in the blank areas, but they're based on yin and yang. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so one, but, but two, the, the, three um, again. 
So the six lines. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. It's it's, it's all it, a play it, of three does, does it does a does a uh, hexagon fit through that? You know, on the on the arrangement. Mm. That it's basically one going into two, going into three, going into the ten thousand things yet again. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's thank Leon. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to roll right into Lou's presentation. And then just a general comment to everyone um, so they know where we're at. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have we'll have Lou uh, 40 minutes, you know, and, and then we will um, take a five minute break. And then we will have our final speaker, who is also our final keynote, Eon's talk. Okay. And then that'll be it. So hold the tears for now. And Lou, and you want to get help them? Um, they'll help you get all set up and I'll introduce you. And while they're setting up, um, I just want to thank Leon again. Um, it's very interesting how, you know, you, your exposition of the five levels of eternity um, is, um, it's, it's different. It's not what I was expecting, but, you know, it's, you know, the same thing. It's just, th there's like a few different ways to, to go into it, a few different ways to describe it, right? Um, it's very cool. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, and interestingly, with Kitaro Nishida, who you brought up, the gates, you know, connecting it to earlier presentations here, um, Nishida has these graphs. Um, forgive my yeah. lack of Japanese pronunciation, but I believe it's called um, Zushiteki Zetsumi, the schematic explanation. He has our circle diagram looks basically the same the diagram of the infinite sphere. But then um, later on, he also does it in series. So there's like, you know, anyway, it's pretty cool because James Guy does that as well. So it's interesting to think of it um, in, in the like circle around going around series. So anyway, I just wanted to connect a few of those dots. So up next, our speaker is Luke Hoffman. And I will introduce you as you know, <laughs> And then I will give your title and give it to you, okay? And then and then twenty five minutes of talking. I'll and then I'll I'll say <clears throat> five minutes, and then and then we'll have five ten minutes of chatter. Lou Kaufman is a professor of mathematics emeritus at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He was born in Potsdam, New York, at uh, two three forty five, and grew up in Norfolk, New York. He graduated valedictorian from the Norwood Norfolk High School in 1962, obtained a BS in mathematics from MIT in 1966, obtained a PhD in mathematics from Princeton University in 1972. He began teaching at the University of Illinois in Chicago at in 1971 and retired from UIC in 2017. He has had numerous visiting positions around the world. Kaufman is founding editor and editor-in-chief of the World Scientific Journal of Knot Theory and its Ramifications, and editor of the World Scientific Book Series on Knots and Everything. His research is devoted to topology and the theory of knots, where he has discovered new connections between knot theory and statistical mechanics, new invariants of knots and links and new extensions of the field of knot theory. His works on the concepts of form and distinction, reference and self-reference and their relations with cybernetics and, the hum and with human thought. 
are extensive. Kaufman is the recipient of the Warren McCulloch Award and the Norbert Wiener Medal of the American Society for Cybernetics, Lester Ford and Paul Halmos Writing Awards from the Mathematics Society of America, served as Polia Lecturer for the Mathematical Society of America, and he is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. And today, Lou's talk is Laws of Form and the Cheshire Cat. Does this work? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I would like to issue all of the thank yous that Leon already issued at the beginning of his talk. Consider them repeated, I hope. Um, this has been a great conference. Um, I'm going to talk about laws of form um, and the Cheshire Cat, as you see. And uh, what this, the purpose of this um, talk is to, is to actually talk about the mathematical context of laws of form uh, you'll see and and um and to look at it historically so at the beginning we're going to be talking about mathematics as though laws of form didn't exist and then i want to show you how with the help of the cheshire cat we can see how someone might have discovered the calculus of indications how it could come about how it could get revealed the way the uh, it gets discovered by way of the Cheshire Cat may be related to the way Spencer Brown found it, or maybe not. Um, I'll leave you to be the judge of that. But I should introduce you to the Cheshire Cat. The Cheshire Cat, a fictional character, a cat notable for its broad grin and its ability to disappear and reappear at will in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll, the phrase grin like a Cheshire cat predates Carol's story, and although experts have guessed at its meaning, its origin remains mysterious. The Cheshire cat is a member of the Duchess's household. When it appears before Alice, it assures her that everyone in Wonderland is mad, and it doesn't much matter which path she follows if she doesn't care where she is going. The cat's ability to vanish slowly by sections disconcerts Alice, who at one point finds herself in the presence of only the cat's grin. So the themes, as I said, are mathematical, and the themes are distinction and simplification and disappearance. And I want to begin with some mathematical tales with the hope that you will find it interesting to look at these mathematical tales for their own sake um in the way one might if one was doing some math problems so i'm looking at this pattern here which as you see is a five by five square that's what you see a five by five square what else do you see well oh i'm i it was a rhetorical question but someone started to answer what was it you started to say somewhere large numbers Odd numbers, yes, you do. You see one, you see three, you see five, you see seven, and you see nine, blocked out by the mark. But this wasn't intended to be a Spencer Brown mark, but indeed it is a mark of distinction. And in those troughs are odd numbers. And that's what was on the next slide. So on the one hand, you see 25, and on the other hand, you see that 25 is written as 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 11. So another thing you could have said, and I'm taking the words out of your mouth, is that they're consecutive odd numbers, right? First we got 1, then we got 3, then we got the next odd number, 5, the next one, and the next one. And so the sum of the first five consecutive odd numbers is equal to 5 squared. And there's nothing special about 5. So we've um, bumped into a theorem in mathematics, a nice theorem, a simple theorem. The theorem is, how would you phrase it? You don't have to answer, but think in your mind, how would you phrase it? Well, the sum of the first n odd numbers is the square of n. So for example, you now know that nine squared is one plus three plus five plus seven plus 11 plus 13 plus 15 plus 17 plus 19, the first nine odd numbers. 
So you've come upon, I, I'm sorry. Did I, are, are you pointing out a typo of mine or, or, ah, oh, I forgot nine. Thank you. Okay. Yes, okay sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, all right. I'm, I'm not enough. very good at writing consecutive odd numbers. Thank you. Um, good. Um, so you you now know an eternal mathematical, uh, an infinite number of eternal mathematical truths, right? Um, do you? Um, well, yes, you do, if you think about it, because it really didn't matter the size of that square. The same thing happens. So of course, you may want to introspect on that a little bit. You can think to yourself, well, how do I know those things are odd numbers? But you can s convince yourself of that. It's a proof. So that's an example. Um, and it's a nice simplification. It's a nice simplification. If I were to prove this by some other method, it would be more complicated. So I'm concerned with simple ways to see things or geometrical ways to th see things if I can. Um, sometimes a simplification occurs by iconic diagrams. An example is consider the Venn diagram for the syllogism, all A or B, all B or C, and therefore all A or C. Maybe you're used to doing it this way, maybe you're not, but let's uh, let's see. I can take this out of its folder and move it around. Maybe. All right, that's easy. Is it still broadcasting? Yeah. Um, so if you draw a Venn diagram, then what you have indicated are are all of the different possible states of affairs. The state of affairs where someone is in, there is someone in A, but not in B and not in C. Or there is someone in A and B and C. All the different possible states of affairs are in front of you. And then you can take the propositions involved, for example, all A or B. If all A or B, then the compartments in A that are not inside B have to be empty. And I've written a zero or an empty sign for them. And I've taken the other proposition, all B or C, and that says that the compartments in B that are not in C must also be empty. And so I have two red uh, mark, two black marks that say A's uh, that, are, that come from the first proposition and two red marks that come from the second proposition. And the only compartment left in A is in fact also in C. So if there are any A's, they must be in C, right? So you can, um, you can convince yourself of the truth or find the consequence of some propositions by writing down the states of affairs in a Venn diagram. Um, now this was, something that Venn and Lewis Carroll also um, promoted um, in the 1800s. Um, and um, they were promoting it in relation to the fact that people were beginning to develop symbolic logic. Carroll developed his own symbolic logic. Boole developed a very good symbolic logic. But, um, but the Venn point of view or the Carroll point of view is to take the states of affairs and put them down and then see what happens. And this is outside of using, um, using any algebra, but involves some hand scratching, as you see. So for example, let's do one more just for fun. By the way, it's, uh, we're not going to go into the complexities of this. It's just for the sake of seeing how you can operate by using distinctions succinctly. And the distinctions involved here are the distinctions of being in A or being in B or being in C or the different possible compartmentalizations. So here I have some A or B and some B or C and I wanna see what I can conclude from that. Well, I'm going to use uh, a device due to Carol. I, I have a little sitting on a fence uh, entity which I've written in red here. The sitting on a fence between the compartments labeled X and Y means that one of them is occupied or both of them are occupied. Somebody's there, but I don't know whether it's over in X or over in Y or maybe both, okay? 
So that tells me that sum A or B, because it says that some of the overlap between A and B is occupied, and some of the overlap between B and C is occupied. And then you can look at some examples, and here's an example. That guy, that triangle over there is occupied, and that other triangle is occupied, but the total intersection of A, B, and C, just not occupied. So that satisfies the sum and the sum, but it doesn't satisfy that there are any A's that, there are, that are C's. No A's are C's. So you can't conclude from that that some A or C. Well, you see what I mean. Um, if, it's, if it's just elementary syllogistic reasoning, you can get as far as you like by just drawing pictures of three distinctions and how they interact with one another. You don't need symbolic logic. You don't need Boole. Um, you only need this much. Um, we somehow neglect to teach that and, um, and so confuse everyone. Of course, it's possible that I confused you with this, but I hope not. Um, I'm not teaching this for the rest of the thing. But, um, but it's a good example of using distinctions succinctly in a standard mathematical situation. So if you're interested in following up the structure of this, you can. But then there was Boole, and we're, we're walking through some history in the 1800s. So Boole had this great idea. His idea was that he'd use algebra to represent logic. So that would mean that true could be represented by the number one and false could be represented by the number zero. And then plus could represent or. And then you would have an arithmetic. True or true is true. So you'd have one plus one is equal to one. A funny kind of arithmetic. And you'd have negation in there. So bar, bar of zero is one and bar of one is zero. And that's the Boolean algebra. And you can represent lots and lots of logical situations using the Boolean algebra. And this is what's predating laws of form. That's why I bring it in. The Boolean arithmetic, a la Boole, consists in adding zeros and ones with this funny rule, one plus one is one. And zero times zero is zero. That part looks like ordinary arithmetic. You have multiplication and you have addition. Multiplication means and, addition means or. And, um, and you can write out logical things in these terms. You can even write implication if you want to, but I think I'll avoid it. Um, and now I'm going to do a time jump to another example. This time jump is around the, in the 1920s. Claude Shannon, in his master's thesis, which was entitled Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits, I think, um, he had this great idea. It's, re it's a real advance and extremely simple. Um, he had the idea that he could represent switching circuits logically by uh, using Boolean algebra. You see what I mean here? Here you have the possibility of going from the left to the right by going through A or by going through B if it was open. A and B could be either open or closed, like I wrote here. Zero is open, one is closed. You can go along one pathway or the other. So this is or, the parallel connection. The series connection is and. They both have to be closed in order to get through from left to right. So he understood that connection between the Boolean algebra, the logic, and the properties of switching circuits. And that meant that if you wanted to design a network that had a certain property, you could just write down its logical property and then write down the corresponding circuit and you'd have your design automatically. And this became the basis of almost everything that goes on with computers in some sense. So for example, if I wanted to control a light with two switches, then I have switches A and B. And if the switches are both in the, in the, in the up position, then that's good, the light will be on. But if I put one in the up position and the other in the down position, the light should be off. They have to both go into the down position to turn the light back on. So I have A, B, or not A and not B. And that's the circuit that corresponds to that. So you see what I mean. Um, that's an example of an advance. 
it's not quite the same kind of an advance that we're about to see. But I have one more bit of history before I talk about laws of form. And this bit of history is um, may excite your imagination in a different way if you haven't ever thought about it. Um, this is Cantor's transfinite numbers. They've come up here before in, in the discussions here. And um, you have to read this slowly from left to right and get a feel for it. So we're just going to start with the ordinary numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And then I'm going to make another mark at the end of all of that, as though I could jump all the way past all the numbers and put a new mark down, omega. That's Cantor's idea. That's, that's marking the next infinite point. But it's really just a mark. It's a mark that says, OK, we went through all of this infinity, and now we put down a mark. Now I can add one to that, omega plus one, omega plus two, and go slowly up, up forever, and put another mark down at the end of that, which will be omega plus omega, which will be two omega. And I'm going to keep on doing that forever. So I get two omega, eventually I get three omega, eventually I get four omega, eventually I get omega squared, eventually I get omega cubed, omega to the omega, and it goes on and on forever. Um, and it even hits somebody self-referential after a while, because after a while I get to somebody which could be named omega raised to the omega, raised to the omega, raised to the omega, and so on forever. And it goes on beyond that as well, but I'll stop there with that one. And that one is self-referential in that if I called it epsilon naught, as the logicians do, then you see that the exponent is epsilon naught. So epsilon naught is equal to omega to the epsilon naught. Those are Cantor's transfinite numbers. Um, and, um, and that was a, a, an enormous imaginative leap by Cantor um, back in the 1800s. Um, and these ordinals, this hierarchy of, of, of infinite markings are well ordered. They have the remarkable property that if you went up in there anywhere and you started going down, you would find that you're going to take a leap down each time. All, each time you go down a little bit more, um, it'll be finite. You'll go down in a finite number of steps, even though you're way out there at infinity. How does that work? Suppose you're at a mega plus three and you want to go down. Well, you can go to omega plus two. You can go to omega plus one. You can go to omega. But when you hit omega and you want to go down, what are you going to do? You have to drop down to some finite number, like 23. And then you have a finite number of numbers to go through, and you end up down. So, you, so even though there was an infinity between one and omega, when you went down, you dropped into one of them, and then you kept on going down. And if you think about it, draw this up for yourself or imagine it in your mind, you see that even though it goes up infinitely, 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 and it, and it keeps on going and going and going, if you start dropping down, it's a finite process. So this, this ended up, this is, this is a vision of Cantor's, which I think everybody should, should see at least once in their life and think about a bit. Um, I won't mention the next line. So now I want to talk about something that looks much simpler. We've already skipped across a lot of history. But now consider a distinction that's represented by a boundary. And, and there's an inside and there's an outside. And I'm going to talk like that classical mathematics, which does consider distinctions and would label a distinction. So it would label the inside I, and it would label the outside O. And we might even consider going back and forth across that boundary and deciding on a symbol for transforming from one side of the boundary to the other. So notice, you, you don't have to remember anything I set up to this point. Just this. I'm going, so I have a symbol, cross, and cross from inside is equal to outside and cross from outside is equal to inside. So that's where we are. We're considering a distinction where it has an inside and an outside. 
and crossing from the inside yields the outside, and crossing from the outside yields the inside. And I've written it down. So I've made a very small mathematics out of it. Cross over I is equal to O, and cross over O is equal to I. And even this, simple as it is, could be made a little simpler. And here's, here's one way to make it simpler. I could eliminate the I. I could eliminate the name for the inside. And now I want you to look at this. You see, I've eliminated the name for the inside. So I recognize the inside by looking around and finding out that there is no mark there. There's no name. There's nothing. It's an empty room. The outside has some label on it that tells me you're outside the building. But inside, an empty room. And then our equations change. You crossed from the outside and you ended up in the emptiness. You crossed from the inside, well, I erased it. So you crossed from emptiness and you ended up at the outside. And then my other equations were naming equations. If I repeat the name of the outside, it's still the outside. If I repeat the name of the inside, it's still the inside. And so what happened there was that the repetition of the name of the outside is still the outside. And the other one says nothing equals nothing, which we can't dispute. So this is considerably simpler. And furthermore, it can be made even simpler because if you look at the second equation over there, it says cross, the, the, the symbol for the transformation, can be identified with the name of the outside. So this one says I could forget about the name of the outside entirely and just write cross. And cross now stands for a name and it stands for a transformation. And you can read it either way. If you write cross, you can think of it as a name, a mark. But you can also write cross and say it says cross from the emptiness. And if you cross from the emptiness, you end up in the outside. You end up at the mark. So that's the transition. And did I go backwards? And so we find, sorry, that's the transition. And so we, this is where we ended up. Cross from the outside is the unmarked. And the outside called twice is equal to the outside. And we ended up in Spencer Brown's initials. So those initials come from, you can think of them as coming from simplifying the classical idea of going back and forth across a boundary with names. If you eliminate one of the names and look at what happened, you find that you're at the calculus of indications. So that that's one way of thinking about how you got to the Cheshire Cat string. And then there's a lot to say because this is some kind of turn. Um, it's actually an enormous turn. In my opinion, it's a bigger turn than those revolutions of Cantor or, um, or, or Shannon. But the ones that happened by Cantor, well, Cantor, maybe I shouldn't dispute Cantor, but Shannon is an example of an external revolution of connecting something with something else that really makes for a, a lot of uh, very interesting things to happen. Here we're connecting with nothing. And so the, the, the sense of it is different. And what's happened is that a symbol, which was only a transformation symbol, has turned into a symbol with two meanings. It can be regarded as a name or a value, or it can be regarded as a transformation. And equally and quite, quite nicely fits into both and works together that way in the calculus of indications. So 
So these are the initials of the calculus of indications of Spencer Brown brought to you by the Cheshire Cat and the elimination of by. Um, and the mark is the name of the outside and the inside is unmarked. The mark indicates the value of crossing from the state indicated on its inside. Crossing from the marked state yields the unmarked state. The mark makes a distinction in its own indicational space. The mark refers to any first distinction, including itself. The mark is self-referential. So a lot happened in this letting go. The, the mark, instead of just being a transformation symbol, is actually itself making a distinction for you as you look at it. And so we arrive at this language, which this very simple language, which is only generated by the one symbol and maybe some auxiliary equal signs and things. And that symbol stands for a distinction, any distinction, and it itself is a distinction, and so refers to itself. And you are in the position of looking at uh, the semantics of it, the meaning of it. You stand here looking at that mark and give the mark the meaning of it makes a distinction, it stands for a distinction, and you have to bring the other participant in this seminar into view, you have a strange loop. You have a Hofstetter strange loop. The strange loop being you, your perception or, or apperception, or your understanding of the relationship of yourself with the mark. So Spencer Brown's calculus is inherently self-referential. The mark stands for a distinction, can be seen to stand for the distinction made by the mark itself. The mark is a sign for itself in the sense of first. And now I wanna just do a little tiny bit in the two minutes left of this part. Um, we can go back to Cantor and we can take a, a little notational play and write omega raised to the eighth power as a cross. And then we can rewrite Cantor's transfinites. Let's try it. One will be the mark, two will be two marks, three will be three marks, four will be four marks. And this will go on forever. And I mark going beyond all of them by writing two marks over one another. I'm not using the initials. Then I could have two marks and a mark. I could have omega to the omega, that would be three marks. I could have omega to the two omega, that would be that guy. I could have some crazy complicated thing like this, which is written in ordinary mathematics, ordinary mathematics on the left, powers of things, exponents. And then if you look over here, you see that I've written the same thing in Mark language. Um, and what about epsilon naught, which was the first self-referential thing that Cantor made? Oh, it's just the re-entering mark. You see, epsilon naught is omega to the epsilon naught is cross over epsilon naught. It's the mark that re-enters itself. So we can line up, uh, once we went through this sort of turn around, we can line up Cantor with the laws of form. We can line up Cantor with all of the expressions in laws of form. And the curious thing is that, that they're all finite. They're all finite expressions, but, but they become interpreted as transfinite numbers. And then you can list all of the expressions in laws of form going all the way on up into up to epsilon naught by just listing them that way so that um, you have a translation that goes back and forth. This is just another one. Some funny looking uh, flower of exponent thing it gets translated directly into an expression in laws of form, and the epsilon is the re-entering mark. The fragment of Cantor's ordinals up to epsilon naught corresponds to all the finite expressions in laws of form. And this actually has interesting implications for ordinary arithmetic, which is sitting down there in the bottom, just those expressions. But I won't tell you more stories about that. Um, I'll just go into the end. A distinction fitting into itself recognizes that what it is is identical with what it is not. And so the distinction disappears. And these are the two 
first pages of Laws of Form, or this is the first page of Laws of Form. Jerry um, showed you these earlier. It's worth ending with this. Chapter one, the form. We take as given the idea of distinction and the idea of indication, and that we cannot make an indication without drawing a distinction. We take therefore the form of distinction for the form. But reflect on that in relation to this semi-historical story. And it's very interesting to think about it because you start in mathematics, which is full of making distinctions and you fall through the Cheshire cat into this place where the operator and the operand come together and the void is there or not there. And the whole thing coheres in a different way. And it gets turned around and by Spencer Brown gets turned around into this gorgeous language, which ends this way at the end of the book. An observer, since he distinguishes the space he occupies, is also a mark. We see now that the first distinction, the mark and the observer are not only interchangeable, but in the form identical. That that ran over the five minutes, but we still have time for questions. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, and I'll remind folks at home to ask questions. <clears throat> Leon. A distinguished distinctive presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, very good. Okay. All right. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, he, um, Leon saying, um, go back a slide, if you will. The observer distinguishes the space yeah. he occupies. Yes, yes. And you distinguish. And so there's the pun. Yes. There's the pun. Yes. <laughs> well, I really appreciate that because, um, I mean, your whole presentation, because I was not intimidated. <laughs> I mean that I followed and and that's terrific because I feel like I represent the um the mathematically um naive person actually. <laughs> so I, I feel like I thank you yeah, for you, making you, it clear. You you understand that I I wasn't asking you to grasp a whole lot of mathematics right. actually. I just yeah, wanted yeah. to put it into the context. And also I I was pushing the Cantorian thing, because it, it really strikes the imagination. Yeah. I used to wonder how the heck could that go on forever? And I still wonder how it can go on forever, but it does go on forever. This production of the ordinals. Yeah. yeah. This, um, this um, uh, unlimited series of um, uh, ordinals, okay, of counter, it is the indefinite. In philosophy, we call it the indefinite, and the indefinite is the uh, is the evil infinite, is the improper infinite, according to the philosophers. We uh, want also to arrive to a halting position, to to stop and not to stop this uh, indefinite progression. Uh, we want to give um, stability, closeness. Uh, limitation, um, rest, without destroying also the limitedness. So this uh, is I'm the not, ultimate... Let me interrupt you for a moment because I'm not quite sure I followed what you said, so I'm going to say something and you can tell me whether this is the line you were asking about. One thing about the ordinals is the reason I get confused by them, and you too would if you started to think about them, is that you, we went through this naming process and we found omega to the omega and so on. And you go farther and you have to be more clever about naming. And whatever 
method of naming you have chosen, you're going to run out of your ability to use it and you're going to have to invent some new language. If you want to keep naming them, you need to increase your language so that even formally, if you decided that your language was limited in a certain way, then you would begin to run out of your ability to name them. Um, and this is characteristic. So it, so this, this construction of his pushes against the limits of my language or the limits of my world. But we have also the infinite imagination, the other faculty of our finite brain to have an unlimited language. But, well, this is another point. My point was not that. My point was that for the philosophers, this indefinite regression, you know, poses a, a, poses a problem, a philosophical problem. And uh, we want to stabilize this unlimitedness and to so transform the improper infinite, the indefinite, into a proper infinite, into an infinite whole, which includes the whole infinite series Okay, the whole infinite series, which has neither beginning nor end, but at the same time, it's closed, and we call it the absolute whole. It is the first point which includes all the points, according to Aristotelian definition of the, of the limiting boundary of the whole. And this is the, uh, the absolute totality of Cantor, the notion of the absolute totality of Cantor, which is um, influenced. Well, I don't know if he read um, Aristotle because perhaps he read Kant. Kant yeah, has you're, you're talking about um, Cantor's dictum that a, a the whole, is, which must include is a, yes, is a, the is, the total, the maximum totality, total. yes, which includes the whole infinite series of ordinals, which have neither beginning nor end, but we succeed to master infinity to make it benign and not evil, to master infinity without destroying infinity. This is the point. And this is what I will explain. Yeah, so it, it raises these questions about the nature of the whole. Because you you have the notion of you have the notion of all the ordinals going on out forever. But the but but if you were to try to make that into a new one and put something out beyond all of them, you get the contradiction. Well, um, horizontally we have the infinite series of ordinals which which have neither a beginning nor end and orthogonally we have a circle which un, which uh, intersects this horizontal line okay mm -hmm. arithmetic line and this circle is the absolute whole which includes the totality of the infinite series of uh, ordinals which have neither beginning nor end but stabilizes stabilizes and delimits this infinite series and transforms the indefinite of Euclidean space into an infinite whole of uh, Melissus or of the philosophers. And therefore we have the reconciliation of the infinite with a finite. And this is the uh, structure of the universe, the, inf the universe, the infinite universe as a whole and not as a part as an indefinite part which uh, varies without limit care to we'll comment talk some more yeah. afterwards <laughs> okay and here's another one elizabeth okay so um i would would you say more about the shape of the mark um yeah as um uh as an arrow that's you introduce you you introduced it to us in the pythagorean progression right at the very beginning of the talk so why is the threshold between a boundary um visualized are, are you asking to discuss why is the mark shaped the way it is yeah uh, yeah. Yeah, and what its connection yeah. is, what 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 the connection is between uh, crossing a threshold and um, generating the series. Yeah, I'm interested in why the shape.
blank screen. So, so he chose, he took, there are a lot of choices he took, but he could have said, well, I'll take it to be a circle. And he even, he even discusses that, sorry. He could have said, I'll, I'll take it to be a circle. And, and he even discusses that possibility later in the book, right? Um, but then um, he ended up choosing this. And I have to tell you a story about that. C.S. Peirce, P-E-I, yeah. Anyway, Peirce, he has what he calls the sign of elation. A very nice paper in Peirce's collected works. You can find it in Carolyn Isley's uh, collection. Um, and um, he writes A implies B like this. It's just like the Spencer Brown mark, except it has a funny little cross line on it. He develops an entire paper about implication this way. And at the very end of the paper, he explains that he has done this making a portmanteau symbol and that this means exactly the same as what Boole would, written, would have written in the Boole that we discussed just now if it had been written this way, A bar or B, not A or B. Not A or B is a standard way of modeling implication. Um, and so he created a Spencer Brown mark uh, this way, but he didn't create a void. It's a different idea. Um, but, uh, but, there are, but that's an example of other choices. But what other choices could there have been? There could have been this. Um, there could have been um, uh, some curve thing. I think you can, if you if you want to, you could make up variations. But which ones satisfy you is the question, right? Um, does something satisfy you in the sense of it having to do with the emergence of a distinction? For example, maybe I should use a darker color. For example, I, I used to look at. Um, at the curly brackets that we use all the time. And then at, at some point it occurred to me that, um, that this looked like a bifurcation. And then the other one looked like a mirror imaging of a bifurcation. And so the curly brackets are expressing a sort of creation story, right? A bifurcation occurs and then a mirroring occurs, and within the mirroring is a holding or, or, or containment. So there, there you could match up with some mythology as Leon may be about to do. What, what were you gonna say? Well, it now becomes mythology, but I remember Spencer Brown telling me that he specifically chose the shape of the mark because it mapped the way we read. We read across the way we read. In English, we read across from left to right, and then we go down a row. Ah, all right. And that was a conscious decision on his mark. This could operate on any number of things underneath it and then stop. Mm -hmm. All right. But that's that's different than a creation story. All right, we got another question here yet. Margarita. It's not a question. I I'm just blown away what Leon just told. I'm blown away what you just said, how totally aware George Spencer Brown was immersed in the process of reading. 
so that he understood something was happening with reading that's very different from the spoken language. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just sorry. Would, would you mind maybe just coming up a little closer because I have some. Yes, um, I I just was uh, expressing something uh, that yeah. I'm that I was really. Uh, blown away, and and it also relates to our earlier conversations. Just how how sensitive and uh, perceptive George Spencer Brown was in that he he wasn't talking about reading, but he nevertheless acknowledged that there was some reading, and we we also talked a little bit about that yesterday in our conversations. I just wanted to e express an emotion, basically. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, she she was um building upon what what Leon just revealed to us that that Spencer Brown made that particular shape because we read from the left to the right and top to bottom. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I'm just intrigued. Um, um, as you uh, wonderfully um, explain, I would like to um, more um, know a little bit more what advantages or what new insights allowed loss of form, because you express that in parallel with Cantor as a different, different notation system. But um, um, what other new insights uh, did this notation allow or uh, have... Um, are you asking what other uses are there for the notation? Yes, for example, what, what did it permit what uh, other systems did not? Yes? Um, I, I want to get your question straight. And sometimes I don't hear everything somebody said. So uh, you may be asking the straight kind of question that people often ask, what are the uses? What other uses are there for this notation? Is yeah. that what you were asking? What new aspects? What yeah, like what new aspects? Um, I think generally the gist, by the way, if, if I may, is is um, you know, you compare it to Cantor, right? And and yeah. to like, so that that's like you know this this thing of of incredible significance and familiarity, right? And and the calculus of indications being less familiar, um, what what is the similar significance? You know, or or the advantages of this uh, oh, yes. uh, notation. Oh yeah, advantage. Sorry. Insights allowed what it. What advantages there in this notation? Exactly. Right. What new insights it allowed, or what yeah, new yeah. forms of and calculation? Sure, sure. And there are, and and then one kind one kind of answer is I could show you how it simplifies doing Boolean logic. All right. Um, you may have already seen how it simplifies doing Boolean logic. Um, so, but there's a there are many answers in that realm. Uh, uh, the other answer is at another level. It stands for making a distinction, and so we can we can we can use that as a kind of focus or a pivot for thinking about distinctions generally. And then another answer is in. Um, is in thinking about um, the, the reentering heart and things like that, because then these become uh, these become representative for certain basic forms of self-reference, um, which can be thought as basic forms by which some system can um, can throw in on itself. So we're looking at at that level. Of the circle yeah well let's let's wrap it up so that you can get up there as well and because we do have dinner afterwards okay yeah. well classically canonically i mean uh, self-reference is is non-linear is represented by a circle but okay you're free to do whatever you want of course but uh, it was uh, more simple for humanity to well, represent uh, self-reference by circle. Putting some favor on using the circle. Yes, it's more it's more intuitive. The right. the I now, mean now more I more something. primitive more primitive. Mm -hmm. So yes, of so course you can do whatever you want to. Well, 
might well want to write it as a circle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're free. Like, yes. You're, you're once you understand what's going on here, you're free. Spencer Brown has a very nice uh, mock, right? But you're free to use any distinction that your your your. Yeah, I mean, you know. I'm saying you're free to use any any. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right. Well, but, um, but then, um, it's often the case that, um, that that what you're really looking at in a given situation is what is the fundamental distinction here? Or what is the first distinction? The circle, yeah, yeah. You may say meta metaphysically or, or in general, the first distinction for you is the form of the circle or the form of the infinite sphere. Um, but, but if I'm in a, a, and historically also, yes. Wrapping yes. up. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. All right. Great. So thank you very much, Lou. Let's let you go. It's a good place to stop. Yeah. So on the schedule, it is a 10 minute break. Let's mm -hmm. let's make it a five minute break so that we can give Eon all the time that she needs and we can still get to dinner. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get ourselves together again for one last time. Hold your tears, hold your tears for one more talk. We are not done yet. We'll cry when it's over, but it's not over yet. So one more talk and we're about to begin. So let's all get together. All right. And I also wanna remind everyone that we have a dinner planned, okay? So we're going to have dinner in the same room that we've been having lunch in the library, right over here when we are done in the alphabetum. So I'll now be introducing our final speaker, our keynote at the end, our final keynote, our final speaker, Eon Soteropoulos. And once again, I'll read your bio and then your talk title and then give it to you. All right, ready folks? Eon Soteropoulos is an independent research philosopher and scientific metaphysician who was born in Greece and studied social sciences and philosophy at the University of Paris, where she founded the Apiron Center in 2002. The first philosophical organization in the world that studies the idea of infinity in dynamic connection with the finite as presented in our physical universe, society, and mind. She is also the author of the titles, first of all, Metaphysics of Infinity, The Problem of Motion and the Infinite Brain from 2013, and two, The Infinite in Act, 2007, and has written the scenario of the prize-winning short film, Mind and Galaxy, 2016, which she co-directed with Shiho, Minami. Her most recent article is Apiron Civilization, The Eruption of Infinity in Science and the Universe, 2021. The research work of Eon Soteropoulos is a deep meditation on the nature and organizing principles of the physical universe, human perception, and accelerating growth in the light of Greek Ionian philosophy. And today her title is the infinite whole, the inductive construction of the universe, qua infinite whole, how to give form and limit, that is, a body to the unlimited universe without destroying its unlimitedness. So let's thank Eon.
we are in the last phase, last stage now of our intellectual and philosophical meeting. And I imagine we are to our class hour. Well, we, um, good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> We have arrived finally uh, at the last uh, stage phase of our intellectual uh, meeting of our philosophical discussions. I hope that we uh, leave this uh, beautiful building with some more fresh ideas and some more clear ideas. Now, um, I beg you because I imagine that you are tired I beg you to concentrate, to make an effort to concentrate your attention in a subject which is very um, important for us because it treats the question of the of the ground of our of the ultimate ground of our existence, which is the infinite universe, qua whole. Uh, the the universe is the condition of the possibility of all things, so it is a condition also of the possibility of our own existence. It's a very difficult subject, and I took a lot of pains to, to construct it, to organize it, and to make it brief and clear as I could. I hope my efforts would be recompensated. So let's start now our metaphysical journey into the ultimate ground of our proper existence. The inductive construction of the universe via infinite whole. The most challenging subject matter in science is the universe. To know the form, geometry, size, and founding principles of the universe. In this presentation, we will investigate with our geometric intuition very briefly these three fire points. The universe as the condition of the possibility of all things is our ground relative, relative to which we explain all things and a reference frame to measure the performance, physical, societal, and mental of ourselves and our society. This ground must exist and be real and not a perceptual illusion, a metaphor, or a logical and physical impossibility. For the universe to exist, it must have a body that is a limiting boundary. Every existing body has a limiting boundary, even the infinite universe. The question is to reconcile the limited with the unlimited. In this work, we will show how it is possible to reconcile the perennial opposition between the finite and the infinite with respect to size and, have, and hence how an infinite whole, an infinite body is logically possible under the condition that we replace the analytic ontology of observational cosmology by a synthetic ontology. We will show within the framework of synthetic ontology how it is possible to have an infinite universe with a limiting boundary assigning a finite volume to the infinite universe without annihilating its infinite radius. Our content, we will start from the local to the global universe. We call it inductive procedure. Then we will treat the question of the maximum sphere of the universe. Then the complex geometry of the maximum sphere of the universe. The founding principles of the universe. The complex radius of the maximum sphere of the universe. Conclusion and a historical note uh, concerning uh, the uh, Greek thought, the Greek philosophical thought, uh, how Greek philosophical thought defines the limiting boundary of the universe. So 
tensions here and now on Earth at point A, which we denote by A a time now, when we refer to time, we see ourselves as being immediately surrounded by a four-dimensional four Euclidean universe, space-time, at rest, whose velocity, V, gravitational field of force, or curvature K, are regarded as equal to zero. We call local universe our immediately surrounding Euclidean universe at rest. We define the local universe by the following formula. The local universe at a at point A at time now, it is at rest, its velocity is zero, and its curvature is zero. So it is Euclidean. On the other hand, we see the distant for, for dimensional universe, space-time, as receding away at a velocity v, which increases proportionally to the distance from mass d in conformity with the Hubble law v proportional to d, where a is a constant of proportionality called the Hubble constant. Now the increase of the distance universe recession velocity v evolves an increase of its kinetic energy, which in turn is converted by virtue of energy equal matter into additional mass. By means of energy equals matter, the additional mass is converted into an additional kinetic energy, which starts a new accelerating cycle of energy matter and, energy and matter energy conversion. We remark here that the distant universe exhibits a self-accelerating -acceleration, behavior that reveals the cyclic re self-referential nature. Is it clear? Okay, we, we continue. The increase of the distance universe's mass implies the increase of its gravitational field of force, which as a complex field composed of contrary equal and opposite gravitational forces, curves the distance universe flat space time, both positively and negatively. The repulsive gravitational force F curves flat space time negatively in the line of sight, producing a hyperbolic universe whose curvature, k, is negative, that is less than zero, and is in accelerated expansion, whereas the equal and opposite attracting gravitational force, g, curves flat space-time positively at right angle to the line of sight, producing a spherical universe whose curvature, k, is positive, that is greater than zero and is in accelerated contraction. However, the spherical contraction of the universe occurring orthogonally to our side remains unobservable to our finite detectors, finite brain and tools, though it is intellectually intuited by our infinite mind and its faculties of synthetic reason and infinite imagination. In the overall, as we proceed outward, the magnitude of the curvature of the distant universe varies symmetrically, becoming both less than zero and greater than zero relative to us at rest at point A. When the velocity v of, of the receding distant universe reaches the limit velocity equal to the velocity of light, taken as unity, then relative to us and according to relativity theory, its mass m becomes infinite by means of m, which designates mass, multiplied by the gamma factor. Its volume v shrinks to zero by means of v multiplied by the inverse gamma factor, and its density d and curvature k become infinite. It's okay now? Everything clear? Okay.
An infinite mass produces an infinite gravitational field of repulsive and attractive forces, F and G, which maximally and symmetrically vary, decrease and increase, the curvature of the maximally distant or global universe. With center A and maximum unit radius AB, we draw a maximum circle rotating a maximum circle rotating the semicircle about its diameter, we produce the maximum or infinite sphere of the universe, which is the universe qua infinite whole. And here is our uh, fundamental uh, figure. The infinite attractive force, G, curves the maximally distant universe, space-time, at right angle to the line of sight, which is uh, along the x-axis, the horizontal x-axis in the figure, into a positive limiting point, singularity B, yellow circle, of a positive curvature, which is greater than zero or infinite. This positive limiting point, B, assigns to the universe a positive convex limiting boundary, B, which we define by the following formula. The limiting boundary, B, has a curvature which is positive that is greater than zero or infinite. On the other hand, the infinite repulsive uh, force, F, curves the maximally distant universe space-time radially along the line of sight into a negative limiting point singularity B prime of negative curvature, which is less than zero or negatively infinite. This negative limiting point B prime assigns to the universe a negative concave limiting boundary B, which we defined by the following formula. The limiting boundary B, pi, has a negative curvature which is less than zero or a negative infinite curvature. Combining both concave and convex limiting boundaries, singularities, B prime B, we obtain the complex limiting boundary B, which is the product of these two uh, negative and positive limiting boundaries of the maximum sphere of the universe at time zero. If we wish to refer to time, we denote it by B times zero. We write then the B times zero limiting boundary is the product of two uh, limiting boundaries, the negative lim limiting boundary and the positive lim limiting boundary. Here, the, the negative limiting boundary, as you see, is um, the, the great circle um, line on the plane P in blue. And the positive limited boundary is a great circle, yellow line on the plane P prime. I did this distinction in order to, to see more clearly the dialect, dialectics between these two boundaries. In fact, the blue circle is the inner part of the uh, yellow circle, but in order to avoid um, perhaps confusion, I decided to make this uh, uh, orthogonal distinction between these two limiting boundaries. The complex limiting boundary B at time zero is free of boundary of singularity by comprising the totality of symmetrized and mutually neutralized boundary singularities. The complex geometry of the maximum sphere of the universe. When seen from inside and radially along the line of sight, that means along the horizontal x axis, the maximum sphere of the universe under the influence of the infinite repulsive force F curves negatively, that is inward and infinitely away from the center A 
into a negative limiting point, singularity B prime, of negative infinite curvature, producing a maximally expanding and accelerating hyperbolic universe, which forms the inner contained part of the universe, that is the universe qua contained part. We assimilate this negative limiting boundary B prime of the hyperbolic universe with a concave limiting boundary of a hollow sphere with an infinitely expanding radius. This hollow sphere lies on the plane P, blue color, which we regard as the plane of dimension. When intellectually seen from outside, from zero dimension and orthogonally at right angle to the line of sight that is along the y-axis, the maximum sphere of the universe curves under the influence of the infinite attractive force G positively, that is outward and infinitely towards the center A into a positive limiting point singularity B of positive infinite curvature. We assimilate this positive limiting boundary B with a convex limiting uh, boundary of a maximally contracted solid sphere of radius zero, forming the outer part of the global universe, that is the universe qua containing whole. This solid sphere lies on the plane P prime, yellow color, which we define as the plane of dimension zero, conferring existence to the dimensionless limiting point B. B. Is there any problem here? Something which is not clear? Okay. The positive limiting boundary, singularity B, envelops the entire infinitely expanding hyperbolic universe Transforming it, transforming it into a static, infinitely expanded whole, given at once without destroying its unlimitedness. Now, the composition of the negative and positive limiting boundaries, singularities B prime B, of the maximum sphere of the universe produces in the overall a complex limiting boundary B, whose form is flat and Euclidean of curvature equal to zero, or finitely curved and spherical of curvature equal to one, by virtue of comprising the totality of negative and positive curvatures, assigning respectively hyperbolic, concave, and spherical convex forms to it. Thus, at the limiting boundary B, the Euclidean universe or the finitely curved spherical universe are defined synthetically by integrating the totality of curvatures, geometries, and forms. The equation uh, 3.2 shows that at the limiting boundary, the Euclidean universe is a maximum integrating the totality of spaces, that is hyperbolic space with curvature less than zero and the spherical space with curvature greater than zero. Similarly, the equivalent uh, formula 3.3 .3 states that at the limiting boundary, which can be equally represented by a finitely uh, curved spherical space of curvature equal one is a maximum integrating the totality of limiting bow boundaries of spaces, the limiting boundary of hyperbolic space, which has a negative infinite curvature, and the limiting boundary of the spherical space, which has a positive, uh, a, a, a positive infinite curvature. Take it into consideration the above, we define the limiting boundary of the global universe by the following formula. At the limiting boundary of our universe, which is complex, uh, it um, 
uh, this limiting boundary has a maximum velocity which is equal to the velocity of light and it integrates, uh, it can be represented by an Euclidean uh, uh, block which is that which integrates the totality of hyperbolic and spherical spaces or by a finite um, a finite sphere of curvature equal to one which integrates the totality of limiting boundaries of hyperbolic hyperbolic and spherical sphere and spherical space so uh, the conclusion is that the global universe contains the totality of geometries, curvatures, and forms. The maximum sphere of the universe by infinite whole is neutral and indeterminate, free of form and boundary, singularity, but feature of comprising the totality of forms and symmetrized boundaries, singularities. This means that an observer situated on the complex limiting boundary B would see its immediately surrounding universe as being flat and Euclidean or finitely curved and spherical, free of singularity, and only an external maximally distant observer, for example, us at point A, would see the positive and negative singularities B, pre, B, prime, B prime B of the complex limiting boundary B at time zero. As we see, the indetermination of the maximum sphere is a positive indetermination, resulting not from impoverishment, but from the maximum wealth and freedom of the formless and boundless infinite whole. Plato in Timaeus refers that that which is to receive all forms should have no form. the open closed maximum sphere of the universe. Because the complex limiting boundary B, B at time zero of the maximum sphere of the infinite whole possesses the totality of geometric forms, the maximum sphere appears open and unlimited when seen from inside radially in the line of sight and relatively to the horizontal plane P. In this case, the maximum sphere appears locally at the center A, flat, Euclidean, without a limiting boundary, whereas globally at the maximum distance away, it appears to our finite dictators as a hyperbolic or hollow concave sphere with a negative and inaccessible limiting boundary B prime. At the same time, the maximum sphere appears closed and limited when intellectually intuited from outside, perpendicularly to the, to the radial side and relative to the vertical plane P prime. In this case, the maximum sphere appears globally as a convex solid sphere with a positive accessible limiting boundary B. A hypothetical mobile on the open closed limiting boundary B of the maximum sphere, for instance, uh, the mobile, the hypothetical mobile situated at the point B, okay, uh, would recede infinitely away from the center A if it moves along the open Euclidean or hyperbolic part of the limiting boundary in the direction of the horizontal arrow line on the plane P. At the same time, the same mobile would rotate around the center A if it moves along the closed spherical part of the outer positive limiting boundary B in the direction of the vertical arrow line on the plane P prime as shown by the figure. This means that the mobile on the complex limiting boundary B is always here at rest in the sense of occupying the same place around the center A and elsewhere moving infinitely away from the center A. So we have here the division of space into open and closed space, okay? 
which was uh, caused by the intersection of two uh, limiting uh, boundaries, the uh, limiting boundary B, which is covering and closes the uh, limited plane, and the limiting uh, boundary uh, B prime, which is the limiting boundary of the um, holosphere, having a hyperbolic surface, and is a boundary which uh, opens the space uh, infinitely away from the center A. So this is the complexity and the duality of, of um, the complex limiting boundary. Maximum sphere is the figure that integrates all oppositions at once in conformity with the, with the synthetic principle of composition of opposites. For example, it integrates constancy or red or rest with infinite variation, increase, decrease, closed spherical space-time of zero volume with open hyperbolic and Euclidean space-times of infinite volume. However, our finite detectors perceive incompletely the maximum sphere. They perceive uniquely its inner indefinitely expanding and accelerating part defined by its def negative limiting boundary singularity B, B prime. In fact, we perceive the maximum sphere as a holosphere, a platonic cavity in which we are observationally imprisoned. We call it the observable world or the world of finite sense which lies on the plane P. The outer limiting boundary singularity B, embracing the infinitely expanding and accelerating part and transforming it into a real infinite whole is unobservable by our finite brain and tools, though intellectually observable by our infinite mind, Aperus Nus, and its faculties of synthetic reason and infinite imagination. cannot go backwards. It's fine, just... In the world of our of finite sense, there is no constant and embracing limited boundary, singularity B. There is no maximum or minimum. There is only a negative, false, or inaccessible limiting boundary, singularity B prime, the boundary of the observable world, indefinitely varying over time. This indefinite of the observable world is an improper infinite, an evil infinite generating absurdities, such as the impossibility to move from A to the maximum distant B, because there is no outer covex limiting boundary B to envelop and unify A with B and allow the continuous passage from A to B. So in the observable world, we have the interior part of Escher figure that I have put here, which is hyperbolic, okay? Euclidean at the center and hyperbolic at the, at the maximum distance away from the center. A fundamental property of the complex limited boundary of B of the maximum sphere is to be both an inner contained part lying on the horizontal plane P and an outer containing hole lying on the plane P prime and enveloping P at right angles. This self-contained and free being verifies therefore the synthetic principle of reflexive order, free or spontaneous order, 
stipulating that the universe is less than itself and greater than itself, where U designates the universe as an infinite whole and the sign of inequality designates succession or implication. The above principle states that the universe relative to quantity is less than itself and greater than itself and therefore extends beyond itself. Relative to space uh, is a contained part and a containing whole and therefore self-contained and free. Relative to time is before itself and after itself and therefore continuous and permanent relative to implication is both cause and effect of itself, defining self-causality or free causality. On the basis of the universe's principle of reflexive order, we, cl we claim that it, is a that it is the infinite repulsive and attractive gravitational forces, F and G, which maximally curve the maximally distant universe into negative and positive limiting points, singularities B prime B of negative and positive infinite curvatures, assigning concave and convex limiting boundaries B prime B to the infinite universe. And conversely, it is these neg negative and positive limiting points, singularities B prime and B, of negative and positive infinite curvatures, which originate respectively the infinite repulsive and attractive gravitational forces phi, Fg. So, in other words, uh, mass creating gr gravitational field of force is a self uh, referential entity. Cr uh, cr creating, causing the forces, um, inf uh, the, the forces F and G, and at the same time caused by the forces F and G. Another founding principle of the complex uh, limiting boundary B, B of the maximum sphere is the general principle of equivalence derived from the Heraclitian principle, uh, primitive principle of composition, unity, coexistence of opposites of our faculty of synthetic reason known as the faculty of our infinite mind. This principle states that any pair of maximally different and distant things, A, B, are equal and simultaneous relative to the complex limiting boundary of the maximum sphere, which we regard as the ultimate reality of the universe, of everything, and which we postulated as being the infinite whole. So we have the formula which stipulates that at the limiting boundary, A equals B. A particular version of the equivalence principle is the finite infinite equivalence principle stipulating the equality of the finite with the infinite at the complex limiting boundary of the maximum sphere of the universe. Grounded in the finite infinite equivalence principle, we assert that any finite quantity of a given kind becomes a maximum or infinite quantity according to extension and division at the complex lim limiting boundary B of the maximum sphere of the universe. We call this process the infinitization of the finite. Per contra, when any maximum or infinite quantity of a given kind becomes a finite quantity according to extension and division at a complex limiting boundary B, we call this process the finitization of the infinite. Both processes take place simultaneously. Aristotle mentioned in his physics that according, as Aristotle mentioned in his physics, according to the Pythagoreans, when the, fin when the infinite is enclosed and limited by the finite, finita finitization of the infinite, the infinite makes finite things infinite, infinitization of the finite, of the finite. The complex radius of the of the infinite of the maximum sphere of the universe. 
a finite quantity of a given kind that becomes an infinite quantity according to extension at the complex limiting boundary B is the finite radius of the inner observable part of the maximum sphere, which we take as equal to 14 billion light years and is known as the radius of the observable universe. We write, therefore, the following. Uh, equation the limiting boundary so the formal remember of the quantity of a given kind becomes a finite quantity according to the value at the complex limiting boundary. intellectually intuited part of the maximum sphere of the universe, which we take as equal to 10 to the power minus 34 meters, and is known as the radius of the smallest observable body in the universe. We write therefore the equation five two. Equation five two tells us that at the limited boundary, the finite radius A B of the outer intellectually intuited part of the maximum sphere lying on the yellow plane P prime is negatively infinite, that is zero. This means that in the maximally distant universe, there is a finite la uh, length, namely 10 to the power minus 34 meters, allowing us to immediately access the infinite length according to division that is zero through the equality of the finite with the, with the inversely infinite. Is there any problem here, perhaps any confusion, any difficulty? I think you're making it very clear. Okay. When seen from inside and radially, the sphere under um, is maximally the maximum sphere is maximally the sphere is maximally stressed under the influence of an infinite repulsive gravitational force F into the infinite radius relative to the plane P. When seen from outside and orthogonally, the sphere's unit radius AB is maximally compressed under the influence of an infinite attractive gravitational force G into the radius zero relative to the plane P prime. In the overall, we define the universe's unit radius AB as the product of contrary, equal, and opposite, infinite, and zero radii, or what is the same as the product of contrary, infinite, and zero magnitudes belonging to the same unit radius without contradiction or paradox. We write, therefore, these, three, these two equations at the limiting boundary, the radius AB, the unit radius AB is divided into two radius, radi, the, radi, the infinite radius, and the zero radius. And this division permits to produce the product of these two different radii, which is finally the unit radius AB. The equation 5-4 says that at the limiting uh, boundary, the radius AB, which is one radius and not divided into many radii, has di two different mag magnitudes, an infinite magnitude when it is seen from the inside and a zero magnitude when it is seen from the, aside, from the outside. Both the formula are equivalent. The above equations define the unit radius AB of the maximum sphere of the universe. 
It is the real radius of the universe because it reflects the totality of its states of motion, of rest and maximum expansion and contraction under the influence of its maximum infinite repulsive and attractive gravitational forces, F and G. So we have here the complex nature of the unit radius of the maximum sphere, which reflects the complex limiting boundary of the maximum sphere. Having postulated the finite infinite equivalence principle that grounds the infinitization of the observable lengths 10 to the power 26 and 10 to the power minus 34 meters, let's now see what happens when we metrically compose them. From the metrical perspective, the square root of their product is equal to the finite length 10 to the power minus 4 meters, which is the average radius of the human egg cell at rest. It is equally the biological radius of the universe existing as a geometric mean of its cosmological radius 10 to the power 26 and its quantum radius 10 to the power minus 34, but also as a complex whole integrated them all. We express the above by the following formula. So you see the product uh, or the, uh, of infinite and zero magnitudes, which corresponds uh, to the finite measures uh, 10 to the power 26 and 10 to the power minus 34, is finally their product in terms of measurement, of finite measurement, is in fact the square root of their product, which is equal to 10 to the power minus uh, four meters. So we produced a thirteen, uh, a, a second, a third, uh, excuse me, a third uh, radius, which is the biological radius of the universe. So the universe has three radii, a cosmological, a quantum radius, and a, cosmo a biological radius. Here is the cell. Okay, so we have a, a, a we have an interaction between the cell, the X cell, and the cosmos, the maximum sphere of the cosmos. Uh, I cannot read it. Can uh, someone help me here? Because it is the. Okay, thank you. If the radius of the of the living human egg cell is simultaneously the biological radius of the universe, qua infinite whole, we can then consider our living universe as a multi, as a maximum multiple of the living human cell according to the x axis of extension and the y axis of division. This means that we can inductively construct or live in our living universe from the living human ovum biogenesis procedure with logical consistency due to the continuity between them as expressed by the synthetic principle of reflexive order known as the principle of life but also as the principle of the universe. So here we have, I, again, the principle of reflexive order, stipulating this time that A, which designates life, and the inequality sign designates succession, generation, implication, that life generates life, self-generation principle. So uh, the inductive construction or living universe shows the, that the, the living human oven has a proportionality with the cosmos because the cosmos is the maximum multiple of the human oven. It equally means this inductive, uh, that, um, uh, this inductive construction that we can metrically construct 
all the distances and recession velocities of the universe from the biological radius 10 to the power minus four meters as we proceed outward according to the axis of extension and division. For this, we need to employ our Hubble law, velocity proportional to distance, where h is a constant of proportionality linking the velocity v with the distance d. Secondly, to generalize the Hubble law and apply it to all distances of the universe according to extension and division, to calculate and thirdly, to calculate the value of the, Hub of the Hubble constant relative to the distance 10 to the minus four meters, which is the distance from the starting point A, but also the radius of the human ovum and the biological radius of the universe. At this point, however, we stop because we have entered another topic, which we call the inductive metrical construction of the universe from the human ovum and which we will treat in the future, in a future research work. I, I, I haven't finished. Conclusion. <laughs> we have examined with the geometric intuition of our infinite mind, the nature of the limiting boundary of the maximum sphere of the universe, qua infinite whole. Because the limiting boundary defines the universe's ultimate reality, which is the infinite whole, knowing its geometric form, radius, and founding principles is equivalent to knowing the ultimate reality and ground of all things. It is also equivalent to knowing the mechanism of the living universe, how the universe really behaves in function of what principles, and how these principles allow the maximally intelligent universe to be a supreme being, having a maximum life in action, perception, and duration. In this sense, the universe is our ultimate reference frame to measure our life performance as mental, societal, and physical beings. It is sure, as, it is sure that as finite brains endowed with finite analytic senses, perceiving only an infinitesimally smart, small part of the infinite whole, our distance from its limiting boundary B is infinite, and our performance to approach it is hopelessly zero no matter how many efforts we dispend. This happens because in the analytic paradigm of the world of finite sense, the unity of maximally different and distant things of the varying finite part, an, and the constant infinite whole b is impossible according to the principle of contradiction. Indeed, in the observable world, which is the inner contained part of the infinite whole, there is no complex limiting boundary, no finite and infinite equivalence principle that will envelop and unify A, N, and B, and effectively and not metaphorically allow the continuous passage of the finite variable A, N to the infinite whole B. Given the failure of the analytic paradigm, paradigm, paradigm of our finite detectors, finite brain and tools to approach the limiting boundary B of the maximally intelligent infinite whole endowed with the power of maximum life, we replace it by the synthetic paradigm of the infinite mind, which theoretically provides a solution to the problem of motion. As we have argued, this solution consists in enveloping and unifying the maximally different and distant things by postulating the complex limiting boundary B of the universe and its finite infinite equivalence principle. If at the complex limiting boundary B, any finite quantity of a given kind becomes infinite by using the finite infinite equivalence principle, then it is sufficient for a n to reach the complex limiting boundary b at 14 billion light years, 
to have an immediate access to any distance greater than 10 to the power 26 meters, or what is a say, to an infinite distance according to extension. We write, therefore, the formula at the limited boundary B, a n is equal to B, where A n is 10 to the power 26 and B is infinite. Now, what is the practical astronomical significance of the, of the finite infinite equivalence principle? And hence, of the formula 6.1, the astronomical significance is that it is sufficient to reach using a perfect telescope the universe's complex limiting boundary B at 14, at point four, ten 10 to the power 26 meters to obtain an infinite perception and perceive any distance greater than 10 to the power 26 meters relative to the X axis of extension. This means that through our perfect space telescope, galaxies on the limiting boundary B of the maximum sphere of the universe are observable, and yet at an infinite distance from us. Conversely, infinite distant galaxies observable through our perfect telescope are on the complex limiting boundary B of the universe. Similarly, Similarly, it is sufficient to reach, using a perfect microscope, the universe's maximally complex limiting boundary B at 10 to the power minus 34 meters to obtain an infinite perception and perceive any distance less than 10 to the power 34 meters relative to the y-axis of division. Thus, using the synthetic equivalence link between the finite and the infinite, the finite grasps and encloses the infinite, making our finite perception infinite. For the Pythagoreans, the infinite is perceptible, finitization of the infinite. And for Plato, we can find infinity, imperceptible things, and finitization of the finite. However, what we additionally discover in this work today, in relation to these ancient thinkers, is the location of the limiting boundary at which the magical finitization of the infinite and the magical infinitization of the finite happen in a natural manner. This location is at the cosmological distance of 10 to the power 26, according to an extension, and at the quantum distance 10 to the power minus 34 meters, according to division. Now, two fundamental questions emerge from our theory of the infinite whole. First question, at what wavelengths of light should our perfect probes observe the cosmological and quantum objects located at the maximally distant limiting boundary of our infinite whole. Second question, is it possible to engineer our finite analytic brain, for example, our eyes, to detect light extended beyond the optical spectrum, for example, light with greatest and smallest wavelengths or with greatest and smallest speeds, and therefore observe in a natural manner cosmological and quantum objects at any distance from us, and yet located at the limited boundary of our infinity whole. We call scientific metaphysics the science and engineering of our finite analytic brain to obtain in a natural manner independently of artifacts, the immanent properties of our synthetic inf infinite mind and become an infinite brain. It is the ultimate frontier of science where science meets metaphysics in their common objective to maximize our living body in perception, action, and duration. Now we will end our work with a historical note concerning the limiting boundary of the universe as the ancient Greek th thinkers thought. 
we will end this presentation with an additional note about the different meanings of the cosmic limiting boundary. In a general manner, the limited boundary of the universe was, according to the ancient Greek thinkers, the residence of the omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient gods. It was divine limiting boundary. In his metaphysics, Aristotle defined the limited boundary of the universe, which he assumed to be finite and spherical relative to space, the first or last point beyond which is not possible to find any part of the thing. And secondly, the first point within which all points are. Other meanings of the limited boundary mentioned by Aristotle are the primary being or the topos of the primary being, the informing form of that which has magnitude, the what or ultimate constituent of everything, which is the limit of knowledge, but also the limit of the known thing. To the above meanings, in that define the cosmic limiting boundary with the principal and maximum quantity of the universe, we will also add the following meanings, the common universal origin and unifying principle of all things, assigning unity to conflicting multiplicity and stability to disruptive motion. Because this unifying link allows motion and communication between maximally different and distant things, it was identified by the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus with synthetic logos taken both as a principle and as a faculty of equivalence and proportionality between things. The source of maximum infinite forces and energy continuously and symmetrically animating, expanding and contracting the universe, which the ancient Greek thinkers identified with the cosmic psyche. So the limiting boundary is not only a unifying principle, uh, it's not only, uh, it's also uh, a place, I mean, it does, it's not only identified with the um, common universal or origin and cause of all things, but uh, also it is identified with a with a synthetic logos thought as a principle and faculty of equivalence and with our soul with the cosmic soul, which animates everything, expands and contracts the universe. Finally, we add two more natural, neutral meanings to the concept of limiting boundary, regardless of whether it is the limiting boundary of the maximum sphere of the universe or not. The limiting, the bending and breaking point at which something becomes something else and the 10th the meaning, the complex and undetermined boundary at which something A is at the same time something else, not A, without contradiction or paradox. According to the ancient Greek philosopher Anaxagoras, mind, nous, is infinite and self-ruled. As a self-referential being, nous is therefore the thought of thought, the noises, noises, noises. This interaction of the subject with itself characterizes all fundamental entities such as the universe, life, mind, and divine being. So finally, we reached our objective to clarify as brief as possible I could do the ground of our proper existence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think what we'll do is I'll give you this and you can hold it and then I will go around with this one. Eon, would you like to m maybe come up here or stand here either way? Um, or sit, you could sit here or on a chair. If you... <laughs> okay, very good, thank you. 
Yeah, so we will begin our question and answer segment. Margarita. Yes, Ian, uh, I was intrigued uh, that you started your presentation by assuming uh, velocity is zero, because as I understand it, there are several cultures and people who are working in physics are also uh, uh, thinking this through, that actually assume we're all moving. So there is actually, instead of a philosophy zero, there is like a relative velocity and that that is the starting point. And then my question number two is, I also want to better understand how you were working with this idea of perfection in that um, that has been said about Newton that he uh, just said, my reasoning is inductive, but alternatively, it can be said that Newton was thinking, I have a perfect eye, so I'm just seeing the world as it is, as if it was a camera or a photo camera that was taking a picture that then was projected on a screen and that all of us are happening a movie as and we're the observers standing on the shore. So what I'm trying to get at is that in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a discussion of the switching of gestalts and how that is part of your narrative. Uh, if I understood well, your question is why I decided to um, construct uh, the the universe inductively, um, and not to 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 grasp it immediately by a synthetic a priori reason. That means by my infinite mind. This uh, is the question. Uh, why you chose to start with velocity is zero? Oh well, this is the classical. Uh, uh, this is the classical procedure when you start from where you are. Uh, our immediate environment, the space-time, the immediate mm -hmm. space-time is flat, and uh, we don't see any 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 motion of this uh, space-time. Okay, the immediate uh, perception. So we start with the most uh, familiar, which is our immediate uh, mm -hmm. environment. And it's a relative concept, which because the immediate environment can be 10 meters or it can be uh, 1 billion light years. It's a relative uh, definition of how you will determine your immediate environment. So I left it, uh, you know, undetermined for the moment uh, without metric, um, without measurement. OK, so uh, we start uh, by that by the primitive um, perception that we are at rest. OK. And when we uh, perceive the distance, we perceive it as being uh, receding away from us. So finally, we see that here and now we are at rest and it's Euclidean. At, and as we um, proceed outwards, uh, motion starts coming. We, uh, the universe recedes with a velocity accelerating because of the forces that I indicated. And finally, at the at a certain point, it is the, uh, the critical point where everything changes, okay? It's the limited boundary, the critical point. And this extreme boundary, by definition, must be uh, a singularity, but a complex singularity, two singularities, no one, not one, in order to, to create the, uh, this complexity and this uh, also the freedom from singularity. So what happens? Um, here we see our immediate perception is that space-time is Euclidean. May our distant perception, we see the universe as a as a holosphere. We see the in, inner the inner concave part, not not the the convex part. The outer convex part is the unifying part of the limiting uh, boundary, which uni which unifies our observable world, but we don't see it because our senses are finite, are extremely limited. But we can only imagine, it's a hypothesis, it's a hypothesis, we can only imagine. It's a hypothesis, a necessary hypothesis to establish uh, symmetry and the permanence of, and the body, a solid body, to give a, sol a solidity to the holosphere. Because if the universe is only a holosphere with a hyperbolic surface, uh, then the universe is pure, uh, it's pure falsity, 
I mean, it's nothing solid. Everything is uh, ephemera, everything is uh, disappearing. So we needed to solidify this holosphere. That's why we have the, uh, the outer part, the covix part, which is a hypothesis, of course, but it's a necessary hypothesis in order to stabilize and give a body, a solid body to the infinite. Otherwise, an infinite without body, it doesn't exist. It's, uh, it's a myth, it's a metaphor, it's a possibility, a paradox, whatever we want that doesn't exist. Lou. It, it appears that you, um, in constructing your your universe, you use uh, a number of physical laws, relativity, uh, yes, of course, relativity, yes. and so on, so that you are assuming. Am I right? You're assuming that they apply beyond uh, the the usual uh, context in which they are normally taken. Well, um, if you saw um, the, in relativity, there is, um, I mean, it's the problem of uh, um, the problem of the scientists which are trained into the analytic paradigm. Uh, I have read many times uh, the book of Einstein, gener uh, special and general relativity, and I uh, saw that he made uh, he always makes the the same mistake. Uh, gra gravity is simple for him; it's not a complex field. Gravity um, yeah. is identified with... But, uh, but what I'm saying is that Einstein and other physicists deduce those laws by reasoning in relation to the invariance of physical law within the purvey of finite observation. So it seems to me you are making a, a, a very interesting leap in yes. saying that uh, those laws are so fundamental that they will go beyond uh that finite realm and i make a leap because i start from the hypothesis of the gra the gravitation gravitation gravitational film field uh, caused by matter is complex it's not simple um the um the canonical position of the scientists is that uh, mass is simple which is the aristotelian theory and uh, the, the gravitational field caused by a simple mass is simple so the gravitational field uh, cannot be both uh, repulsive and attractive. It must be either repulsive or attractive, uh, according to the analytic principle of the excluded third. So uh, the gravitation of the immediate gravitational field, field that we have uh, around us is attractive, uniquely attractive, uniquely because it's simple. It cannot be complex. So I made a, 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 a radical change. I started... Uh, uh, axiomatically with a concept, a platonic concept, that mass is complex, and therefore the effect of mass, which is the... When you say mass is, when you use the word complex, you mean in the sense of complex number? It's composed of different parts, uh, different yeah. forces, which okay. are equal and opposite. Uh, I just want to ask one more general question. Uh, two seconds. Yes. The, the general question is, if in your larger universe uh, you are thinking about what we can perceive, then probably within the perceptible universe you're going to find in your model uh, the curved space time and other things that. Yes, make. of course. I, say, I show it the hyperbolic uh, uh, universe or the hyperbolic surface of the holosphere, because we see only the holosphere. We don't see the outer part, which is the, uh, which is the convexity. Of the of the limiting boundary of the universe, and this convexity will solidify the sphere. We see, we see only the concave part, and therefore um, this concave part creates a lot of problems because we have the indefinite uh, variation of our observable world. There is no limit. There is no maximum. It is uh, Archimedean uh, geometry, <laughs> Euclidean Archimedean geometry. There's another question here as well. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it just made me think of a concept that I wanted to share because you were talking about how you applied the laws of physics to limitless concepts uh, in this case. And it uh, reminded me of um, a book that I read by Daniel Weiss-Miller, The Unseen Universe of Mind and Matter, because at the end you um, mentioned your concept with metaphysics and how they need to coincide or something. Oh, they're related to science. Yes, yes, exactly. And so he creates a paradigm uh, and he's inspired by um, um, 
I have not read him. Um, yeah, and he he talks about a new concept uh, inspired by quantum physics because when you look at the very like infinitesimal small things, uh, the laws of physics change. So he takes uh, his in yes, it's a turning point where he, exactly becomes different. Yeah, this is the notion of the limiting boundary. Okay, yeah, and so I liked his concept because also when you talk about metaphysics, he uh, postulate quantum physics with an O uh, that takes into account the material world and the spiritual non-material world. So it's a way of co like uh, merging the metaphysical with the material and apply. And in this, um, uh, he recognized that there's new laws that needs to be applied. And in that sense, he positioned himself in the paradigm shift of science. And... The, the 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 shift of the paradigm is exactly on the limiting boundary. Yeah, this is the, the turning point. We we localize where this is a turning point because up to now we didn't know. This is my contribution. The turning point is ten to the power twenty six, according to extension and according to division, ten to the power minus thirty four. I'm going to allow um, just five more minutes for our Q&A segment. Um, there's another question here as well. Leon. Excellent talk. Thank you. I have a possibly simple, possibly complex question for you. Imagine a pyramid where you're sitting. Extend the lines of the edges of that pyramid outward to the edge of your universe. What happens to the line when it meets the hypothetical edge? Well, I told you the hypothetical edge. Now we know where is the locality of this hypothetical edge. It is at uh, the velocity of light because when um, the moving uh, object attains this velocity, it becomes different, it's finite, and suddenly it becomes infinite, its mass is infinitized, it, its quantities uh, vary, it become either zero or infinite. So does the line change to an infinite dot, or does it extend infinitely it beyond? It bifurcates, it bifurcates. Into what? It bifurcates into a straight line and into curved line. So you have a choice, as I, I, as I show, the mobile at the extreme point B, it, ha it can choose two paths, either to continue its indefinite trip on the plane P, which is the uh, unlimited plane, or to return uh, may and realize a rotation, a revolution about the center A, if it if it if it, it uh, situates itself on the plane P prime, if it uh, chooses the yellow circle, and uh, goes around the point uh, at the center, the point A. So it has two possibilities: either to continue or finally to rest and to maintain its position and revolve rotate about to the center A permanently. So the system on the whole is bifurcated into open space and into closed space. I see. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to ask an, a question? Oh, yeah, yeah OK. There are so many um, interesting, <laughs> relevant points, not only to the general philosophical context that that especially is interesting to me, but also to our unique theme of this conference, since in the dyadic cyclone, um, you know, and, and I understand that like not everyone has necessarily done all their homework and read the dyadic cyclone or the specific chapters where John Lilly identifies the marked state operator of Spencer Brown's laws of form, you know, that he then uses in the tank with um, certain of these constants. And then he starts um, saying how he reduced his observer to, you know, these like uh, quantum magnitudes. And when he did that, the experience was you know, a traversal of the universe. 
um, perhaps in his imagination or in his mathematical phase space or the equivalent or a phenomenological disclosure space, or in any case, some kind of referential framework. And I, I have always thought of it kind of like, just like you're saying, that there is, um, you know, as a, a referential framework, this spherical um, context. Um, so, so, I mean, I think it's perfectly applicable and, and um, interesting because you can plug in the John Lilly adventure in the flotation tank story from the dyadic cyclone into the the spaces you've provided with with the formulae and and the uses of them and and so considering that context i think it's interesting to look at the implication at, at the level of the calculus of indications of, of george spencer brown because of the nature of the mark that indicates the first distinction it is a token and it can be that shape or it could be a circle and indeed it becomes all things here excuse me here we can consider in order to adapt my my theory to uh, spencer brown's uh, um, logic of forms uh, we could uh, consider the intersection of the circle with the plane of the sphere with the plane it's an intersection okay uh, the intersection of the unlimited with the limited okay uh, the plane, the the sphere is intersected by a, a plane which uh, passes um, through the center of the sphere as a mark, as a mark. The intersection of the sphere uh, right. by the by the um, by the plane. This whole complex figure, geometric figure, can be considered uh, as a mark, as one mark. And in terms of uh, two dimensions. We can say it is uh, the intersection of the point with the line. The point is the sphere. The line is the is the, is the plane, and we have uh, the um, the platonic mark, point line, right. atomus grammi. Yes, yes. Thank you. Indeed, the the cross that it forms. The intersection of the circle with the, and the line passing by, passing by the center of the circle. This intersection of the of the circle with the line. Is the um, is the geometric figure in two dimensions of the idea point line of uh, Plato? Point line is the atomus grammi, the indivisible line. The point has a property of indivisibility and indivisibility. from the Republic. Uh, Plato. Yes. Plato. The, the point has a property of immobility and of indivisibility, and the line is the receptor of motion. And therefore, of division also, okay, and extension. So you have the intersection of these two figures, which have a very powerful, very um, their symbols are very powerful. So we have the intersection of the Im immobile point with the, the receptacle of motion, which is the line. And and to be clear, the line of Plato that you're referring to is from the Republic, from books. Yeah, from the public, yes. Atomus right. Grammy. And and then also the Timaean context. Uh, you've invoked different, you know, so, so points of the, the mark, Timaeus. This is the mark, the point, the point uh, intersected by the line uh, passing by its diameter. It's a mark, the mark which we call point line. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, th there's there's a lot here. There's a lot that we can have yeah. at least. Uh, 10 years to speak about right. it. <laughs> and certainly dinner. If we, if the op if the objective of the civilization is to attain the maximum, that means we must uh, attain, uh, I mean, the universe is a reference for uh, maximizing our life performance. This is what, this was the, the central idea of the, the Greek philosophy because they said that uh, they started from the hypothesis the universe is a perfect body, okay? And infinite, the Ionian philosoph uh, philosophy, assumed that the, uh, the universe is infinite and that it is a body. So it is a combination of the finite with the infinite, okay? So it is a perfect body, uh, which is internal because it's perfect, it's permanent, it's balanced, it's just because it's perfect. So they said, if we have perfection in front of us, why not try to, uh, to imitate this perfection and try to correct the deficiencies of our society, which is unjust, which is based on the principle of inequality and not on the principle of equality, 
um, uh, which um, in this observable world, we see, uh, the finite senses are not reliable sources of uh, information because we are uh, in relativity. Uh, there is a continuous uh, change of uh, positions, the indefinite variation uh, where uh, everything that we discover is refuted immediately by further progress. So if everything that we discover, all knowledge that we discover is refuted, finally, so in the, in the, uh, finally in the overall, we know nothing about anything because everything is refuted. So in order to get out of this absurd situation, out of this uh, um, nihilism produced by this indefinite progression where continuously our theories are changing and, f and finally we have no stability in knowledge and we know nothing about anything, uh, they decided that uh, finally we, uh, we must arrive to a, to a certain point where we can finally rest and uh, sure certain knowledge without destroying motion and variation. Not stability at the expense of change, but stability which includes change. Because when one, one element dominates the other, we have destruction. The principle of existence in Greek thought is duality. Duality. That means um, the couple governs. Uh, two opposite concepts which are at the same time equivalent and coexisting, the composition of opposites. When one of the two elements of the couple dominates, then we have uh, we have uh, inexorably destruction because of the asymmetry. So if we want permanence, and that means eternity, then we must have balance and justice between two opposites, justice, equal terms. When this justice is interrupted, when this symmetry is interrupted and this balance, then inexorably we have linear time and destruction. So the whole problem of, uh, of Greek philosophy is the whole uh, the problem of perfection, that means the problem of constancy and permanence, and therefore uh, uh, to win our struggle against time, because time is an illusion for, for, for the Greek uh, philosophy. Uh, according to uh, Aristotle, uh, time is um, motion. According to time, is ontologically speaking, as a secondary value. Thank you. Thank you, Eon. That was that was so energetic, and it it could go on for eons, Eon and and Eon. Incredible. Thank you. Okay, let me um, just close your presentation real quick and then I will close our conference. Oh yes, of course, uh, just a moment though. Can we put the, um, can you help me put the, um, the big black and red float tank image up there? <laughs> Amazing. Every different discipline, every different topic that we've had over the past three days with from our from our opening to our ending of each day and of the entire conference, I feel we've really made a, a case in the float tank context for a reinfinitization of the finite, a refinitization of the infinite, both. <laughs> and um and I think that, you know, it is it is um, something that that contributes to the um, the realignment of the universe with the universal, with the topics that are the highest topos topoi of philosophy. So, and I think this is very important. This realignment is really necessary. So, thank you all very much <laughs> for making this happen. So. I applaud to all of you for this very much. I know. <laughs> okay, thank you, yes. So I, I thank all of you.
And I especially thank West. West and Haig has really been the force organizing this, well, together. <laughs> but, you know, each person of West and Haig, each individual worker has been so incredibly helpful. And of course, you know, <laughs> with Akeem and Marie Jose together, um, you know, <laughs> as the, the, the two, um, <laughs> yeah, the, as the two, you know, principals above this amazing institution, um, you really made it happen. So let us thank West End Haig very much.